Welcome, everyone. Welcome to this, uh, uh, I don't know how many editions, but uh, it's a new edition of uh, Spanish Core Toolbox um, course. Uh, and it's especially designed for the uh, version 6.1. My name is Julien cohen uh, I'm a prof based at Polytechnique Montreal and University of Montreal. And uh, I've been working on spinal cord MRI for quite a while, 15 to 20 years, something like that. Um, and uh, before I start, I would like to introduce also members of the SCT uh, dev team. So I'm going to put the, uh, the metrics and I hope I won't forget anyone. So if I do, please, uh, let me know. So I see Jan Paloshek. Hello, hello. Um, Nathan Molinier. Hi. Nilter Laines Medina. Mathieu Gepake. Sandrine hello. Bedard. Joshua Newton. Hello. Uh, okay, I think. That is pretty much. Oh, Naga Kartik as well is here. Hello. Uh, okay. Yeah. If I forgot anyone, I apologize. <laughs> uh, please show your hand if I did. Um, okay. So let's get started. Just reorganizing everything on my end. Good. So um, the first of all, if you would like to print these slides, there are some instructions here uh, to print them with the um, speaker uh, speaker notes. Uh, there are no notes on this slide, but some slides have notes, and it could be useful to have that as like you know some sort of uh, book with instructions. Um, if you have questions during the course, you can use the uh, the Zoom chat that uh, most of you, I'm sure, are already familiar with. Um, if you have, you know, sp specific questions about installation or something that you you cannot work uh, work out properly yourself, um, you can you can write uh, on the Zoom chat, and then someone from the SCT Dev team will uh, will reach out to you in private message, and then we'll figure out what the problem is, and maybe we'll start uh, you know like a, a separate one-on-one uh, -on -one meeting with you to to fix it, uh, so that you can uh, you can follow the course properly. There is also a um, oh yeah by the way, if you also would like to intervene uh, during the course please feel free to do so, uh, raise your hand. Um, I might not be able to see your hands. So if someone raises uh, their hands, uh, please, uh, someone from the SET dev team, let me know. Uh, thank you. We also have for the first time, a mirror board. Uh, it's essentially a virtual board that um, you can, uh, you can interact with. So I'm going to open it. I'm in incognito mode. So what I'm going to do is is open this on my uh, Google account. So if you click on that link, you will be asked to uh, to register. Uh, it's very easy. It takes a few seconds, and once you're registered, you have access to this uh, to this board, right? So uh, with this board, you can you know you can zoom in uh, with the middle button, and then with the um, if you press on the middle button, you can you can navigate through the different boards. And so one board is about questions. You know if you have any questions that you prefer to ask here, please feel free to do so. Uh, general questions about, you know, MRI acquisitions, contrast, and things like that would be here. If you have suggestions for improving SCT, we would love to hear them. So you can post uh, your suggestions here. You know, just take a, take a card, and then you can write, uh, you know, I'd like, you know, uh, to be served coffee during the course, something like this, right? Um, and then, 
Oops, I cannot move anymore. I'm not sure what's happening. Okay. Um, and then this is, uh, if you have some announcement, you're organizing a workshop that would be relevant for the community, feel free to also um, announce it here. Sounds good. Going back now to the course. Um, so that's the outline of the course. It looks a bit overwhelming, but that's why we have uh, two days um i anticipate that for the first day we're gonna end at approximately you know somewhere here somewhere here maybe maybe a bit later depending on you know depending on the questions and so on um and then tomorrow we're gonna finish the part and then take at least an hour to announce the uh what's what's coming uh like the new features that are coming in sct and also having some discussions and your um uh, and getting your feedback and suggestions um, for improving a city. Okay, so let's start with the introduction. So this is a these are slides that many of you have already seen. So um, the the purpose of uh, of SCT is to analyze uh, or like to do the pre-processing uh, of uh, data of MRI, magnetic resonance imaging data of the spinal cord. And more specifically, we, we look at uh, creating biomarkers. Um, so what are biomarkers? These are, um, these are quantitative measures that we get from you know, a structural MRI, uh, such as T1 or T2 weighted, or um, microstructure MRI, such as magnetization transfer, diffusion tensor imaging or functional biomarkers from functional MRI. And uh, we like to use those biomarkers as a way to improve the accuracy uh, of um, you know, the diagnosis and prognosis of a particular disease that affect the spinal cord. Um, so far, uh, there have been you know, a very active community uh, from different groups, uh, Oxford, um, at UCL, uh, at Harvard, uh, at NIH, uh, to create uh, tools to process quantitative MRI biomarkers of the brain. But until maybe you know five, six years ago, there was nothing uh, that centralized um, the, the, that's those kind of pre-processing for spinal cord MRI data. And that's that's what uh, motivated us to uh, create and to maintain this uh, software ecosystem, Spinal Cord Toolbox or SCT, which is a comprehensive and open source library of analysis tools for multi-parametric MRI of the spinal cord. You can download it at this link. I'm sure many of you have already installed uh, SCT. Um, very briefly, it uh, features some segmentation tools. By segmentation, I mean the identification of the of the contour of the spinal cord or uh, other uh, structures such as the, uh, the the spine, the CSF, or pathological um, um, pathological events such as MS lesions, for example. It also features a template and an atlas. Uh, similarly to the to the brain, there is you know the the well known MNI template. Uh, so we, we also have an equivalent in the spinal cord. Additional tools uh, to uh, motion correct data, especially fMRI and diffusion time series. Uh, tools to extract biomarkers in using the atlas, and importantly also a pipeline to register. Uh, a new image to the template so that you can do then the uh, the you know quantitative biomarker extraction or you can also compute um, cross sectional area um there is uh, an increasing amount of uh, published methods that are used in SCT uh, some of the methods have been developed by other groups uh, some by you know some of you uh, in the in the attendance here, um, and when we deem it relevant, 
to incorporate it in SCT, then we know we would re reach out, uh, collaborate, and then eventually that would be a, a new feature in SCT. Um, there are also tool um, studies that have used um, SCT. So if you want more details, you can click on this link. It gives an idea of the different tools with the associated uh, references. So you can read more about that if you're interested. And also the, the studies using SCT would be, uh, would be listed here. Uh, we've added some, some interesting graphs. These are interactive graphs showing the kind of pathologies that people are working with, the tools being used, uh, and also the, the species, blue being humans, and the count of citations uh, per year. And these are the citations by, by some of you. Um, that are that are listed on this uh, on this website. Um, so this is the the studies that I was uh, telling you about. Uh, it's obviously not exhaustive. Um, and just to give you a very brief overview of the kind of studies that you could do with SCT, this was one of the very first study. Um, that was uh, led by uh, Mario Sianakas at UCL. Um, and they, they compared um, GYM, which is a semi-automatic method for uh, segmenting the spinal cord with PropSeg, which was uh, one of the first segmentation method incorporated into SCT developed by Benjamin Delener. And the, this, this comparison showed the, the fully automatic PropSeg compared to the semi-automatic GYM showing uh, similar results um, with the advantage uh, of PropSeg being fully automated and therefore with, with no user, user bias and also uh, much more uh, rapid uh, to, to apply. And therefore, it's very amenable to uh, you know, large cohorts of thousands of patients. Uh, another study that came out uh, a few years later was to show a proof of concept of multi-center studies uh, that was being analyzed fully automatically. And that was a collaboration between um, Seth Smith at Vanderbilt, uh, Claudia willer kingshot in uh, London, and myself. And we've acquired uh, diffusion tensor imaging in the spinal cord. Um, so these were, these were different subjects, but nevertheless, the uh, the FA in the one very specific tract in the dorsal spinal cord was, uh, was very reproducible uh, across the three different sites. Later on, um, Dominique Eden uh, with Charles Gros work on a way to map MS lesion distributions in the spinal cord. So that used more tools from SCT including the PAM50 template, uh, an extensive registration pipeline, the identification of the white and the gray matter, and the, uh, and the uh, segmentation of, the, of MS lesions that were then mapped to, this, to the uh, PAM50 template. And then um, all the lesion masks were averaged together to, to show um, a probability distribution uh, map of uh, the MS lesions uh, across different phenotypes, such as uh, relapsing remittive of primary progressive uh, with quantitative measures in different tracts of the spinal cord. Another pathology, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, uh, where here we, uh, we want to look at the uh, specific degeneration of the, of the gray matter um, uh, in, the, in the ventral horn. And uh, this is something that, is, uh, that has been possible thanks to the segmentation of the gray matter combined with uh, improvement in the acquisition of uh, high quality uh, GRE scans showing the white and the gray matter um, of the spinal cord. And so by doing this kind of analysis, uh, we showed that it was uh, possible to get more specificity and better distinctions of the controls versus ALS group when looking at the gray matter versus the entire spinal cord. Um, another work um, 
by the group at uh, Northwestern um, showing an application of uh, SCT uh, and diffusion tensor imaging in patients with stroke. Uh, and uh, there are not so many studies using PET in the spinal cord, but this is one of them from uh, the group of um, Mark Marco Logia at uh, MGH in Boston. Uh, where they did um, simultaneous spinal cord and uh, spinal cord MRI and PET uh, to look at pain, um, lumbar radiculopathy, and showing a uh, higher level of neuroinflammations using a PET marker and a structural MRI uh, using those uh, advanced uh, registration and segmentation tools. Um, if I mentioned that uh, you know image quality has improved over the past couple of years, um, if you're interested in in you know getting the best uh, out of your MRI for spinal cord imaging, I encourage you to look at uh, a spine generic protocol that has been built over uh, the past few years, and that includes um, you know protocols for different vendors, um, GE, Philips, Siemens, different models. Um, and uh, more details can be found in this uh, Nature Protocols publication, and the protocols are available at this link. Finally, um, SCT is available across the three main platforms, macOS, Linux, and Windows. Uh, it mostly uses command line, but uh, people can use also a Fessalize uh, plugin. Uh, I'm going to show that later. There is no dependent software uh, except for FSL if, or FSL eyes if you would like to use the uh, viewer integration. Uh, it's written in Python and it uses some of the C++ uh, functions, but this is all integrated into SCT. When you install SCT, it will also install a version of Python. Um, there is extensive testing that is being done by the uh, amazing uh, development team. And uh, I would like to stress that uh, we don't start from scratch. We do uh, benefit from a lot of uh, other open source uh, libraries that are being developed. Uh, I'm, I'm forgetting a lot, but there is notably Nybabel, uh, SciPy, NumPy, um, DiPy, uh, the ANTS, uh, ANTS toolbox is, is also a part of, uh, of SCT. Uh, and all that is distributed under the LGPL v3 license. So during the course, I will use uh, some conventions, like the name of the function to be that we are discussing is uh, on the top um, right. If something is new in this version, uh, you will see this little star here. Um, there will be uh, some hands-on, as you know, so you will have you know, your terminal opened and you will try some commands with me. Uh, some slides will, where we'll try things together will have the, this green label, whereas because of the, the interest of time, we cannot try everything. And so for those slides, there will be a red label here, okay? All right, any questions so far? Look at the, at the mirror board. Is there anything on the mirror board? Nope, nothing so far. Okay, so let's go to the installation. So the course will require that you enter some commands in the terminal. So what is a terminal? Um, if you are on Linux, Mac OS, uh, you can you can have uh, you can access your terminal from the dock or from your applications. Uh, let me go to the applications. Um, that's your application list. And on your application list, there is something called terminal. Unfortunately, it's not there. So it will be under utilities, I guess. Yeah. You double click and it opens the window. So I'm going to put it a bit bigger. 
let me know if it's not big enough. Uh, if you're on Linux, uh, there is, depending on the Linux distribution, you might find it, you know, at different menus. If you have issues, you can post it on the Zoom chat. And for Windows, uh, you can use Git Bash uh, that comes with Git. Some of you who have already installed SCT, I assume, are already familiar with this. Again, if you have some issues with that, please uh, post it on the uh, on the Zoom chat. Uh, what I'm going to do here is organize my screen so that I can see my comments and you can see the terminal on this side. Okay, so we'll do it that way. So the instructions for uh, installations are on these links. Uh, again, most of you uh, should have already installed SCT by that time. Um, if you have not, if you encountered some problems, please, you know, feel free to to post it on the Zoom chat, and then someone will uh, will reach out and and help you. Don't be shy. And if you have installed SCT, then we can run that command together. SCT check dependency. Oh yeah. So one thing I want to tell you is that when you write stuff on the on the terminal, you can you can start by typing SCT and then C H E for example, and then there's a a, a key uh, called the tab, the tab key. When you press it, it does what we call auto completion. So it you know enables to go much faster, not only for the commands but also for the for the file. Or the files that you have on your uh, on your local computer, and so when when I run SCT check dependencies, it tells me the version that I'm running. So on your end, it sh it should show a stable version like v six point one, for example. On my end, I have the development version, so it shows the uh, the Git hashtag of the of the SCT version. It tells me where it's installed tells me the OS that I, that I have, the CPU cores, the RAM, uh, and then it tests different things. If I have FSL, and then the all the libraries that um, SCT depends on. Looks like everything is green for me. Hooray, I can move on. Um, you can so usually the the commands are set up so that the you know the it shows the syntax uh, appropriately for a terminal that is hundred cars uh, wide. You can adjust the uh, you know your window size like this, and it says one hundred there. But it will work even if it's smaller or bigger. It's really your preference. Okay, uh, very basic, unique. Unix commands. Uh, I apologize for those who are already familiar with this, but I think it's important that you know everybody is on the same page with the basic commands. Um, if you want to print something, you can write echo double quote um, blah blah, and then it will print blah blah. If you want to know where you are in the terminal, you can write pwd. And it tells me users slash Julian. So what does that mean? It means that if I open a finder, let me open a finder, new folder. Um, I have a new finder, okay. So Julian is where am I, where I am here, right? If I If I wanna go to a folder called code, for example, uh or like if i want to list what's in this folder i would use ls what's written here so i type ls enter and then i see all those folders here which corresponds to the folder that i see on my finder okay if i want to create a directory for example mk dear for make directory then i call it uh you know new awesome awesome Dear, like this, enter. You see that new awesome dear has been created. If I want to go inside that directory, I would type cd for com directory, 
new awesome. I can use the auto completion, you see, and I'm in there, right? If I do ls, I don't see anything because there is nothing in my folder. Um, I can create a new file using touch. Uh, blah blah txt, and then there is now a blah blah file that has been created. I want to go back to the previous folder. CD dot dot, um, and then I want to remove my awesome fold, new awesome gear. It's, it says it's a directory, so I need to use this. Then it's not going to like it because there is something inside. Oh, no, he did it. All right. Good. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to post them on the, on the chat. Uh, and also an important thing is that during the course, there's going to be commands, syntaxes that are much longer than this. So instead of typing everything, you can also triple click there. One, two, three. I copy with the command C or like control C uh, and then I paste it on the terminal, right? Then you can do that for all the commands. So it makes it much faster to, to follow the course. Okay. Uh, now we're gonna download the course material. So I wanna go to my home directory and then I'm going to run that syntax. So one, two, three, triple click, copy, paste, and it's downloading the data. I'm lucky to be at the university where the internet is fast. Um, and now we can, uh, you know, it, it created this folder, you see, SCT source data, and let's go in there. So I'm gonna write SCT, CD SCT course data, enter. Let's see what's in there, ls. Okay, so we have a readme, we have full folders, multi-subject, single subjects, and also a CSV file that describes the data set. That's indeed what I see here. So let's first go into the single subject. Triple click, paste, okay. Um, so all the commands that are run in this course are listed in the listed in the file uh, batch single subject dot sh, which is this one. Um, you can treat this script as a quick reference for this course, but you know if you want to follow the course uh, step by step, I encourage you to go through the different you know syntaxes that are, that we are that we are going to to work with. Um, okay, so before we we start, uh, everybody is uh, is up to date with SCT installation, basic Unix commands. Any questions? Let me go to the Miro board. Okay, all right. So let's begin. Um, we'll we'll see that uh, some of the commands that we will be using um, have a quality control report uh, attached to it, uh, and this is something that enables to you know to visualize the uh, the, the quality of the uh, of the processing. That's something we'll we'll go back later. Um, the image viewer uh, that, uh, so there are many viewers that exist. Um, we don't necessarily recommend one. Uh, it's really the, at your discretion and your, your habit, you might be used to, you know, ITK snap or 3D slicer, and this is totally fine. Uh, usually in the lab, we like to fossilize, um, but, you know, you can use any viewer that's independent on the on on SCT. Um, uh, 
some few words about the file formats. Uh, so many of you are familiar with the with the Nifty uh, standard, um, and with Nifty you can have two different file uh, file names, file extensions. You can have NII or NI.jz. Uh, Jz is the compressed version of NII, um, and the Take home message here is that we strongly recommend you to work with nii.gz because you know you're gonna create a lot of files during processing, a lot of uh, warping fields, and if you're working with you know large cohorts, large images uh, that will end up you know taking a lot of physical space on your hard drives, which is a um, which is a waste of of, uh, of space when you can use the compressed version. So we strongly recommend you to use the uh, NII.gz. Um, spaces in file names. So please uh, make sure you don't use spaces in uh, when naming your folders or your file names, because uh, that's not easily Unix compatible. Uh, I know it, you know, it creates much nicer, but when you want to process uh, your files with full file names, it can create some issues. So instead, I recommend you to replace your spaces using underscores like this one, or with uh, with dash like this. Okay. Good. Any questions so far? Okay, so we're now uh, start the section on the segmentation. So first we'll do a quick review of the theory behind spinal cord segmentation in SCT, and then we'll do a hands-on. So um, there are two main uh, methods uh, to segment uh, the spinal cord. Um, one is called... Um, one is called PropSec. It was introduced um, in 2014. And the command uh, many of you are familiar with is SCT PropSeg. Another command that was introduced in 2019 is SCT DeepSeg SC. There is uh, there are also specialized models uh, that are under the command SCT DeepSeg, uh, which have been introduced recently and uh, newer, like more models are being added. Uh, we'll talk about, about all this um, during the course. Um, usually before starting a segmentation, we like to know where the spinal cord is approximately. It helps for the segmentation of the cord. Um, and so that is done using a, an algorithm called OPTIC. Um, which, uh, which is essentially a, a detection of the center line uh, using some regularization methods. If you want to know more, you can see the article from uh, Gro et al. in 2018. And uh, the uh, maybe one thing I forgot to mention is that the this algorithm is implemented into the uh, algorithm called SCT get centerline. So you, if you are only interested in getting the centerline, you can also just run that command, right? If you want to segment the cord using SCT propsec, for example, then SCT get centerline is hidden and is run in the background, right? So you don't have to run SCT get centerline. Propsec does it for you. And very briefly, it first gets the center line, then it places some 3D mesh uh, with with some uh, with uh, with average uh, distance and uh, and um, and length, and then it will propagate this 3D mesh along uh, the superior inferior axis, and then finds the right boundaries between the cerebrospinal fluid and the spinal cord. Um, as I mentioned, in 2019, there was a new algorithm introduced called SCT DeepSeg SC, and that is uh, based on deep learning. Uh, and more specifically, there are two different uh, conventional neural networks that have been trained. 
One is for the cord detection that replaces optic, and another one is for the cord segmentation. So first, we identify where the cord is, and then we crop around the spinal cord, and then we run a refined version of a CNN. And this algorithm has been trained on over uh, 1,500 patients and healthy controls, uh, including various pathologies such as compression, MS, ALS, NMO, and that makes the algorithm quite robust towards, um, towards pathologies. And so I mentioned, so that's something that is new uh, in SCT is a function called SCT DeepSeg, which provides access to different models that are created uh, via another project called Ivadomed. And um, in recent versions of SCT, there, we've added some models for the segmentation of, of uh, spinal tumors, uh, different types of tumors, as well as um, a human multi-class spinal cord and gray matter segmentation on 70 data. That was the work of uh, Neil Sayre, Lainas Medina, in collaboration with the uh, ex Marseille University, uh, Virginie Callos lab. And we've also added a, um, an, a model to segment MS lesions on MP2 rage data. There are also other models uh, for mouse, uh, spinal cord, and so on that have been added. To look at the different models that are available, you can run this command. So we'll do it together. SCT deepseg h, h for the help. And then these are the different tasks that exist, you know, for cord segmentation on T2 star, weighted data, on mouse MRI, uh, and so on. So feel free to explore this and, uh, you know, try it in your data if you have data that could be appropriate for these kind of models. All right. Now it's time to start some hands-on um, um, hands on uh, use of SCT. So please open a terminal and we'll do, uh, we'll do this together. So first we need to choose between contrasts uh, when we want to, when we want to run the, uh, the spinal cord segmentation. So um, the, you know, if you have images that are that look like this one, you know, where you have a dark uh, cerebral spinal fluid and, um, and a lighter spinal cord, that would be a T1 weighted light contrast. If you have the inverse contrast, so dark cord and bright CSF, that would be more of a T2 uh, contrast, right? DWI is very uh, special type of images because there is, you know, we only see the spinal cord pretty much. And the T2 star is also special because we see the gray matter inside. Um, so let's start going to the T2 contrast. So I'm going to my terminal window and I will go CD data slash T2. Okay, I'm inside that directory now. Let's see what's in there. LS, there is an image t2.ni.gz. Okay, so now I want to segment the spinal cord using SCT deep seg SC. So I want I don't want to type it all. So I'm just going to do triple click and then copy and then paste. So. You're waiting, you see, it does a couple of things. So it tells you what version you, of SCT you're, you're running, it tells you the command that you've typed, and then it tells a couple of things about the fact that the um, standard line algorithm is the SVM, which is the optic. It could also be a CNN. So you have, you can adjust some parameters if you like, if it doesn't work well for you. Uh, you can also mention if there is a brain in the image, and if there is, you will try to crop it. But in this case, there is 
you know, uh, there's only a part of the brain, but that parameter is not necessarily, uh, you know, it's not necessarily going to make your uh, processing fail. So it's going to add a bit more time. Um, you can choose between different types of kernel, uh, 2D or 3D. In this case, we chose 2D. The contrast, you know, that's something very important that, you know, if your uh, processing fail, uh, it might be because you've chosen the, the wrong contrast. So it's very important to select uh, dash C T2 because we are dealing with a T2 weighted image. Uh, the threshold is uh, something that is used after the segmentation is created. It will binarize it using a particular threshold. And if you want to know a bit more how that threshold was chosen, you can look at the uh, at a gross article uh, that was published uh, in the neuroimage. Going down, you see that you know what's in blue here. In your terminal, it might appear in a different color. But what's in blue is the you know indication of how uh, the the data are like temporal temporary data are being treated. So in my case, you see that it creates some temporary data in this folder. Uh, so if you want to do some debugging or understand more of the different steps of SCT, you can also you know explore the temporary files that are being created. And at the very end, you see it generates a quality control report. And it does that because I asked SCT to do it. If I go up in my syntax, I added dash QC for quality control, and then the location of the QC reports that I want to uh, create, right? So it's under my home and then QC underscore single search. So let's look at this QC report. That's going to be the next slide. Specified the QC flag. So now if I go, if I go here I, on my home, you see there is something called QC underscore single sub. And inside it, there is an HTML file that is called index.html. And if I double click, it will open a, a web web page with, you see, um, a table that has the line uh, T2 and then function SCTDipsagSC and the date of uh, processing. If I click on it, I see the, an axial view of all my slides, uh, all my slices, axial slices that are cropped for better visualization. And in red is the overlay of the spinal cord segmentation. And you see the little message here, toggle overlay, if I click on it, I can I can make the uh, segmentation disappear so that I can appreciate uh, how well the spinal cord segmentation um, is you know um, accounts for the contour of the spinal cord along the superior inferior direction. And instead of click, clicking, you can also use the the right arrow. And you'll see that if you have hundreds of subjects to you know to a QC it makes it very useful to use the arrow. Um, useful also is that, you know, if you're trying different parameters, you have the command written here that has been run. So, you know, you can, you can then try different parameters and then in your QC, you can compare uh, what parameters is better. Uh, and, you know, looking at uh, the, the parameters that you chose here uh, alongside your results. Um, another aspect of the QC report, which is very useful, we, we, we do often is, uh, you know, this is a standalone folder. So you can take this folder, you can compress it as like a zip file, and then you can send that zip files to your collaborators, your supervisor, um, uh, in order to, you know, to, to share your results, uh, and, you know, um, in, in the context of a collaboration, in the context of, you know, you publishing an article and wanting to be uh, transparent about your, uh, your results and your QC, you can, you can basically zip all your um, results um, and, uh, and share it with the community. Okay, so going back now 
to the slides. Any questions so far? So you, we've used the QC report, but you know it's an image. We can also look at the image, uh, and if you look at you know what the message uh, says in the end, it proposes a syntax to open the QC report, right? So you can do a triple click, copy paste, and open the QC report directly from the terminal. It's even faster, okay. What you can also do is open uh, a viewer, your favorite viewer, with the image and with the uh, created segmentation. And it adds, you know, some some like parameters for the appropriate color and opacity. So I'm doing a copy and then paste. And then it will open Facilize. If you don't have Facilize, but you have another viewer, it will select uh, the other viewer. Um, if it's recognized by SCT. So you see that I can uh, I can look at my different slices and I can use uh, command F to toggle the uh, segmentation on off. I can zoom in, I can remove some uh, some views and so on. All right. So if the segmentation fails, as I said, you can try different parameters. Uh, you can change the kernel uh, dimensions to be 3D instead of 2D. Um, you can also change the way the center line is detected using the SVM, which is optic, or the CNN, or uh, you can also do it manually using a viewer. You can point. Uh, a few slices along the spinal cord, and then it will interpolate and create a central line that is subsequently used uh, to apply the second CNN. Um, we're not going to spend too much time on that, uh, but you know, feel free to to experience uh, on your end, and you know, feel free to post questions, ask for help on the SCT forum, which is uh, which is here. Sounds good. Any questions so far? If not, ah, what, which part uh, is the center line in uh, the spinal cord? So the center line in the spinal cord would be uh, actually the uh, the center of mass uh, of the segmentation. So it will be like a single pixel in the middle of each slice, right? And that's what's used to crop the span of cord and, and do, you know, get a, a robust segmentation. Question from uh, Ricky Walsh. Is it possible to view sagittal slices in the QC report? Uh, rather than axial, so it is, and we're gonna see that uh, with the with the vertebral labeling. Yeah. Um, can I use SCT deep seg for MS lesion segmentation and volume calculation? So yes, you can. Uh, you can use deep seg for MS lesion segmentation. The model is already available, and volume calculation. So it depends what volume you're re referring to. If you're referring to the volume of the spinal cord. Uh, it is possible using SCT analyze volume. Uh, that's something we can uh, look at later. But if you're referring to the volume of the MS lesions themselves, it's, it's also possible to do it uh, using the SCT analyze lesion uh, function that uh, we'll, we'll mention later as well. Question from Lydia. Hello, Lydia. Uh, the outputs are Hi, saved, <laughs> <laughs> saved in a different folder than the one where the input data are stored. Aha. Uh, okay, right. So what's happening is that the outputs, yeah, that's a very important point. Thanks for uh, bringing that up. should actually mention that um, output location. The By default, the output uh, is uh, is on the current directory. 
So let's say that in my case, I'm here. And this happens to be where my input data is, right? Mm -hmm. So when I run the, the segmentation, the output will be exactly at that location. But if I, if I run the segmentation on the parent folder here, for example, let's rerun it. As it is seg as C. Uh, for for fun, I'm gonna actually use another uh, parameter. So putting a dash H to get the help. I'm gonna use uh, let's say a kernel kernel three uh, D. Okay, why doesn't it work? Because I'm currently on, on data, right? So data is data is here and there is no T2 uh, and uh, GZ. So I need to do, specify this, T2 slash, okay. So it will do the processing and in the meantime, uh, I can I can explain. So. Yes, the output will be local. So you need to figure out a way that works for you in terms of uh, you know, where you want your outputs. Um, I'm, I'm going to show you that there's also a flag mm -hmm. to specify where your output files could be. Mm -hmm. um, so if I put the help again, there's a flag called uh, dash O where you can mm -hmm. specify where you want your output uh, to be located, right? But I want to mention that uh, this, not all the files, depending on the functions, not all the files might end up there. Uh, so some functions don't necessarily have this dash O uh, flag. Uh, so that's something you, you might want to be aware of. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And so let's now look at the QC report because we did this kernel 3D. So it would be fun to compare the two. So what I'm going to do is a refresh. So you can refresh your browser and you see now that there is another line. So that was the first one and that's the second one, right? And you see here, if you look at command, then you notice that there is now a dash kernel 3D that has been added, right? And then we can switch back and forth between the, you know, first command and second command, and you see that the results are slightly different, right? So again, depending on your, you know, data contrast resolution and many other parameters, you might want to pick and choose what you, uh, what works best for you. Okay. Um, oh yeah, Dina Tran, is it normal for the first two slices to not be fully labeled like in the example. Yeah, that's also a very good point. Uh, yeah, like here, for example, we see that the, the slices are not perfectly segmented. That is um, that is because we arrive at the, at the you know, interface between the um, medulla oblongata um, at the end of the, of the brainstem. Uh, so the algorithm doesn't really know uh, where the spinal cord exactly starts and ends. So there, there might be some, you know, partial, partial labeling, um, and that's something to be aware of. Obviously, you know, if you want to compute cross-sectional area, don't do it when you have partial segmentations because that will bias the uh, results. Right. So we usually do it when we are, you know, at around, you know, C two, C three. Uh, which is around there. And again, when we'll do the vertebral labeling, you'll see better where C2, C3, and the labels are located. Because from this slice, it's from this orientation, we don't really know where the vertebrae are. Sounds good? Any other questions? Okay, so let's, uh, let's continue with the vertebral labeling. A bit of theory. Um, the algorithm that was introduced um, quite a while, you know, almost 10 years ago by Ullmann et al. 
um, is to find uh, the C2, C3 disk that's using optic. So it was an, an update of the original method using optic to find C2, C3. Then it does a, a straightening of the spinal cord using a method that Benjamin uh, developed. And then there's a sliding window of disk pattern uh, that uses some, um, some uh, probability of disk location based on the uh, PAM50 template. So it's, it's a regularized and probabilistic uh, based sliding window. Uh, what's interesting with that approach is that it's supposed to be fairly robust in case of you know, missing disks or missing vertebrae, for example, because it will place the disk where it should be uh, based on the uh, scale adjusted uh, location of the disk for that particular individual. Um, so the, there are two types of vertebral uh, labels. There are fully uh, full body labels where the spinal cord segmentation is, uh, is encoded uh, for different uh, levels. You'll have, you know, the segmentation will have the value, for example, two, if it's for C2, three, four, five, and so on, right? Uh, you can also have single point labels. Uh, which are typically used as landmarks for the registration pipeline that we are going to see later on. Um, importantly, there is a convention for those point labels. Uh, if we're talking about vertebral labels, uh, the convention is uh, is the following. For C2, uh, for C1, the point label will have the value 1, C2, 2, and so on. And after C7, we continue the, uh, you know, the um, increase of those integer numbers. Uh, so T1 would be eight, T2 would be nine, and so on and so forth, okay? Uh, we also have disk labels. Uh, and now the value, for example, the value number two would correspond to the interface between C1 and C2. The value three would be C2, C3, and so on. Uh, it's important to note that uh, there are not only disk labels, as some of you might have noticed. There is also a label for the um, pontomedullary junction, the, um, the, the, the pontomedullary groove as well, and the, um, the, um, the start of the coda echinia, right? So the, the conus medullaris has the value 60, and that's a new label that has been added recently on uh, available in version 6.1. It's been added because more and more people are doing lumbar spinal cord uh, processing and uh, there was a need to register to the template using the information of the conus medullaris. So it is now available and uh, we're, we're gonna show you how to use that for the registration. Okay, a bit of hands-on. We're gonna run the vertebral labeling, but before doing so, I need to go back to my T2 folder. So CD, T2, okay, I'm in there. I'm going to do a copy and paste. And while this is running, I can explain you um, the different processing. So first of all, you notice that uh, the input is the image itself and the segmentation, right? So you need to have a segmentation of the spinal cord in order to do the vertebral labeling. Uh, another in input is the contrast. So you need to tell the algorithm what contrast you're dealing with. In this case, this is a T2 contrast. So uh, dash C space T2. And I still want my QC report in the end. So that doesn't change. So now, if, if I look at my terminal window, uh, I'm going to go up a little bit. Okay, so I, I wrote my syntax here. I pressed enter, tells me my version of spinal cord toolbox, the syntax I, I used. The first part is to copy some data in the temporary folders, like here, right? Uh, and then it will straighten the spinal cord. Um, it will it will find an approximated center line. It will compute the length of the spinal cord. So this is all 
the algorithm of the straightening. Then it generates warping fields that are temporary for bringing the curved spinal cord into the, into the straight space and the other way around. And then it resamples, uh, it, it applies the straightening to the segmentation. Okay. Then it finds the disk uh, C2, C3. It found it. Sometimes it does not. If it does not, there is a manual uh, step that you can do, which I'm going to show you later. Applies the straightening to the label, to the C2, C3 label. And then it starts from there and finds the disk. So it's fine. Currently, it's at disk two, and then it goes up. It finds disk uh, one, two, and then it goes down. Disk C C three C two C three C three C four C four C five, and so on, until where there is no more disk to find. It unstraightens the labels. Uh, it does a bit of things to, you know, uh, make sure that the that the segmentation is the same as uh, the one you input it. Um, it does a bunch of other processing, and then it creates the QC report, and that's the end of the of the of the of the, of the uh, processing. So there's a QC report like before, and also a command to run Fessalize. So let's look at the QC report. I'm going to run this. Or oh, I have my QC report opened already. So I'm going to look at this. I'll do a refresh. And you see there's a third line now that appeared with the function SCT label vertebra. So if I click on it, I see a sagittal view of the, um, of the segmentation of the cord that is now labeled with the uh, vertebral labels. And that's a quick way to assess whether the you know, labeling is correct. Uh, these are my disks. This is the C2, C3 disk. And that's vertebrae C2, vertebrae C3. So I'm good. And you can quickly check whether the rest is fine. And you can also use the right arrow to you know, switching, uh, like toggle the overlay on and off. While I'm at it, uh, I can also mention that um, you can use the uh, search um, search field on the QC report to filter by by function. You know, imagine that you're you you process um, you know five hundred subjects, and there is a bunch of functions that you run on the subjects. You would only want to QC the vertebral labeling, so you can type let's say a uh, label and then only the function with label vertebra will show up, right? So that's a quick way to, to run the, the QC on specific functions. Any question? And I segment, so question from Mauro. Anaoka, uh, can I segment the thoracic or lumbar spine uh, if I don't have images of the whole spine? Yes. Uh, yeah. So Joshua's uh, answer is is correct. Um, yeah, that's that's a good point. Can I segment the thoracic or lumbar spine if I don't? Uh, yeah. Right. Okay. Um, if you have other questions, feel free to post them. Um, I'm going to, so the next slide is about the manual initialization, right? So if you type SCT label vertebra and then dash H, you look at the different options and you'll see that one option is the init, the, um, the init label. And you can enter a file and that file is uh, a label that is located at the posterior tip of C2, C3, right? You can create that label. And so we're not going to do it now because of uh, the interest of time. You can try it at home. Uh, if you run SCT label utils, it will create a window where you can click. Well, actually, let's just try it. It's, it's relatively quick. So you see it creates this window. I click there. C2, C3, and then I save and quit. 
and it created that file, that label C2C3. You can see it here as well. Label C2C3, that is only a single point at the disk C2C3. And then we can use that when we run, I'm going, I'm not going to rerun it, but we can rerun label vertebra with, uh, with that additional label. Sounds good. Question from, yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, so question from uh, GLU. Between the two different labeling methods, which one is preferred? So that would be a question for later because currently the only thing we're doing is, um, is labeling the vertebrae, right? Um, and later on, from that segmentation, from that labels, we can uh, we can use either the the vertebrae or the disks, and typically that would be used for the registration to the template. And we're gonna see what are the pros and cons uh, when comes uh, when comes the time to register to the template. You know, uh, very briefly, if for example, if you're uh, if you have FOVs, field of use that are, that you know that the MR tech centered uh, at the disk C two C three, for example, and you only have you know, let's say three slices, then you want to do your registration to the template using disk labels and not vertebral lab labels, right? So that that would be an example of uh, you know a case where you want to use uh, disks as opposed to uh, vertebral labels. Um, Question from Hussein uh, Alshari, how to extract the thoracic cord from labeling? Um, well, usually the labeling is done, you know, whenever there are, there are discs that appear, um, it, you know, there is no option in SCT label vertebrae to exclude discs, right? Um, yeah, exactly. As Joshua said, I, I was about to say the same thing. You can always label uh, everything that is that appears on your on your field of view, and then you can crop or you can you know you can you can do anything that you like to uh, remove the information. Uh, I'm not sure what would be the the you know use case for not labeling something, but yeah. Okay, uh, let's move on to the next slide. Uh, shape based analysis. So, what is this about? Oh, that's Sandrine. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, so, with your different your segmentation and your vertical label, and then you can compute some shape metrics. So, a usual metrics that we compute is cross sectional area, and here we average it across the um, C three and C four vertical levels. So when we look at the command, so we use SCT process segmentation, we input the segmentation that we created, then we specify that we want with the flag vert between three and four, the levels. And we also use the um, vertebral labeling that we just created, and then it will output a CSV file. So here in the vert file, here we would want to create, to use the one that we created, but by default, it will also use the PAM50 level if you're in the PAM50, you have done your registration, but we can directly use the one we created. So, Julien just ran uh, the command, I think, and uh, we can open the CSV file that it has created. So I can open it with, so I'm on Mac OS. There is an application called Numbers, which is the equivalent of Excel. But first I want to show you what's the actual CSV because it's just a comma separated um, value file. So I can open it with any text editor. It looks a bit ugly, as you can see. Sandrine, you can comment. And then in the meantime, I can open also the, uh... well, first maybe let's comment that and then I'll open with Numbers. Uh, yes. So the it's well a bit hard to read in your yeah. CSV file, but it can then you can 
imported, for example, in other Python scripts, and it makes it easy to go uh, fetch some some results to then do some statistical analysis with the CSV file. But if you want to check your values here in the so we have the file name, we have the slices. So here it refers that the C3, C4 is got from those slight number of slices. Then, uh, so the mean area would, would have the vertebral level, then the mean area. So this is the cross-sectional area between those levels, the average. And we have the standard deviation since we averaged it across uh, the slices from C3, C4. Then we also have the AP angle, which is um, the angle with the AP axis and the standard deviation. Um, also, if when you average across two different levels, uh, there is an angle correction since you're to account for the curvature of the spinal cord. So you can also go check your angles to see if they make sense. Um, because this is used when you compute cross-sectional area, but you can also remove uh, this option. Then we have same thing for right left. We have the anterior posterior diameter. We also have the right left diameter. Then we have some uh, other shape metrics, but we'll get into those uh, in following slides. Uh, also, it's very important to note that, as Julien said, your cross-sectional area is based from your segmentation. So if there's some errors in your segmentation, this will directly impact your cross-sectional area measure. Now, you can also compute cross-sectional area per slice per level. So you can uh, use the flag per level one. So this will output average GSA for each of the levels that you have. So now you have two lines, one for of uh, two levels. Since here we only specified three and four, that's why we only have two values, one for each level, and we have the mean area. Then we can also use the flag per slice instead. So we'll have just one value for each slice. So now we see we have one value per slice. And we have also, we still indicate the vertebral file just to have to know which slice corresponds to which level. And also we see that we don't have any standard deviation because it's just for one slice. And so these are many, uh, you can explore their different uh, ways to compute to average them. You can include more levels or less, um, depends on the analysis you want to do. However, a drawback of using vertebral based cross-sectional area it's that it doesn't necessarily consider neck flexion in, and extension. So to over, overcome this limitation, CSA can be computed using a distance from a reference point. So here we use the pontomedullary junction. So we see it labeled in green here. Um, since the distance from the PMJ along the center line will be less dependent on the position of the neck. So to do this, first we need to, to run SCT detect PMJ. So it will automatically detect the pontomedullary junction, but we always want to check the QC report to see if it's correct, the labeling is correct. So this seems, um, oh, yeah, this seems Perfect. We could also do a manual correct, a manual labeling since it's just a one point label for this. So we can continue to the next step. Now we're going to use again SCT process segmentation. However, we're going to specify with the flag PMJ um, the PMJ file that we just generated. 
then we also need to specify a distance from where to compute it. So here we use uh, 64 millimeters. It's actually an average of the position of the C2, C3 disc on a, a cohort of 800 uh, subjects. So this is where this value is from, but you could specify anything. Then the PMJ extent is just, you don't necessarily want to average on one slice. So you just need to choose on what is uh, the extent you want to average on. And then uh, we can open again the CSV file. And we also have a, a new column that is filled distance PMJ. That is the distance from where we computed cross-sectional area. And this feature is available, um, was available in from 5.4 and higher versions. I think there's also a QC report. Yes. So you can see here uh, the center line. So you can see the center line that was generated to compute the distance. And in red overlaid, that is the extent of where your cross-sectional area was averaged. Now I'll let uh, Jan continue on other shape metrics. Quick question, please. Yes. Of course. Um, hi, Sandrine. Hi. So how do you determine the length of that extent? Because you said it's um, average around C2, C3. So what if I decide, let's say in my subject, they have compression in C4, C5. How do I determine that distance? Um, yes, so you Specify could, the extent. <laughs> uh, thing you could do, uh, yes, you, you would need to, to go compute. Maybe that distance would change for each participant, but you would need to, to compute the distance from the center line. Um, I don't think right now we have that feature in SCT, but that could be yeah. a, an, an idea of computing that distance. And then the extent that you choose, well, it depends. If you have a spinal cord compression, it doesn't necessarily extend on a lot of slices. So mm -hmm. you would want maybe a smaller extent because you're going to average slices that are not compressed, and then you will lose some precision about your compression metrics. So okay. that that's um, how I would choose the, the extent. Okay, thank you. Maybe I would add also that in this particular case, the, you might you might want to use the um you know the the like the the location like some labels of where your um your injury is as opposed to computing a distance between the pmj and and the and the compression side because really the the rationale for using the pmj based approach is to have stable measures of cross sectional area um you know within a subject longitudinally or across subjects, but it's really, you know, it's, it's, it's another way uh, to compute CSA instead of relying you know, on the disc, you really rely on the, on the PMJ, uh, on the distance from the PMJ. So in the case of a compression, not sure if, if it makes more sense to use that, um, but that, that, you know, that's something that could be discussed further. Okay. Yeah. Thank you me. could, instead of a disc, label you can uh, also specify a specific slice um, a number for example so you could also use that um, or instead of a disk label you could also specify your own labels of where the compression is okay hello everyone so in addition to the cross-sectional area a CD process segmentation function provides also other shape metrics. Namely, these are AP, anterior posterior diameter, RL, right left diameter, eccentricity, solidity, and orientation. Uh, all these other shape metrics uh, might be relevant and interesting. For example, when uh, studying spinal cord compression in diseases such as degenerative cervical myelopathy. 
the figure on the right side uh, shows uh, what such a compression can look like. So we can see uh, sagittal and axial images of a participant with spinal cord compression. And the compression side is highlighted by the red arrows. So it's here and here in axial slice, we can see the compression here. And here in these charts, each one corresponds to uh, one metric. So this one corresponds to cross-sectional area. This one corresponds to AP diameter. So in these charts, we can see these red dashed lines. And these red dashed lines correspond to the level of compression. So you can see how the shape metrics change at the level of compression. So for example, cross-sectional area at the level of compression becomes smaller. Uh, all these other shape metrics are saved in the same file, the same CSV file, together with cross-sectional area, as was shown. And yeah, they are formatted in this format. So I guess we can move on to the next slide. Yeah, this slide uh, presents a new feature added in SET 6.0 to the SET process segmentation function. And this new feature allows you to normalize or bring the shape metrics to the PAM50 anatomical dimensions. How was mentioned, PAM50 stands for the spinal cord template. It will be covered in detail in the next session. So just very briefly, it represents standard reference space generated by combining data of multiple subjects. Uh, the normalization command looks like this. So the normalization is done using the normalized PAM50 flag. So again, you provide spinal cord segmentation and vertebral labeling, and then you specify that you want to normalize to PAM50. The normalization is done uh, based on linear interpolation. So for each vertebral level in the subject's native space and also in the template space, the number of axial slices for each level is calculated. And then the shape metrics are linearly interpolated from the subject's native space to the PAM50 template. And what is now important here, the output CSV file contains slice column and the slice numbers now correspond to the slices in the PAM50 template. So for example, let's say that you have multiple subjects, 10, 20, or even 1, 200, and you would like to compare them. So you can bring all your individual subjects to the same common space, and then all the slices for all the subjects will correspond. And what is also important to say here is that this normalization does not involve any image registration. So, you don't have to be afraid about geometrical distortions, uh, which might be introduced during the registration process to, to the template. Uh, yeah, we can move to the next slide. Yeah, this slide uh, shows another uh, possible application of the normalization to the, to the PAM50 anatomical dimensions. So here in this figure, we can see in blue a uh, cross-sectional area computed from 203 healthy subjects. So this blue line represents mean cross-sectional area, it, and it is kind of a normative, normative values across individual vertebral levels. Here we have vertebral levels from C1 to T1, and here we have also axial slices in the PAM50 space. So these slices correspond to individual slices in the PAM50 template. And once you normalize your single subject data to the PAM50 anatomical dimensions by the command on the previous slide, you can plot your single subject data in relationship to the normative values. So you can kind of explore the relationship of your data with the normative, normative values computed from a large cohort of healthy subjects. For more details and for all other shape metrics, uh, you can visit uh, our uh, our interactive preprint, which we recently published in Neurolibra. And moving on to the last slide of this section, uh, here we have a brand new function added to SCT in the version 6.0. The function is called SCT Compute Compression. And this function allows you to compute compression metrics. 
The compression matrix are calculated based on the MSCC equation. So MSCC stands for maximum spinal cord compression. And basically the equation takes the level of compression highlighted by the red arrow. So it's here. Here we can see how the spinal cord is compressed. And it divides it by the non-compressed levels above and below the compression sides. So you can see that uh, this MSCC equation uh, provides subject-based normalization. But still, it does not consider the fact that uh, spinal cord anatomy is changing in cross vertebral levels. For example, at around levels C4, C5, uh, spinal cord is larger due to cervical enlargement. And this is not considered in MSCC equation. So this is why we extended it and we added additional additional normalization step. So basically each level, the compression level and also the levels above and below, we normalize them based on the levels extracted from a database of healthy controls. Uh, we have, a, since this is a new feature, we have a detailed tutorial describing all the individual steps. So you can visit the Spinal Cord Toolbox website and you can follow the tutorial. And for more details, you can also check our recent OHBM abstract. Thank you, Jan. So we have a very uh, good question from uh, GLU. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, it's it's not naive at all. Uh, why would we, why would we like to normalize the 250 template to obtain the shape matrix? Can't we just use those metrics, uh, you know, directly from the native T2 image? Yeah, both options are possible. You can you can use the the metrics in, computed from the native image, but the normalization kind of allows you to bring everything into the same anatomical dimensions, and you can also compare your metrics with the normative values. So maybe I can give an example. Uh, let's say that um, let's say that uh, you know the the MSCC. Is um, the MSCC is a self normalization uh, method to to um, to to normalize uh, to to compute compression. Um, so it will it will normalize. You know, let, let's say if you compute uh, like an AP diameter of like you know three millimeter in a patient, that three millimeter will be normalized according to the first equation to the average cross-sectional area above and below the lesion, right? The problem with that is that the spinal cord is not a, a perfect cylinder a cylinder along the inferior superior direction. You know, you have the cervical enlargement, for example. But uh, at that cervical enlargement, the cross-sectional area is bigger. So by computing a, a normalization of the compressed side, uh, you know, above and below, you will be sensitive to where your compression occurs in the in along the superior and inferior axis because if you normalize by a value that is you know very high because it happens to be at the cervical enlargement then the computed MSCC will be you know uh, smaller than what it should be if the compression has uh, you know had occurred at, at another location and that way, we, you know, that idea of MSCC normalization is to is to prevent that bias by, you know, uh, normalizing uh, not only uh, from the level above and below, but also from what the spinal cord, from what the average spinal cord uh, cross-sectional area is at every level along the superior and inferior axis. I hope that's uh, I hope that's clear. And again, this is there is more details in the uh, in the associated publications. Maybe also an extra detail. Um, so usually, like we showed before, when we compute cross-sectional area, we refer to disc or vertebral labels uh, levels, and we average it. However, when we have some compressions, for example, they could occur at the disc level. But if we average on two levels, then we lose some information about that compression because we include slices that are not compressed. So when instead using the PAM50, this allows you to, to keep a slice-wise um, metric 
and also directly compare it because like the the slide I think for that Jan showed of the graph um, so how we're able to plot this CSA uh, across all individual slices is when we normalize it but if you want to plot all your subjects cross-sectional area you have to adjust the position of the disk which which is kind of what we do in this normalization to get really a slice wise metric and not an average across a few levels yeah this was a great point thank you sandrine and also one important thing or one useful thing uh, with the normalization you can actually filter based on sex and age and also mri vendors so for example if you normalizing your data and you know that your single subject is female you can filter just females and this is important because how it was how it was shown for example females have smaller cross-sectional area than males so if you normalize with the whole cohort you can introduce kind of bias but it, you can filter based on the based on the gender sorry based on the sex and also based on age or also on mri vendors great Thank you, Sandrine and Jan, for detailing this section. Uh, I think we can move on now to the uh, section number six, registration to template. Bit of theory. Um, many of you are already familiar with the PAM50 templates. PAM stands for Polytechnic, Ex Marseille University, and Montreal Neurological Institute, or MNI and 50 because there have been 50 adult uh, subjects uh, you know, being part of the uh, of that template acquired at two different sites, uh, Montreal and Marseille. Um, quick features, uh, the, the template uh, features the T1 weighted contrast, T2 weighted contrast, uh, T2 star weighted contrast, uh, it also has a probabilistic mask of the white matter, the gray matter, the cerebrospinal fluid, and of course the spinal cord. Uh, it also has um, a segmentation of the spine, uh, which is not shown here, but uh, the spine with the with the, the different uh, vertebrae. Uh, it also has the, the the disc and vertebral labels. Uh, and it has um, atlases uh, of the white matter tract, so 30 different uh, tracts uh, along the um, spinal cord uh, white matter, as well as a clustering of the, of the gray matter. So uh, six different uh, sections in the gray matter that could be used for, uh, for functional MRI uh, studies, for example. Um, so the registration to the to the PAM50 template is relatively intuitive. We first start with a, an anatomical image, um, typically a, a, an isotropic resolution image. Here it's a 0.8 millimeter isotropic, from which you get the segmentation, and then the vertebral labeling. So this is something we've already done together, and then there is a straightening part, and after that straightening, there is a, an affine adjustment, like an affine scaling uh, to, to match the vertebral levels that you want your registration to match uh, between your subject and the PAM50 uh, template. And after that linear scaling, there is a non-rigid registration that can be parametrized. And there is a lot of parameters, as we will see. Once everything is finished, uh, it uh, creates warping field that can uh, that can be used to bring um, your native subject to the template, or to bring the template to your native space. Right, so you can do it uh, using a what we call the forward, bringing it to the template, or a backward, bringing it to the native space. We'll see how we can use those uh, warping fields. The first. The straightening, the um, 
threatening works using an algorithm that was uh, developed by Benjamin de Lanier and that preserves the internal distance. Uh, so it, it does not um, it does not deform. Uh, it does not change the the actual um, uh, organization of of the spinal cord uh, internal structure uh, because instead of you know sliding each slice, it does really a, a warping. Uh, and there is an animation that uh, actually explains that better than words. That unfortunately I'm not able to see. So that's something we need to fix. Uh, if someone from the internal team can note that, but I'm going to open it on my uh, other browser. So we start with like a, a curved space and it creates a regularized straightening to arrive uh, at this, uh, you know, at kind of a, that's what we call the straight spinal cord or like a straightened spinal cord. It's like, uh, you know, a processed way to align the spinal cord. And that's really the first step towards realigning to the, to the PAM50 template. Um, just organize it the way it was before. Okay. So once uh, once we've straightened uh, and then have linearly have find um, you know adjusted our um, our uh, native space uh, to match the PAM50, we want to do this non-rigid alignment. And we want to do it using a warping field. So first of all, what is a warping field? A warping field um, is a 4D volume that contains the displacement along the X, Y, and Z dimensions. Um, a few words is that this warping field uh, using uses conventions from ANS. So it's a it has the you know the vector information in the fifth dimension, whereas software like FSL and SPM use the um, the fourth dimension to encode the vector. And if you want to convert your warping field to be compatible with FSL, for example, there is a command to do that, right? So it converts uh, ITK-based warping field to uh, an FSL or SPM compatible warping field. This was, a, this was a bit technical. Most of the time, you don't, you don't need to deal with that. Okay, so um, once you have the the registration and the warping field, then you can use them to uh, with another image like a, you know a DTI or MTR image to uh, register it to the template and then e extract some uh, metrics. And after that, you can uh, compute you know. Uh, white gray matter cross-sectional area at specific levels that corresponds to the PAM50 template, uh, or you can also use, uh, you know, the white matter uh, tracts from the PAM50 atlas to extract uh, your, your metrics. Um, okay, so let's do this together. First step, uh, you remember, the we 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 ended up doing our labeling of the of the vertebrae right now we are going to use that labeling that that uh, you know se labeled segmentation to extract two different um, values value three and nine which corresponds to c three and t uh, so t one would be a value eight. T2 would be value uh, nine. So that corresponds to the T2 vertebrae, okay? I'm going to copy this and paste it. So it created two labels. Um, and then we're gonna, let's look at those labels. So I'm gonna run that QC. Okay. Let me go to my QC um, page, refresh. And you see that the label util functions appears at the end. And I can see my labels three, which corresponds to indeed uh, level three, and then nine, which corresponds to T2. Um, okay, 
what do I do with that? Let's go to the next page. Um, right. So in case you want to do the, you want to bypass the vertebral, the automatic vertebral labeling, you can also do the labeling yourself manually using the SCT label kills functions that I showed you before. Um, so that's something, you know, we won't do it here, but you can try it uh, at home if you like. Okay, at this point, we can run that uh, command, SCT register to template. So that's really the main command. So I'm going to run it and then explain to you the different steps. So copy, paste. Okay, it's running. So the first input is the image. Okay, we need the image to do the registration to the template. The second input, dash S, is for the segmentation. So this is something we obtained earlier using uh, SCT DeepSeg SC. The third argument is dash L, which corresponds to the vertebral levels. Uh, and that's that's the label files that we created earlier. And so that's the label file that has the C3 and the T2 levels, right? So I know that the registration will will be done such that the C3 and, and the T2 are perfectly aligned. And the ones in between will be, you know, so-so aligned depending on the, you know, on the placement of the disks uh, with respect to the average placement of the disk on, on the PAMP3 template. Uh, if you are only interested in registering, let's say, you know, you're only looking at studying C3, C5, then you would use labels that are that go from C3 to C5. That, that would be my recommendation. Uh, another flag is the contrast because we want to register the to the PAM50 that has the similar contrast than your native image. So in this case, I use the T2 image. So I'm going to write a dash C T2. If you've had a T1 weighted MP range, you would have used dash C T1. And that is the, the same QC flag that I've used in the past. So you see that, so that command is relatively long. Let me go on top to explain what it does. Okay. So, um, checks that all the files are present and so on. Um, it will do some resampling, uh, reorientation. Then it will straighten the spinal cord the same way it did for the vertebral labeling. And then it will uh, bring the image from the native space to the straightened space. That's what we call step zero. And then it will do a scaling uh, at step zero. And the first step that you're seeing here is um, to, to do this alignment uh, between the spinal cord uh, center line and the PAM50 template. So this is a, um, there's a bunch of parameters here. The ones that are import very important are the type. So type says that it's the, if it's using the image or the segmentation, in this case, it's using both. Algo is the algorithm that is used by the uh, registration. And so in this case, it's the center mass rot, which means that it will take the center mass of the segmentation and, and put it where the center line of the, of the PAM50 is. And the rot is that it will do also rotation in case the spinal cord is slightly rotated. It will find it using the image and the segmentation and correct for it. Slice-wise is, um, is not used here. So by default, uh, by default, this is a slice-wise algorithm. So this is a bit confusing. You might want to uh, you might want to fix it. Um, and then there are other fields that are not used by this algorithm. So the the fields that appear are really algorithm dependent, right? So these are default metri 
default uh, parameters that are not used by the central mass shot argument, but are, that are used by other uh, algorithms. So if you go down, there is a step number two. That step number two uses another algorithm, B spline scene. So this is coming from ANTS, and it's using the segmentation only. Uh, it is not a slice wise method. Um, and it's using the mean squares. Uh, so it's trying to to match the segmentation of the of the chord in the native space, in the straightened native space with the segmentation of the chord in the pan 50 space. There's a bunch of other, technical parameters that I'm not going to explain in details, but if you have questions, you know, I'd be happy to, to answer them. And that's it. There are only two steps here. And then it will, you know, create the warping fields and then uh, output the traditional, you know, syntax to open the QC reports to look at the results in PSLIs uh, in the um, native space or in the pan 50 space, right? So we can look at that. We can look at this first command. So this is my, uh, this is, you see the template to anat. So this is the pan 50 template that is registered to the anatomical image. So if I remove, if I make it invisible, uh, you see that my, uh, Pan 50 uh, space is now in the uh, space of the T2. And we can also do the same for the, um, to look at the results in the Pan 50 space. So I'm going to adjust the contrast a little bit. Okay, so that's the what I'm seeing here is the, uh, t, in the is the T two image, and then if I remove it, you see that I'm uh, switching back and forth. So this is the Pan fifty T two. I'm in the space of the Pan fifty, and then I'm I'm switching back and forth. Uh, I'm I'm toggling the uh, you know the registered T two onto the Pan fifty. So you can see that. My levels, you know, C3, uh, like are well, well aligned. You know, the discs match pretty well uh, down to T2, which is at the end of my field of view. And we can also look at the QC report. So I'm going to do a refresh. There's an additional line here that says SET register to template. And if I click on it, this is a view of the um, of the PAM50 template, and this is the view of my T2. And so I can toggle back and forth to appreciate the, uh, the quality of the alignment. And you can notice an important aspect is that where the cord is, uh, is slightly rotated, then that registration was, was also appropriately found. Uh, and that's important in cases where there is scoliosis or uh, compression, for example. So this is a relatively important step uh, during the course. You know, registering to the PAN50 is, um, is something that is um, you know, necessary for many subsequent functions. So, I'm happy to take any questions at this point. I think Joshua, did you want to say something? Uh, yes, there are some questions in the chat for Zoom. Uh, ah, yes, thank you. Thank you. Does PAM50, uh, so a question for Lydia, does PAM50 extend beyond uh, T6 level? Yes, actually that's a good uh, moment to look at the PAM50. Um, how do you open the pan 50? Well, you can open it. You see that there was a command here, users code span account to box. That's where my pan 50 is, is located. Uh, 
you if you don't want to write everything and you're not sure where SCP is installed, what you can type is specialize or any of your viewer. And then um, SCT, so dollar SCT dear slash data pump 50 template. And then we can put the, the T2, for example, or let, let's look at the T1, because we just look at the T2. T1 and ii.gz. Okay, so it's not happy with that. That's because that's because T1 is with a capital T. And so it's pump. Oh no, it's like okay, it's like this. Should be fine like that. No, there's an under underscore after T1 that should be a dot. Uh, oh yeah, exactly. T1, yes, yeah, like this. So that's where auto completion becomes useful, just to make sure you didn't make any syn syntax. So that's the PAM50 uh, T1. We can bring the, uh, the vertebral levels in there. So if I click, let me do it here. If I do on the, ah, oh, yes, so you don't see. Settings, file. So if you do the add from file, you see this is my PAM50. Uh, so this is my Spinal Core Toolbox installation folder, data, PAM50 template. Then there is a bunch of stuff here. The one I want to bring is, for example, the, um, the levels. We can color code them, this for example. And so if you look at the value here, you see PAM50 level. So that's one, two, three, and so on. So you see it goes down to the conus medullaris. And um, yeah, with the associated levels. I mentioned about the spine before. That's actually a good moment to, to look at it. That would be spine. So you see that it also includes the uh, segmentation of the of the spine. Okay. Any other question? I think there is one more in the chat about using two labels versus more than two labels for registration. Ah, oh, yes, from Luca Durell. Yeah. Uh, if we use more than two disk labels, the registration is not a fine. Very good, uh, very good question. Um, if instead of, okay, so bottom line is you can use only one label, you can use two labels, or you can use more than two labels. If you use one label, the algorithm at step zero that you showed before, what it will do is that it will take the, the FOV and it will it will take the FOV with your label and it will place it. If your label is, let's say, C2, C3 disk, then it will just do a translation to place it at C2, C3, right? So there is no scaling because it, it has no information to do the scaling. If there are two labels, let's say, you know, two and, and nine, then it will scale it linearly. If there are like three or more labels, it will do a bispline. Um, uh, a, a bispline um, transformation to find to match to match you know three labels with from the native space from from the straightened native space to the to the pan fifty right so those three labels will be matched perfectly and what's in between will be linearly scaled right so if you have you know five six labels you can use them and it will ensure a better alignment but if you do that you will lose the information above and below because it's not possible to extrapolate uh when when we use another you know like a non-linear scaling so if you're if you care about what's you know above and below your labels then you should use only two labels and not more right 
Julian, may I elaborate on this? Of course. Okay, thank you very much. So I'm kind of new in this, so I, um, I'm my aim is to do like fMRI in the spinal cord. So, um, so I'm kind of more experienced on the brain. Um, so my question would be, as my, I will do like multimodal registration then. So the T2 will be my first step, and then I will basically try to go also on my uh, T2 star data for the, from fMRI. So it makes sense that I <clears throat> kind of distorted the T2, I mean, using non-affine registration or not. So my, my point here is like, uh, I will have more um, data from the T2 because then my fMRI will cover just three or four uh, vertebra, whereas my T2 will basically cover uh, the entire spine. So uh, my point will be, I will take basically the labels in between the vertebra I'm interested in for the fMRI and that's all for me because that is my aim. Do you think it's like uh, meaningful or not? So it, does... it, yeah, so it, 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 um, there's a couple of considerations here. Um, one consideration is that uh, when you do multi-step, multi-level registration, um, you, you know, there is always an interview like when you do multi-step registration using, you know, in the end, a scan that is, I, I assume your fMRI scan is axial and, and it has thick slices. Yeah. Uh, you know, applying nonlinear deformation on, on very thick slices uh, might create, you know, unwanted uh, interpolation errors, right? So that's one. Two is that um, in general, you know, if you have, you know, if you're interested in, let's say, you know, C5 to C7, uh, we're only talking, you know, three disks. Um, by experience, trying to, you know, match perfectly those, those three disks, those three disks um, will lead to a very, very similar, uh, you know, registration quality than if you were using only two uh, labels. The advantage of using two labels, as I said, is that it's, it's a linear scaling, so it, you know, it's more controlled. Uh, two is that you don't lose information above and below the first and last label. Um, and three, just in the grand schemes of things, you know, trying to be super precise on the alignment of, of disks while, you know, we know the limitations of, you know, the low resolution, you know, in the inferior, di di in the inferior super di dimension of the uh, fMRI scans. Plus, we know that the fMRI, you know, the, the sp spinal levels don't necessarily align perfectly well with the disks. So there is like another uncertainty here. Uh, everything put together, in general, I would, I would not be worried too much about you know making sure that the discs, you know, all the discs perfectly align. Um, Thank you very much. Um, other questions. Are you, yeah. How do you car register? Okay, so from Charles Mazo, um, I think yeah, that was that was uh, covered a little bit, and then we'll see a bit more later. Yeah, exactly. Lunch break. Yes. Thank you, Joshua. <laughs> Lunch break. Excellent. Or like breakfast or whatever, uh, depending on where you are. Good. So, um, yeah, that's a good, uh, that's a good interruption. Uh, let's, uh, let's reconvene. Uh, at, so there will be 1230 uh, Eastern Standard uh, time zone. So in, in half an hour. Okay. I'm going to keep the zoom, uh, the, the zoom open. Just switching off my camera and uh, and uh, and mic.
Welcome back, everyone. Let's give it another one minute. Okay. Okay, I think we can uh, we can resume the uh, the course. So we finished at this uh, this one. Maybe we can take uh, maybe we can take uh, a few minutes to answer some uh, some questions. Um, maybe you thought about some things based on what we've seen so far that you would like to ask. That would be a good moment. Yeah. Well, you can always post questions uh, at any time anyway. So I'm just going to continue to the next slide. Registration results. So we've already uh, looked at this. Um, some considerations on the registration. <clears throat> so um, maybe let's look at the different flags of the function. SCT register to template. Okay, so that function is quite complicated. There's a lot of parameters. The ones that you have absolutely to enter are those two, the input image and the uh, segmentation. And then uh, there are a couple of arguments. Uh, so you can use, as we discussed, uh, the vertebral labels, but you could also use the disc, disc labels. So, you know, in the first case, you would take, you would use dash L. In the second one, you would use dash L disk. Uh, something, uh, center is kind of called, uh, right. So this is, so I kind of forgot what L spinal is actually. Oh yeah, that's for the um, that's for the spinal levels, right? That's something that we've recently introduced. Yeah. So I guess we'll we'll talk about this later. If if we don't, that's something we we should add some slides on. Uh, just making a note. Um. So that would be if you want to use your own template. Uh, not the PAM50 template, but let's say you've built a template for the mouse uh, or for the macaque, uh, then you know you could you could redirect to another template. By default, it's using the uh, the PAM50 template. Uh, that's a different contrast. You can register the PAM52 dash ref uh, is something that well we discuss on this slide here. You have two options. The first option is template, which is the default. And what it means is that the the native um, the native image uh, will be straightened and then registered to the PAM50 uh, template. If you use subject, it's the other way around. The PAM50 will be registered to your native space. And there's one main uh, difference here. And the main difference is that uh, there is no straightening that's that's uh, occurring. Is that a good thing or is that a bad thing? It depends. 
uh, we we talked uh, previously about uh, you know fMRI scans with very thick slices. In this case, you don't want to do a straightening because the straightening will introduce a lot of interpolation errors. Usually, when people acquire uh, axial slices with the you know very thick uh, thick slices, those axi those uh, slices are you know typically orthogonal to the cord or like as as good as possible as orthogonal as possible to the spinal cord. There is obviously some low disease or like, you know, spinal cord culvature depending on the subject, but usually we're talking, you know, five to 10 slices. And in this case, there is no, it's, I, I recommend to, to not do a, a straightening and to register the, you know, slice by slice uh, directly to the, with the PAM50 template. And that's where you would use the ref subject, right? The other parameters, uh, something we'll discuss, uh, where you can select, you can specify the number of steps and the type of registration algorithms you want to use. Um, and these are additional, you know, parameters about how you want to do your centerline algorithm, centerline smoothing, and some fields about the QC. So coming back to the slides, we talked about the dash ref. Now we can talk about the dash param um, argument. It lets you select uh, registration uh, parameters for each step. Um, and the, the, the main difference with brain algorithms, you know, when you use, you know, SPM or FSL and, and you want to work on like brain data, the difference here is that we have some extra parameters that are very specific to the spinal cord, and one of them being the slice-wise parameter. Because once you're already in the straightened space, your goal is to align perfectly the, the spinal cord boundary with, uh, with the that from the PAM50 template. And for that, you can use different approaches. There is the ANTS-based approaches from B-spline scene, which is a more regularized version than the scene algorithm. Uh, so they are both available in a CT. You can use also slice reg, which was uh, um, which is an algorithm that is in integrated in ANTS and it results from um, collaboration between our lab and the ANTS team. And it's a, it's a slice by slice regularized uh, version of a, of a you know in-plane translation uh, that is that can be used for a uh, motion correction, for example. Um, the center mass rot, something we we talked about. Uh, the column wise is a highly um, like it 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 has a lot of degrees of freedom uh, compared to you know more regularized approach like the bispline scene, and the column wise is essentially you first align the center of masses between the subject uh, spinal cord and the PAM50. And then for each column, it will find the boundary of the spinal cord. So this is particularly useful when you have you know, strong compression, for example. And recently there is a new algorithm based on deep learning that uh, an intern in the lab uh, was working on. Um, and you can get more information in this Apertuneuro um, publication. So depending on your, you know, the type of data you're dealing with, uh, the amount of, you know, distortions, contrast, you might want to play with those parameters. So again, this is relatively complex. I would say this is one of the most complex uh, thing in ICT. So don't be shy, uh, you know, if you have questions, if you would like to know more, you know, what would be the most appropriate parameter to use. Uh, this is something you can definitely ask on the, uh, on the SCT forum. Um, you can use multiple steps. So by default, uh, we use two steps. We use a step that, uh, that is based on the, uh, on the center mass the center of mass of the spinal cord to deal with large deformations. And then the step number two is, is to, you know, to fine tune the, the registration. And that's using the B-spline scene with the mean squares. Uh, 
if you're, you know, you can add, in some cases, I see a lot of people do that. I do it myself. Is I add a, a third step, step equal three. Yeah. Uh, in that case, I can actually write this down, you know. So wh why don't we try it together? So I would, so step, uh, so I would use param. Step equals one, uh, I would use type, uh, I'm actually going to copy paste it here. Okay, and then a semicolon, and then I would write the step number two. And then semicolon step equals three the type so in this case i want to use the image so i would write i am then i want to use the algo scene i want to use the metric uh cross correlation it would be cc i want to do a slice wise slice wise equal one uh i want to use three iterations and let's see what we get with that so one thing to notice if um, one thing to notice if you uh, if you try different parameters one after another is that if the if the straightening has been done once, it will reuse the previous uh, straightening uh, that has been done so that you don't have to re-straighten the spinal cord you know, all the time, because that's something that takes, that, that takes time. Um, so step zero is the first alignment. Okay, does the first first step. That's the center mass rot. The still doing it. Step number two is the is the B spline scene based on the segmentation. Okay. Mm -hmm. And again, if you want to, you know, if you're interested and you, you're, you know, you're comfortable with uh, looking at uh, those parameters and debugging steps, you can always look at the intermediate results uh, that are output there. You see, I can choose the temporary folder and then, you know, you can uh, you can keep all the temporary files using the, the flag uh, dash R, which stands for remove. And if you, if you specify dash R zero, it means that it will keep all the uh, temporary files, and then you can, you know, it helps to understand more why a, a registration did not work well, you know, uh, at which step uh, did something fail. So you see, compared to previously, it added another step, step three, using the image, the algo scene, slice wise, uh, so it will register each slice independently using the cross correlation metrics and three iteration. The other ones are default. So it's done, concatenates the transformation. And then what we're gonna do is open the, um, like refresh the QC report so that we can compare the registration between those two. Okay, let's go to the QC reports. I'm uh, refreshing it. So you see that I have two lines of QC reports now. One here, which is the default parameters, and this is the second one. So you see that results are very, very different, right? 
So that's the second one that I launched. Uh, and then if I, oops, if I click back and forth, actually, I'm just going to do it. Yeah. If I toggle back and forth, I can see that it's not, it's not great. Like you can see that in this location on the right side of the cord, the, the scene algorithm did not really do a good job. That might be because of the, um, I think that's because you see, uh, because of the disk bulging, there's a lack of CSF. And what the algorithm is trying to do with the cross correlation is that it's trying to, to match a, uh, a T2 weighted image with a bright CSF. And that bright CSF does not exist uh, on the location where there is uh, like a disk bulging, right? And that's exactly the reason why you know, I, I, I like to, to rely more on the spinal cord segmentation, because in some cases where you have disc bulging artifacts, uh, other types of you know, pathologies, or you, you might have some like um, uh, hardware uh, in spinal cord interpretations, then it might be more, you know, less reliable to, to use the image for the registration. Uh, so that's that's actually quite a good example, but it doesn't mean that you cannot do a registration with the image. You know, by tweaking other parameters, we might be able to get much better uh, results. Right. So again, it's a registration could be an art it requires some in, intuitions on the on the all the parameters and their effects. The, another point also is the L disk. So I, I mentioned it uh, quickly, but the by default we use the dash L parameter to use the vertebral levels, the vertebral labels. But we can also use disk labels. Uh, so if you have disk labels, then you know you would simply replace the dash L with the dash L disk, and then use some disk labels for your registration. That's something I've also mentioned in answering one of uh, one question from uh, from the uh, from the audience is that if you have only you know one disk, like let's say your field of view, you know you're doing MTR diffusion, whatever, you only have like let's say three slices that are centered uh, on the C3, C4 disk. If you want to do the registration to the template, in this case, you you don't have any vertebral labels, but you have a disk label, a single disk label. In that case, you would use, you know, dash L disk with your single label, and then you would do the registration. Any question so far? Um, so that's, um, this slide illustrates, you know, the, you know, different, types of algorithms that, that could be better suited to particular types of, uh, you know, compression or pathologies or image types, right? In this case, we're using the, uh, the column wise algorithm because it does provide, uh, you know, very high degrees of freedom for, for, uh, you know, a cord that is, uh, that is squished in, under the um, AP direction uh, and on which the, you know, the column, you, you like to, actually move the uh, edges of the spinal cord along that direction. That's exactly what uh, column-wise algorithm does. And so what's the output of this uh, registration to template? We can look at it. I do, um, well, I do an LS. So this is my input data, and then there are new files that have been created. These are the those files, the warp and add to templates. So that's and the curve to stray. So these are the files that have been regenerated by the um, the straightening. And oh, sorry, I, I'm no that that, that that was a mistake. The ones generated by the straightening are curved to straight and straight to curve. The one generated by 
the registration to template are warp annat to template and warp template to annat. And intuitive, you know, as as uh, the name uh, indicates, if you want to bring your anatomical image to the PAM50 space, you would use this one. If you do, if you want to do it the other way around, bring the PAM50 objects into the native space, you would use that one. And this is exactly what we're going to do now in this slide. This slide is about warping template objects on the native space. And we are going to use the SCT warp template command. Triple click, copy, paste. And what it does is that uh, it will, the destination image will be the T2. Okay. The warping field is the template to Anat. And that is pretty much the only flags. I, I specified dash A0 because we don't need the, the white matter atlas at this point, something we're going to see later. And that's the QC report. It does a few things, dilates the labels, brings them to the to the native space. And after that, we'll be able to, to look at the QC report and also the results on the on FSLIs or your favorite viewer. But why this is processing, I can look at the different questions. There is indeed a question from uh, um, from Fozia about the difference between register to template and register multimodal. And yeah, as Sandrine said, um, register multimodal, take a message is that this is between two images that you know have been acquired, let's say within the same session, right? So typically you would first register to template. And then you would do a registration, uh, register multimodal between your different contrasts and then apply the, the warping field to bring it to the template or to bring the template to your, um, you know, fMRI, DTI or other, uh, other images. Okay, so this is done. So we can, uh, we can look at the QC reports, I'm going to do a refresh. And you see now there's a new line that says SCT warp template. That shows the uh, the warped white matter. Um, so this is the white matter atlas uh, on the um, in the in the space of the uh, of your T two, right? And what I'm what I'm using here is actually the the previous registration, which was not so great. But that's fine. I'm just going to continue the, the course with it. Um, we can also look at the results on FSLIs by doing a copy paste. And so what I see here is uh, my, so this is the space, my native space. So the, Space of the T2, on which there is the PAM50 and the white matter, sorry, the gray matter on the axial view and the white matter, right? So with that, you can assess the, the quality of registration uh, on your, um, on your, uh, on your, uh, on your viewer. Hey, um, so I mentioned that, uh, yeah, so that's something we've already discussed uh, briefly, but you see that you can bring the PAM50 objects on the native space, right? 
but you could also do the, the, the other way around. You can bring your native uh, T2 or any other metrics into the PAM50 space. So which one would you like, to, which one is preferable? That depends on the kind of analysis you want to do, okay? The subject centric is when you bring the, the PAM50 objects into the native space. In this case, uh, you you don't do any interpolation of your of your native metrics. You know, let's say you com you compute uh, you compute some uh, DTI uh, FA or MD, or you compute your like bold uh, bold maps. Um, you want to keep them uh, untouched in terms of you know resolution. You know, if you do some some like first level analysis and you compute the uh, the false dis discovery rates on your statistics. You want to keep your um, the resolution untouched. Uh, you might want to keep also the amount of noise untouched. So there's a lot of assumptions that are made when you run some uh, fMRI studies. Uh, if that's the case, then you know that that would be an incentive to bring the objects into the native uh, space of uh, fMRI or any other metrics, and then you don't have to worry about the, these interpolation effects. On the other hand, if you want to do you know second level type of analysis and you know do some like group mapping group levels uh, if you want to create maps uh, as i showed you before like of ms lesion uh, distributions across hundreds of patients then you need to to do it in a in a standard template space right so this is where you do a more template centric analysis that's if that makes sense for everyone Um, so there's a question from Anirban. How can we know whether the registration altered the T2 values too much or not? So by altered, you mean the, I guess the, t the signal, the magnitude signal of the image. Mm -hmm. um, the, the registration is, uh, is, is doing essentially a, like a, a deformation of, the, um, of each pixel into another space with interpolation, right? So if the input resolution is is you know reasonable uh reasonably good then you would expect to see you know the same the the, the same value uh into your pump 50 space because of interpolation that could change uh but you know there is no single answer to that it really depends on the uh on the on the input resolution on the input amount of noise uh, and, the, and the type of registration that is uh, that is being used, yeah. and also the question of you know too much or not that also depends on what 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 you're gonna do later on, like subsequently in your analysis. You know, if you're looking at effect sizes that are extremely small, then obviously you might want to uh, minimize the uh, you know the variance uh, in your uh, in your gener in your processed data. Yeah. Okay, so, so far what we've done is we took a, um, a T2 image and then we registered it to the PAM50 template. So we have a forward and a backward warping field. Usually uh, when you do an MR scans uh, sessions on individuals, you have more than one contrast. You know, and if you want to do QMRI with let's say magnetization transfer, diffusion, fMRI, you have another scan that is being acquired uh, alongside your anatomical image. You wanna register it to the PAM50 template as well. So that's what we're gonna do now, is register additional contrasts. Let's say you acquired you know, some DTI uh, and then you wanna register them to the PAM50 so that you can warp the PAM50 objects, such as the white matter tracts or the contour on your, uh, on your quantitative MRI metrics. So the first step would be to segment your additional metric. So for that, let's go to a metric. In our case, it would be a magnetization transfer data. So I'm, gonna, I'm going to change the, the folder. So cd dot dot slash mt. I am now in another folder of another image. It's the empty image. And with quick view, I can look at my image. You know, that's the MT0. So it's a, it's a GRE scan acquired axially, five millimeter thickness. 
uh, without an, an empty pulse, and this is with the empty pulse. Okay. And what we're going to do now is segment the spinal cord uh, on the empty uh, empty on image. Okay. So you see that was pretty quick. Let's look at the QC report. That's going to be the last line. This is my MT. You see there are much less slices than on the T2. And then we can assess that the segmentation is uh, is correct. There is like a small artifact here where the, this called segmentation is incomplete. But let's say we only care about these slices for now. Um, going to the next slide. Um, we want to create a mask that will be used to uh, make the registration between the MT on and the MT off more robust. So we can create that mask automatically from the generated segmentation. For that, I'm going to copy this, paste it. And so that's really an illustration of this new function called SET create mask. And if I click here, you see it created like a circular mask around the spinal cord. So if I toggle back and forth between my image and my mask, you see that it's really a mask that follows the the, the spinal cord center line uh, around around the cord. And you can you can specify a different size if you like, right? Or different shapes as well. So now we're gonna use not SCT register to template but SCT register multimodal. So you see, this is a long command. So I'm going to double click, copy and paste it. And then I'm going to explain to you what, what this is all about. So the, um, I'm going to go here, right? So the input parameter is, uh, is the T2 of the PAM50. So you see that my input image is the PAM50 T2. The iSeg is the input segmentation associated with the image. And that will be the PAM50 cord segmentation, right? Then we have the um, dash D, which is the destination image, right? The, the destination image is the MT on, okay? And the destination segmentation is the segmentation of the MT on that we just did uh, the previous slide. Dash M is the mask of the MT on that we just generated. And we, as I mentioned, we use that mask to make sure that the registration between the PAM50 template and the MT on is only done uh, on a region that is around the spinal cord because we don't care about the rest, about the muscles, the fat, we only care about the, the, the spinal cord. That's where we use this mask. Very importantly, how do we know uh, if we don't have any labels here, uh, as we did for the registration to template, how do we know where the, you know, which vertebral labels we are? We do it thanks to the flag init warp. That's an initial warping field that we add uh, on this registration uh, command. And the warping field that we're initiating the registration with is the one that we've estimated uh, at the previous step when we registered our T2 with the PAM50 template. And this is the warp template to ANAT. So you see the logic here is that we first registered the T2 and the PAM50. It generated the warping field to bring the PAM50 to the T2. And we're using that as the initial step to then register the PAM50 T2 to the MT on data, right? And then we have a couple of additional parameters that are specific to you know, this image, like step one would be, we wanna rely on the segmentation with the algo center mass. And then we're gonna also rely on the segmentation using the B-spline scene algorithm. This one is gonna be a slice-wise, three iterations, and that's it. 
So you see, we only rely on the segmentation for this one. And the output warping field would be template to empty and our QC report. So going down, let's look at the QC report. I'm going to do a refresh. And then I can toggle back and forth. And you see that what has been done now is uh, what, what I'm alternating with is the um, is the T2 of the PAM50. So it's not my na native T2, but it's really the PAM50, PAM50 T2 image that is registered on the uh, on the MT on data. Right? So at this point, I can also warp the PAM50 ob objects to the empty space. Um, some comments also. Some comment is that uh, you could do this registration without any anatomical image, right? So we did use the the T two as the intermediate step, but you could also use the MT uh, directly with the register to template. And in this case, the the, the disk label would be uh you know one that you would create before because on the empty scans with very thick slices you don't necessarily see the vertebral discs right but if you did the, the mri acquisition or if the mr tech acquired the images knowing that the fov is centered at let's say c3 c4 then you can automatically create a label uh in the spinal cord using the uh, input segmentation and say that the mid FOV is the disk uh, C3, C4. So it adds the value four, right? And then you can use that label as an input in SET register to template, right? So you would obtain very similar results than what the, the ones we got using the intermediate uh, step with the T2. The advantage of using the T2 anatomical image is that we don't make any assumption on that you know it's sometimes the fov might not be perfectly centered there might be some issues and so on so that's that's things to, to consider when you when you do your uh, processing pipelines uh maybe there, we can take one question from ricky walsh is the warp field specific to a certain spacing for example if i resample an image uh can i apply the same warping fields um so yeah there is indeed some like uh, discussions here so the the warping field is uh is defined in the absolute in the physical uh space coordinate not, not the uh the voxel space coordinate so the the vector field that uh, is encoded refers to the absolute uh, space coordinate so you could in principle, uh, use a warping field on another resolution, um, as as Joshua said. And then Lydia, uh, that's still unclear to me why we register the template to native space and not the opposite. Um, right. Um, so what you mean? What you mean, Lydia, is that uh, we bring the template objects into the native space, right? Like the, yeah. the white. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like why we, because it seems to me that usually for brain analysis, we, we do the opposite. Like we um, register the native images of each subject to the template. Um, but here we are doing the opposite. Yeah, absolutely. So, mm. That is exactly what is discussed in this slide uh, about the subject-centric analysis. So we have two options. What people usually do in the brain, but not always, uh, in the brain, we might want to do subject-centric analysis sometimes. But typically what, what you describe, Lydia, is this. Uh, we take uh, images in our native space, we bring it to the templates. Reasons why we would not want to do that 
is for example um when you um let's say you you compute some uh let's say that you you acquire you know diffusion weighted images uh in the spinal cord using very thick slices mm -hmm. um and and uh your your only your only goal you, the only purpose of that uh, study is to quantify let's say fractional anisotropy in the cortical spinal tract uh between c2 and c5 okay mm -hmm. um you could do that within the uh subject space because you have the segmentation you have the information of the tracts from the pam 50 mm -hmm. in your native space uh, and then you can extract uh, those metrics within the, uh, the cortical spinal tract mask uh, without doing any interpolation. Uh, and so you, you would keep your, your voxels and your metrics untouched, and you would just extract them using a weighted mask. Okay. Mm -hmm. If you bring your um, FA map into the template space, you would do an interpolation. Mm -hmm. And then you would extract your matrix. But that step of interpolation is not without consequences in terms of noise distributions, uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, averaging of uh, voxels surrounding the region of interest, mm -hmm. uh, partial volume effects, and things like that. So mm -hmm. if, you know, if the goal is, is just to extract metrics where, you know, in, in a mask where you're interested in, my usual recommendation is to is to you know stay close to your native resolution. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but if you want to do group mapping, group analysis, then you know you, it might be better to to use a, a standardized template as people usually do with a, with with brain. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, thanks, Lula. Um, Okay. Any any other question? So from Anirban, this may be discussed already, but can we apply the transformation matrix obtained after registration to other acquisitions? Example fMRI. Uh, Sandrine uh, answer about the uh yeah exactly that that would be the the exact same same concept so what we did with the mt scan uh, is that we can then um apply the transformation matrix uh right so we did it to the mt we can do it with the uh, fmri exactly uh hussein has a question about oh that's like a bug Right, so maybe someone from the SCT Dev Core can um, can reach out to Hussein to help. And then we have a question from Luca. He, so the idea would be to do first level fMRI in the subject space and then warp the yeah exactly that's exactly and then warp the um, the, uh, the the Z score map for example uh on the um on the on the template yeah that's that's one way to do it absolutely yeah yeah um good so once you have done your registration there is an output warping field that is that has been created as you see and then you can take that one and then run the warp template as we did previously right so you can run warp sct warp template the destination will be the empty on warping field is warp template to empty in this case you see that i used dash a1 and a stands for the uh, white matter atlas because i want to use it to extract empty metrics within specific white matter tracts right We'll wait for this to uh, to finish, and then I can 
answer some other questions. Will the multimodal registration correct MT on and MT off images that were acquired at slightly different dimensions to help compute MTR? Or are there other ways to fix this problem? All right, so this is a very important question. So first of all, MT on and MT off should not be acquired at different dimensions. If they were, it means that they cannot be used uh, or they cannot easily be used to compute MTR. The reason being that MTR uh, relies on the particular uh, equation that assumes that the only parameter that changed between the MT on and MT off is the presence of the empty poles. That enables to compute the quantitative or like semi-quantitative MT ratio uh, that only assumes a change in uh, you know magnitude signal based on the presence or the absence of these empty poles. If other parameters have changed, that will affect uh, you know, the noise distribution, the, the magnitude signal, the you know the the the, the, the case space FFT scaling uh, factors, and oh, and maybe the the shimming uh, parameters, any any other parameters that will affect the signal intensity, and that are not accounted for in the MT ratio equation. So by you know my short answer would be MT on and MT off acquired with other parameters than the empty poles um, changed uh, should, should not be used for MTR uh, calculation. Um, and the question from Antoine Cosa, in terms of pre-processing for T1 weighted images, would you recommend to apply gradient non-linearity correction and or N4 bias field correction? So the so these are so these are two different things just to put uh, things into context so the gradient nonlinearity correction uh, refers to the fact that uh, usually in the scanner we have you know like maximum you know size of gradient linearity when we go towards the edge uh, you'll see that uh, the images can be slightly distorted um, that distortion can or cannot be corrected automatically by the scanner software. Uh, there is usually a, a flag that happens that says, you know, gradient correction. It could be 2D, it could be 3D. Uh, and my my take on that is that it's usually a good idea to, to correct uh, for this in 3D, okay? Uh, maybe you have acquired images from collaborators where the images are not corrected for gradient nonlinearities, and then you're stuck with them. Uh, you know, depending on how severe the distortions are, um, then you, you know, you might be able to use those images or not. Um, and then as long as you segment the spinal cord in a region that is affected by those gradient nonlinearity distortions, uh, then registering to the template might actually, you know, help address that uh, that you know those those um, those distortions the same way uh, registering to the template helps with the susceptibility related distortions for example the second thing is the n4 bias field uh, so that refers to the fact that when we uh, acquire images the, the the excitation profile uh, is not perfectly homogeneous the the receive coils uh, also uh, don't have you know a, a homogeneous profile and that results in a magnitude uh, image that where the um, where the signal uh, profile varies uh, across you know across the image and there is there are some algorithms such as the n4 which is a very popular algorithm to um, correct for this intensity bias and question is you know would it help to um, apply this before processing the t1 weighted image in general so it depends the the algorithm used for the segmentation you know if you use 2d kernels for example um, that would be you know each size would be processed independently and there will be an, a normalization like a batch norm uh, like a normalization of the of the batch of the 2d batch that would be uh, performed uh, and so N4 would not necessarily change you know, anything on that. Um, it might help, you know, in for the in-plane intensity uh, variations, but in general at 3T, they're not that drastic. So 
it could help or it could not necessarily help uh, or it could make things worse. I don't think so. But uh, you know, my general take on this is that uh, I have not seen a you know huge uh, impact of the N four correction. The gradient nonlinearity correction though is is important. Yeah. Um, question from Munir. Hello Munir. Uh, can you explain how the registration is managed when having a gap between slices? Yes. Okay, so uh, in some cases, um, oh, plus, plus no 3DT1, right? So let's say you only have, um, you only have, um, let's say your, you know, DTI scans that have been acquired, you know, with like, let's say two centimeters gap, right? Let's say you, you place each slice at the, in the middle of the, of the vertebral body. So you have, very large gaps between your slices. In this case, I strongly re advise against the uh, the ref template flag with registering to template. You don't want to do any uh, straightening, right? What you want to do is a uh, is a subject reference registration. So that that would be my like main main recommendation in this case. Right, so this is finished. So we can look at the uh, QC report. The last line would be the white matter registered to the uh, to the MT scan, right? So at this point, At this point, what you want to do is quantitative analysis. You want to compute MTR within the white matter, let's say. So first, you need to compute MTR. And before doing that, you need to register your MT off and MT on because the subject might have slightly moved between those scans, right? So in this case, you would use SCT register multimodal. I'm going to launch the command and then explain what it does. So it will register minus i, which is the input, the source image, MT0, that we're going to register on the destination image, the MT1, okay? Uh, you see that there is also a flag called DSEG, which is the destination segmentation, and it's only used for generating the QC. We have a mask. To remember the mass that we've used because we want to we want the registration to focus only on the part of the spinal cord and some parameters like this slice reg algo it's the first time we're using it because we assume that between the empty on and empty off patient is you know in the similar position maybe the patient you know tilted the head like this like that that would create some um, some smooth um uh, shifts along the super, uh, along the AP and right left directions um, that would be you know that, that would progressively change uh, along the super inferior direction, and that's a good case for using the slice reg algorithm because it's more regularized than registering each slice independently, right? And you use the cross correlation because they are not the same contrast. Mutual information would work, but in general, I, I prefer CC. Um, that's it. Let's look at the QC report, doing a refresh. And then you see that I'm toggling between the MT on and the MT off. And what you want to do really is, you know, look at the border of the cord where my cursor is and making sure that, you know, they, it perfectly matches, right? Same here. And once you do this, after you have this core registration, then we can we can compute the um, the MTR um, magnetization transfer ratio using that command. SCT compute MTR. The input will be the registered MT off and uh, the MT on. You see that's pretty quick. And 
then uh, yeah. So that that question came up: how to register the lumbar region to the Palm Fifty template? So that's a new section from uh, from the course. Um, so that's something we're not going to try now for the, the interest of time. You can try at home, but the idea is we, we've provided Lombard data uh, with the course. So you can go to the uh, Lombard folder, T2 underscore Lombard, run the segmentation, okay, using that particular Lombard uh, chord model. Once you have the segmentation, then you can use labels. Uh, and then you have different options for that. One option is to use a single label at 17, which corresponds to the T9, T10 disc. And if you do that, the that disc would be perfectly aligned with the PAM50 template. Then, but the problem is that further down, the conus medialis might not be perfectly well registered because Depending on the you know age of the subjects or the age of the subject, the conus medialis will not be exactly um, uh, located where uh, where it is on the on the PAM50. Um, and if you want to account for that, then you can use, let's say, only a single label at the conus medialis. And in this case, your PAM50 registration will be perfectly aligned with the conus medialis but uh, some of the other disks might not. So you might want to combine one uh, disk label, for example, the uh, T9, T10, and the Conus Medialis label. So you end up with two labels that you use exactly the same way we did previously with uh, you know, vertebral labels or disk-only labels. So the principle is exactly the same here. Um, and so these are some uh, commands to create uh, labels uh, programmatically, but those could also be created uh, automatically, but it's just to, to, to show the possibility to create them uh, programmatically. So that command will create the disk and the conus medialis label with the value 17 and value 60. And then you're using them uh, down the line to register to, to the templates. Any question? Maybe there is one from um, Angel Torado Carvajal. I'm working with PET MR data. So if I understood right, the ROI analysis is suggest to move all the ROIs to native space and extract the metrics there. Should I then keep the PET resolution even if the segmented ROIs would be resliced and thus less detailed and include potentially some partial volume effect after resliced? So there are different options in this situation. Um, the PET is obviously much lower resolution than the, than the MR that you use for the registration. Um, so you're doing some resampling anyway, right? Um, I, I would look at. I would need to look at the exact details of your, you know, acquisition parameters and the way you're using the data. But I would, I would think that both could be done in terms of working in the Pan Fifty space or the uh, the native space, the the MR native space. Uh, one possibility also is to, in fact, bring the uh, PAM50 objects into the PET space, right? Um, so again, different things to consider. Uh, you, you seem to be aware of uh, the partial volume effect, so that's that's good, but it's definitely one thing to, to you know, um, to be aware of. Uh, and Later on in the course, where I'm going to talk about ways to mitigate partial volume effect, or like to account for it in the extraction of metrics. Thank you, Charles, for the uh, for the feedback on the new lumbar uh, 
on the new lumbar feature. That's something that many users have asked in the past. So we are quite happy that it, it is now a part of SAT. Um, good. So let's move on to the next phase of the analysis, the gray matter segmentation. Uh, in the past, we've had different algorithms to, to segment the gray matter. Um, and we ended up keeping only one, which works quite well. It's called SCT DeepSeg GM, and it's uh, and it relies on the uh, on the on deep learning um, uh, dilated convolutions approach that Christian Perron uh, developed. So, for this, we're going to use an image that has a high in-plane resolution and a good gray-white matter contrast, and that would be a T2-weighted scan. It's a GRE. Uh, GRE scan, T2S, and then I'm going to run SCT DeepSeg GM. My input image would be T2 star, and I want my QC report at the same location, QC single search. That's it. Okay, so now we can look at the QC report. Refresh. And toggling on and off, you can see that the um, in red is the uh, segmented gray matter. So I'm quite happy with this. There's, as you can see, a lot of artifacts in the, in the codal uh, slices that you know, even with naked eyes, we don't know where the gray matter is. So the, the algorithm will not segment those. Next step is to segment the spinal cord. And you know why we're doing that? So that we end up with a segmentation of the spinal cord, of the gray matter. And then by subtracting those two, we end up with a mask of the white matter, right? And once we have our masks of gray and white matter, we can then segment. We can then uh, compute cross-sectional area uh, for each different slices. So I'm going to run those two commands. And then I have two output files here, which is the CSA gray matter CSV. So it shows the mean cross-sectional area for each slice. So it's, it's actually the, the, um, the cross-section of the gray matter for each individual slice. So you see that the first slice is where there is no segmentation. We don't have any value or like any meaningful values. But then for each slice, we, we have uh, the uh, area of the gray matter. And the other file is the CSA white matter CSV. And that's the um, cross-sectional area of the white matter, again, for each slice. Then you can use that, for example, to compute the ratio of uh, the gray over the white matter, if that's something you, you would be interested in uh, in particular applications. One thing you could also do is extract the signal intensity in the gray matter. And that's something that uh, you know has been discussed by Alan Martin et al. Uh, in the context of uh, degenerative cervical myelopathy, where he found that the T2 weighted uh, T2 star weighted signal was uh, um, was relevant um, um, as a you know a relevant biomarker to look at a prognosis in the DCM population. Uh, so not going to do that here, but uh, you can try it uh, at home. And that, that, that would provide you with the uh, you know, mean values uh, at, across different slices uh, of, the, of the T2 star uh, signal. So if we can identify where the gray matter is, uh, why don't we use that information to uh, increase the precision of the registration to the template? Because you remember so far, 
when we did register to the PAM50 template, we only used the boundary of the spinal cord. Um, but now we also have access to the boundary of the cord, but also the gray matter. And so we could bypass, we could uh, add an extra step where we do the gray matter segmentation and we add this information to increase the precision of the warping field. That's something we're going to do here. We run the SET register multimodal. I'm going to explain to you what this long and complicated um, syntax is about. So the um, input would be the, the T2 star version of the PAM50, right? So we, we do exactly the same as we did for the MT uh, registration. The ISEG is the uh, is the um, not the cord of the PAM50, but the white matter, right? So that's the that's the main difference. The input segmentation now is going to be the white matter mask of the PAM50. The destination image is the T2 star, and the destination segmentation is not the segmentation of the cord, but the segmentation of the white matter, right? So the goal here is to not match the spinal cords, the spinal cord masks, but the white matter masks, because it does have the extra information of the gray matter inside it, right? Like we did before with the MT, we use an init warping field that was computed with the T2 structural images. Uh, we also input the inverse warping field. And these are these are the names of our uh, output warping field. So I'm going to call it warp template to T2 S, and then the output uh, inverse warping field will be called T2 S two template. And these are some extra parameters that are you know specific to my images. You could try with the default parameters. It's gonna you know give something quite similar. And once this is done, uh, then you, we can warp the template. I'm going to do that now. And in the meantime, I'm going to look at the QC report. So I do a refresh. And this is the result of the register multimodal, which is moving the PAM50 to my native space, accounting for the white matter boundaries. I'm going to do that. So you see that the result is actually not good at all, which is interesting. And I think the result, the reason it's not good at all is, right, so we don't have any spinal cord here. We don't have any segmentation, so we should not, yeah. Hmm. I think the reason it's, the, re the reason it's bad is because uh, I did try something that I should not have tried at this step, I tried to tweak my um, registration my, my registration parameters for the T2, right? And you see that it's screwed up a lot of things there, right? Compared to the one that was given by in the in the course. So that's you know that's a live live demonstrations of how things could go bad if you tweak the parameters in a bad way, right? You end up with registrations that are not satisfactory. And the reason it's, it looks pretty bad is because the T2 star scans are acquired, you know, around C, C4, C5. So that actually corresponds to where things, you know, got bad here in my registration. But on your end, if you did not do what I did here, you should end up with a relatively good uh, registration. Any question? So after you do this, uh, you know, more like precise registration using the, the gray matter information, you can then register another metric too, right? You have an initial warping field that is now the one from T2 star, 
and not the one from T2 anymore. And you can use that as an initial warping field to register your your empty uh, empty scan, for example, right? So the the principle is exactly the same. I would go back to my empty scan, and then I would run this command. And then we could compare the two different results, the ones with and the ones without the, you know, accounting for the gray matter. Again, on my end, it's probably gonna look ugly because I I screwed up some acquisition, some uh, registration parameters in the beginning, but on your end, it will probably look better. So refresh, this is my new, PAM 50 to T2, okay, that's so bad. And the previous one was, I think here, yeah, you see? So that's without accounting for the gray matter. And this is accounting for the gray matter. Without, with, without, with. So slight differences, and you, you will appreciate those differences even more if you run the, uh, the warping of the, of the PAM50 objects. Any questions? So yes, Munir, are you smoothing white matter segmentation before registration? Um, I am not, but the registration parameters could include some smoothing parameters. In this case, um, we don't here, we don't there, and we don't there, right? So we don't do any smoothing during the registration. It's something that is possible to do. Some cases it provides better results, in some cases not. Uh, follow up from Munir, because you need to create a contrast um not sure I understand that. Maybe you, you want to elaborate. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to address Lydia's question. Can we segment gray matter using either the PAM50 template or the T2 star image? Yes, 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 yes. Right, exactly. OK, that's an excellent question. So. It's true that, so there is a very important thing to consider here. Um, when we register, what we did previously was we registered a, an image with the PAM50 using the spinal cord boundary, and then we would bring the gray matter of the PAM50 on the native space, right? So it's not really a segmentation of the gray matter per se, um, but it was more, uh, you know, warping an average gray matter you know average across 50 adults and bringing it uh, on the native space it scaled with the spinal cord uh, boundary of that particular subject that is different than uh, segmenting the actual gray matter of that particular subject because what could happen for example is that uh, you know we're dealing with uh, subjects where there is an, a heavy atrophy of the gray matter. If we do the, the former, which is, you know, if we bring the PAM50 gray matter based on the spinal cord boundary and we bring it onto that subject, then the gray matter area will be overestimated you know, because that particular subject has a smaller gray matter than the average uh, uh, gray matter. In those particular cases, it might be more, uh, you know, more important to find a way to segment the gray matter if it's possible, you know, if it's if the image if the images uh, allow it. Yeah. Okay, uh, and thanks, Julien. If if you if we don't have any uh, T2 star images available, I guess that the only way to get gray matter segmentation is to use this uh, template method. Method. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. not as and, good, but and, and be aware of the limitations. Yeah, if you yeah. don't have the images. There is no way you can you can get that yeah. information. Yeah. Okay. And other question: uh, What are the characteristics of the subjects that you used to build the template? 
Yeah. Young subjects. Are... Usually young, um, usually healthy. Um, so that's something to to take in consideration. Yeah. The the demographics uh, I think is indicated in the in mm -hmm. the publication, but relatively young, you know, twenty to thirty, yeah, in for 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 most of mm -hmm. them. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Julian. Of course. Uh, Julian, uh, may I ask you one question? Of course. Uh, so um, in this case, basically, the um, template 2T2 registration looks good, right? But if I use it as an initial t uh, warp for the T2 star, it basically gives me not a good result, right? And did I get it correctly? Uh, so I actually made some, like, I did not follow the course as I was supposed to. <laughs> no, no, no. But my question is, could this happen normally? Ah, uh, yeah, I see what you mean. Uh, yes, it could happen. Absolutely. And in fact, you know, the, the thing is. Yeah, because I had something similar. So I wanted to understand if I yeah, couldn't understand yeah. why my, yeah, you know, I yeah. tried to, I mean, the T2 looks great, uh, yeah, the registration, yeah. but then when yeah. I applied this initial work to the T2 star, I, it basically yeah. was not good. So yeah. I thought yeah. that my, my problem was in the second registration, but yeah. it might be the first one. Uh, so you know what, if your yeah. first registration looks good, then I would I would think that the problem comes from the second registration. Okay. Right? In in my case, the you know there is clearly a problem. You know, if you look at my cursor here, okay. Whoops. There is, ah, okay, there is yeah. the, you know there is an obvious problem. Right? Mm -hmm. And that okay. that's where my T two star field of view is. Right? Okay. So I, I'm not surprised that you know the registration is, is bad. So you know if you find something like this, then it's like a red flag, and you need to mm -hmm. you know, update the parameters. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you very much. Hi, Julia. Uh, the, Hello. I was just in the, yeah. Uh, I don't understand how it's possible to do registration with the binary mask. Do you use the ages to register? What's the the information? Because usually it's the optimization is done on the intensity, and here you have just one on zero. So this this is what ah. my question was about. Uh, I see. I see. Uh, so the registration in this case is described here. So we have in the param um, information. So the first step is using the segmentation only, right? So it's uh, it would be it would be binary. Mm -hmm. uh, and the second step is also the segmentation. Uh, so it's also using the the white matter. So those you know, type seg, type seg uses the uh, the white matter mask, okay? Mm -hmm. And here we use the metric CC. So it's interesting, you know, I think maybe... So I... what do you do? Maybe when you do rigid registration, then you create like a, a intensity with interpolation and then you can do the... the so you're, you're concerned about, you're concerned about this step, the step number two or... No, I'm just trying to understand uh, how how it's managed with the binary mask. Surprising. So the binary mask is um, can can be registered together. So you, we you, we can register a binary mask uh, between the um, okay between the, uh, the 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 native space and the pan fifty uh, using the rigid algo. So that would be like only uh, like some some translations and rotations. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And this one would be like non-linear, but it's totally fine to use a, a binary mask. It's not perfectly binary because uh, at, between this step and this step, we would have some interpolation and then some, yes. you know, as we can see on this mask here, it's soft. So it would be a soft mask mm -hmm. uh, that is in fact better, that provides better precision for the registration. I think this okay. is why I, I, I specified CC, but I think I could have done a, I could have used uh, mean uh, mean squares as well, and uh, yeah, and the third step is the image. Yeah, so we used uh, CC as well. Yeah. Okay, okay. But uh, I encourage all of you to to 
you know tweak those parameters to get a, make a better sense of their their implications their their impact here i think we could have used uh, mean squares that would have you know given slightly different results um yeah okay thank you um, sure okay so we touched base on that so it is 1 50 p.m so what I, what we're gonna do is um we're gonna i don't think we're gonna finish that section but uh, i want to you know introduce this atlas based analysis approach um we're at this step so you see the the final step of the uh, after registering your uh, your template to your um, metrics um as we discussed with uh, with lydia you could do this extraction in the native space. We can also do it in the PAM50 space. Uh, there will be you know, the same approach, but not the same implications and assumptions. So a bit of theory. Um, this is the white matter atlas. That atlas uh, is based on the uh, Gray's Anatomy uh, textbook, uh, which is based on you know, the hand drawing of the different tracks of the uh, of the white matter uh, and the gray matter. So there is already an, an approximation there, right? It's an average across uh, multiple individuals, edge groups, and things like that. When you do an MRI scan, uh, you don't have, you know, you know, uh, an infinitesimal resolution. You have coarse voxels. Um, you know, if you do diffusion, you might have, you know, one by one millimeter in plane and five millimeter, five millimeter thickness. That would re be represented approximately as like, you know, a grid discourse. So you see how scary that is, right? If you are interested in like quantifying in like a very, very small track, that would be, the, that track would be smaller than your actual uh, resolution, okay? Uh, let's assume that the the value in the white matter is 50 and the value in the CSF is zero. Your voxel value will be 25. That's exactly the what partial volume is. Right? Now the problem is that if you want to quantify, if you want to extract metrics, you know, FA or any other relevant biomarkers in your in each of your pixel, you're you're facing this partial volume issue. So there are different scenarios here. The first scenario is uh, when you use traditional ROIs, which are binary, you know, like pixel of one is within your region of interest, pixel of zero is outside. Uh, that approach does not account for partial volume effects. Another approach is to use a weighted mask, a weighted average, right? So with the PAM50, we have probabilistic uh, masks that you can warp into your native space. And then uh, you could weigh the uh, you could weigh the um, the you know average value of your partial of your um, of your signal of interest with the partial volume information that is given by the mask by the soft mask. That approach does not solve PVE partial volume effect, but it, it mitigates it. Another approach is create is. Uh, treating this problem as like a you know gaussian mixture model so that's very known in the computer vision community it's been used known and used for decades and the idea here is that we would make assumptions that uh, the data from all voxels uh, of the of the of a given tract uh, would have a value would have the same value so it assumes homogeneity within each tract and then what we are trying to do is estimate the the true value within each tract given a, a course given a discrete grid of acquisition of acquisition that's called the maximum likelihood estimation uh, the problem of that is that it's not robust to noise present within very small tracts to mitigate that problem we can use another approach called maximum a posteriori estimation which adds some regularization parameters uh, and some priors in regions where the signal is more robust. For example, the cerebrospinal fluid, the entire white matter, and the entire gray matter. 
And so these are used as like priors to estimate the value within each you know individual trials. Uh, this is a very you know quick introduction to a complex problem. I invite you to read the uh, you know this neuroimage um, publication that describes in more details what these uh, approximations are. Uh, and this is an example of a, a graph that is coming from the Levy et al. and the Delaner et al. Uh, papers, where we did some simulations by adding some noise in uh, maps where we knew the ground truth. So we basically did like a reverse engineering problem, right? So we started from the from the location of tracks. We downsampled it to different resolutions. We added noise, and then we compared how well each extraction uh, method worked and especially in the in the small tracts. Uh, so these are this would be the small tracts, right? Where the error in estimation is you know lower using the, the maximum a posteriori method. But you know the error is much bigger when we use the uh, maximum likelihood or the weighted average approach. But when we go to like bigger tracts like the corticospinal tract or the, the fasciculus coniatus in the in the dorsal uh, white matter uh, you see that whether you use ML or MAP, you're doing you know relatively small error, whereas the weighted average is less reliable, right? Um, so again, I invite you to to look at this article to get more insights. But the bottom line is that if you're using ML or MAP, you're you 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 should be fine um, with with some uh, limits of noise and resolution, of course. Okay, let's do uh, some hands-on, um, and then we can. Uh, well, let's finish this section, and then we can uh, we can finish the we can adjourn the the course for today. Um, the the function SCT warp template. Uh, brings the you know the template objects on a new directory called label right so if you look at label you have the pump 50 template in the space of your in this case of my mt on data you also have the white matter atlas which is the one that i just showed you before right that's that's the atlas it also has a file called info label and that file describes the you know the the file uh, corresponding to each uh, tract white matter but also gray matter and also CSF and a combination of tracts for example you know the, the whole spinal cord equals the tract 0 to 35 the white matter is corresponds to the tract 0 to 29 gray matter, dorsal colon, and so on, right? So you can edit those if you if you like. Um, you, you can create new new clusters and combinations. Um, and so that's explained in this slide. You know, if you want to create, for example, the right part of the spinal cord and the left part of the spinal cord, that's something you, you can do, and that's something that users in the past have done. Right? Uh, yeah, so that's an example of what John Brooks uh, in, in the UK uh, has done. You know, he, he added some custom labels to look at the left and the right uh, any cord for his fMRI applications. Okay, so now let's um, ext extract the MTR that we've calculated before using the Atlas and using the maximum a posteriori approach in L51. What does L51 correspond to? Let's have a look. 51 corresponds to the white matter. Okay, so we're gonna extract MTR in the white matter and output this into this CSV file. So I'm going to copy, paste. That's it. And then we can look at the output uh, CSV and you see that we have the the MTR for each different slice right okay 
You can also do this uh, in other tracks. So let, let's run this. And we can also specify that we want to average those values between slice five and slice 15. So I'm calling the file MTR in CST. That's the MTR in the cortical spinal tract. So when I open the file, the slices that we averaged the MTR on is uh, between five and 15. You have the label, so you know where, you know what, what uh, each line corresponds to. And this is the average MTR. So you see, this is much more robust now, uh, less prone to noise. And what's interesting to note is that between the left and the right, we have a very similar MTR value, which is which is expected. Uh, no, sorry, the I was actually looking at the wrong column. That's the size that corresponds to the size of the cortical spinal tract. The actual value, the actual MTR, is the MAP here, the maximum a posteriori value, and they are also very close, fifty-two point six and fifty-three point three. Uh, you, similarly to the uh, process segmentation, you can also say, you know, you want to average uh, between vertebral levels two and four, uh, and you can do that because you have the vertebral level information from the PAM50 that is now in your empty space, right? So you can use that command. And what we are computing now is the MTR in the dorsal column that corresponds to the label 53. Here in vertebral levels 2 to 4, which happens to correspond to slices 8 to 17. But you don't need to know that. You just need to specify the vertebral levels. Label is the dorsal column. That's the size of your mask. You see, it's much bigger than the mask we used before. The, the dorsal column corresponds to 224 voxels, whereas the cortical spinal tract before was about 50 voxels. So it's more robust. That's the take-home message here. The more voxels you have, the more reliable your estimate is. And that's the MTR in the, white, in the dorsal column. By the way, you don't have to open the info label to look at the uh, different tracts. You can also you can also list it, list label, yeah. If you, if you run this command, SCT extract matrix list labels, then you can you see all the labels that are available. And that's it for today. I think before we adjourn, uh, maybe we can take a few questions. Maybe I have a general one, uh, mm -hmm. Julian. So, um, Coming always from brain studies, uh, so I noticed that uh, I understand why the PAM template is uh, 0 0.5 isotropic voxel, but uh, many studies like, you know, like fMRI or TVI uh, studies will have like uh, thick Z splices, as you said. So if I want to do, let's say for fMRI or for other studies, a uh, group analysis in the PAM template, then I have to interpolate a, a lot in the sense that uh, uh, each slice will be like 10 voxel. Is there, uh, uh, let's say, a less precise template at least in the Z or does it make, I mean, people do it if mm -hmm. they cannot do a subject specific analysis as for fMRI, let's say. Mm -hmm. Because normally when I do brain studies, I will basically have let's say three by three millimeters and maybe I will possibly keep the same resolution for the template or go to two by two by two. Whereas in this case it's really like uh, a lot. For, so it's new for me. So it was just uh, for me to understand if it is like common practice or not. Yeah, that's a great question. So I have two things to say about that and maybe others 
have, have also some, some, some thoughts on that. So the first thing is, um, yes, it is possible to use a, um, a different you know, resolution of the, of the template of the PAM50. Uh, in fact, uh, I know that some some groups, you know, crop the the Palm 50 template. Uh, they might want to, you know, downsample it, um, and then you know you could use the, you know, the same approach except that you would point to a different template. Uh, and you know what would be the advantage? Well, mostly computational time, right? Uh, you don't lose information by upsampling. You do lose information by downsampling. And the second point I want to make is, even if the if the resolution in the native space is coarse compared to the uh, to the you know destination template, I, I think it's still relevant to to use a high resolution template if you do group analysis. Because and that's that comes down to you know the um uh, partial volume uh, averaging across population you know if you, if you take only one subject and you and you upsample it uh in like to you know to a high res space it's true that you could have done that with a, you know within a template that would be let's say one by one by five but if you take 200 subjects and each of them would be would have a discrete grid that is, you know, slightly different than uh, you know the other subjects. Then, by bringing everyone to to a higher res, you're actually benefiting from the finer resolution of the of the destination space, and you're, you know, you're actually gaining information uh, compared to you know if you were if you were to use like a one by one by five time fifty template. You see, you see, you see what I mean? But in any case, you should. Probably also in these cases, move a bit the data, right? Because the registration won't be like in the brain because the each participant registration won't be perfect, right? Sure, they won't be perfect. And uh, there'll be some... Also anatomical differences between the people, right? So in any, uh, like for the brain, I guess. I mean, yeah. so I probably it will move yeah. much less than in the brain, clearly, but uh, yeah. uh, probably also for statistical uh, point of view, uh, you know, if you use like classical SPM approach, you benefit from smoothing for, uh, you know, for the distribution of a of a Z or the beta that you uh, estimate for GLM. So also, I'm, as for me, everything is new and I'm reading and I see that there's not really like, uh, there is much less consensus that uh, in the brain. So it's more like to, you know, uh, gain some, some insight, I guess. At the, at the moment, there is not the right way, but it's more like... Uh, I mean, some kind of gut feeling, I would say, or, you know, a theoretically good approach to, to follow, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, that's a good point. And that, that's why it's good to have those discussions and workshops like the one we had last, last, year, yeah, uh, last week. I'm uh, very happy that you do this kind of workshop. Thank you very much for uh, all the people that are new to the field. Uh, Again, please feel free to switch on your camera. It's always nice to see people's face when uh, when teaching. Um, can I ask a question? Of course. Okay. You know? um, so uh, this is Fauzia. I forgot to ask yesterday during the MT analysis, mm -hmm. is there a way to identify a region of compression using the MT? So, uh, so that's a relatively complex question with different uh, levels of granularity. Um, when when we when we mean you know detect level, like detect compression, it, it could mean different things. Um, uh, if you meant you know detecting some changes in the uh, microstructure of the spinal cord as a result of you know secondary um, toxicity effect uh, because of the compression uh, then that's one of the underlying hypotheses of using those microstructure um, biomarkers um, some publications did show um, you know changes significant changes in in the MTR for example um, distal from the uh, site of compression um, so that's you know that's some evidence uh, now if your question refers to like what, what's 
was that addressing your question or was your question no so when you so when you said distal to the site of compression how is that site of compression defined on an mt because from our study it's easy to see on a t2 a weighted image you see the level you see regions of compression right there are places where you have like maximum region of compression but with the mt the way the image looks it's hard to know exactly where that is so what we have done as a team is to use to identify the level of compression on a t2 and use that level to do the MTR calculation of the region of compression. I don't know if I'm making sense. So the so what I understand is so okay. So what I understand is that you took the uh, the T two. Yes. Uh, you identified the level of compression and then you selected the slice on the. So what what was the the step afterwards? Okay. So. Um, an example, this is just an example. We have a patient with compression at the level of, so based on the cross-sectional area, it shows that there is a, the level of compression is between C4, C5. <clears throat> what mm -hmm. I did was to superimpose the MT image on the T2 to identify that level on the MT to see that could be the region of compression on the MT. Because the idea is, that we want to do is to calculate the MTR of different tracks at that region of compression. But okay. I don't know if that's an accurate way of marking out the region of compression on an MT image. Mm -hmm. Right. So that, that would that be my, my uh, you know, my approach for for different reasons. The first reason is that superimposing, uh, you know, uh, is is limited in terms of a patient uh, who might have moved between the mm -hmm. within the, the session. So that's one. Yeah. Uh, two is that um, the the MT. Uh, I mean, I, you know, I I'm I'm missing a lot of details in your in your setup. You know, like such as resolution and so on. But assuming that the uh, the MT is like you know axial orientation, thick slices. And the T two is isotropic resolution, you know, point eight or like one millimeter isotropic. You you're dealing with different resolutions, and the um, the the identification of uh, of of the level, um, you know, based on you know visual assessment uh, is limited. And in that case, you might want to uh, you might want to uh, use um, labels that were created on the T two uh, T two okay. registered to the MT, and then label. Uh, and then label warped in, onto the empty space using linear interpolation to uh, to address to uh, to account for the partial volume that we discussed yesterday, right? Okay. Uh, that's that's the second thing. The third thing is that uh, I, I also don't know the amount of compression we're talking about. You know, and I also don't know the the image quality we're talking about. Um, but you know, in general, what I've seen is that uh, if there is compression. There's also a strong motion of the spinal cord. There is a lot of ghosting, and it makes the uh, quantification of those uh, marker unreliable at the level of compression. And this is one of the reasons uh, people, you know, like to compute those microstructure metrics above and below the lesion. That is assuming that there is uh, some, you know, Valerian degeneration, for example. Um, in, uh, that that happens at the at, at the site of compression, and that that uh, that then um, propagates distal to the to the site of the lesion, and that would be more reliably assessed uh, because of uh, you know the, uh, the 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 better placement of those um, atlas based ROIs. Uh, but you know, I I could talk about, about about those those different uh, considerations. But the 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 key message is that. It's uh, yeah. The, the key message is that we might want to revisit the the approach you're you're taking, and I'd be happy to you know dedicate some 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 time to. Yes, sure. And do you mind if I share my data with you? Uh, sure. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So um maybe after the training I will email you with some of the data and then you can see how I can accurately measure those do those measurements. Excellent.
I Good. think. Okay, so let's uh, let's move on. So maybe we can uh, uh, we can go back to the. So I'm going to share my slide, or maybe let's let's take a few additional questions, maybe for uh, people who you know would like to um, uh, to ask questions from the material that we we saw yesterday. If not, then I'm just going to share my screen and then we can. Um... I have uh, one question about yes, the uh, um, so it's around center line detection. So uh, I had some cases where, you know, if I used SCT get center line with the default settings, I was seeing some failures. Whereas if I used say deep seg first and then used get center line with the fits fit seg method, right? that I saw fewer failure cases actually, like maybe 40% fewer. Is is that something that you've uh, you've encountered as well before that using DeepSeg can be maybe more robust than the default settings in get center line or should they actually be pretty similar? Right. Uh they, they should not be similar. Um the 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 SET gets center line. So as you said, there are different algorithms, but the bottom line is that um the you know it it is a relatively unprecise um way to get the center line. Um because it will first of all it, it would be a, a discrete location and also it would be based on uh you know some 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 um like half transforms uh that is affected by many other parameters and so that's a very crude approximation that is a, a sufficient approximation to then you know build some segmentation uh, down the line but if you want to have a very precise estimate of the center line i i recommend using you know taking it from the segmentation so first step you get the segmentation with deep seg as you did and then you extract the uh, the center line as the center of mass of that segmentation, and that's a that's a much much more precise way to to get the center line. Okay, great, thanks. Hey, other questions? Okay, so I'm going to share my screen, and then we will continue the course. Um, so we stopped at the uh, atlas based analysis, and we are now moving to the uh, diffusion weighted MRI section. So I'm going to make my terminal a bit bigger. Let me know if that's still too small. Okay, that should be good. All right. So, um, so it's directly uh, hands-on. I, I assume you are all familiar with diffusion MRI already. Uh, the what we're going to do is go to the to the folder uh, diffusion MRI. So, uh, for those who are only joining uh, today and were not able to to join yesterday, um, I invite you to contact uh, to get in touch with, uh, for example, Joshua Newton, who is uh, on this call, who will guide you through, uh, you know, how to get started so that you can follow the course um, at the same time as, uh, you know, what, what I'm doing. Um, so, CD, da, da, uh, sorry, single subject, and then the MRI. Data, the MRI, okay. So if I do an LS, I see that these are the files that are in my folder. So there is the four dimensional um, time series and that is already in nifty format. And then there's the so-called BVEC, the altitude of the, uh, of the gradients of the diffusion encoding gradients and their orientation. And these are the, the files we need to uh, compute the diffusion tensor. So the first thing we're going to do is separate the so-called B0 file, which are the uh, the uh, EPIs that are not encoded for uh, with with the diffusion gradients, and the diffusion time series. So I run this uh, this command, 
And the reason we do that is because um, we want to average only the diffusion weighted images because they have a very different contrast and then compute the segmentation of the spinal cord on the diffusion weighted images only. They are much, much more robust to estimate the segmentation from. Um, and then we're going to add the uh, B0 file. So you see it created all those files here. We can have a look at them. So these are my, you know, diffusion time series. So that's the, you know, first uh, first image. You see, it's a B zero because we we can see the CSF, and this is the only the diffusion weighted time series. So it's only the first volume. You see, there are like thirty volumes in there, and if I look at the average of my diffusion weighted images, that's how it looks like. So you see, it's a very clean. Uh, spinal cord that uh, from which you can get a very reliable segmentation. And similarly, this is the first B0, and that's the average B0 file, right? Mm -hmm. So for now, what we're going to do is run the segmentation. So triple click, and the input will be the, the average diffusion weighted images, dash C. W, DWI, meaning that the contrast is DWI, and then that's my QC output, QC report. So I'm going to paste this, enter. Okay, so you see that was pretty fast because it's a relatively small image, and we can open the uh, QC report. So I'm going to triple click here, copy and paste. Okay, good. So the, you're, you, you remember yesterday we we're going through a bunch of commands and all my commands are still listed here, you see, and this is the last one regarding the DeepSeg SC that we run on the diffusion weighted image. So again, I can do toggle on off and I can have an, I see you know, an axial view of all my slices cropped and centered around the spinal cord and showing the, uh, you know, a good segmentation uh, with that command. Uh, next, what we want to do is create a mask that will be used in subsequent motion correction. So copying this, pasting it, and you know the this mask. And, you know I can I can open the mask here. As you can see, that's going to be the file code mask underscore dmri. So you see this is a again a cylinder that is centered along the uh, center line of the span cone, right? And again, you can parameterize the uh, the size and the shape of this mask. And for now, we are happy with 35 millimeter. Next step, we want to do a motion correction of the diffusion MRI time series. So this is a relatively complex motion correction that is um, tailored to spinal cord images because it's doing a it's using the slice reg algorithm. So it will translate uh, in plane the uh, images, assuming that there is no motion along the superior inferior direction. It's also a regularized um, deformation. There is an outlier detection, and there is also the use of a Gaussian mask to ensure that uh, the, the motion accounted for is only coming from the spinal cord and not from the surrounding muscles, for example. So I'm going to copy this, paste it. So it's um, it's creating groups. Uh, it's creating groups because if the uh, SNR is too low on the diffusion weighted images, the motion correction would not be would not be um, reliable. So it's creating groups and then it's co-registering groups together, right? And then it's applying the uh, the um, registration parameters, the warping fields on um, on each of the groups. So it's done. Uh, we can look at the uh, QC report. So I'm going to open the QC report. I will do a refresh. And you see there's an additional line here that says SCT DMRI MOCO. And uh, it creates GIF uh, animation showing the uh, the the spinal cord centered um, on the um, on this cross here, and you can compare before and after a motion correction. So this is a quick way, and you have the volume number uh, at the bottom here. 
So it's a quick way to assess that you know there is no obvious um, motion or that the you know the algorithm worked uh, in a in a reasonable way. Any question regarding the motion correction? Okay, so after you you do your motion correction, uh, you want to register the uh, diffusion weighted MRI to the uh, to the template. So for that, we're going to rerun a segmentation of the spinal cord, but this time on the motion corrected DWI files. So I'm going to copy this. Okay. So normally, the result should be very similar to what we had before. So that was the before motion correction, and this is after motion correction. So you see there is very minimal changes because the data were already relatively well uh, aligned together. Then we want to register the, DW, the template to the DWI using the intermediate uh, T2 star weighted uh, transformation that we, that we computed yesterday. And um, that's to account for the gray matter segmentation. So I'm going to copy this command and paste it. And while this is running, I will explain to you all the different parameters. So the so the input, so we are using register multimodal because what we want to do is register the T1 weighted uh, PAM50 template. We use the T1 because its contrast is very similar to the uh, contrast of the DWI file, because it has a bright cord and a, a black background. Uh, the segmentation of the input is the spinal cord segmentation. Uh, dash D will be the destination. So the destination will be the averaged motion corrected DWI file. Segmentation is the one that we just uh, computed at this line here. Uh, we use an initialization warping field, as you remember, uh, that we're going to, to take from the T2 star um, folder. And we also want to input uh, an inverse warping field so that the output of this command will provide both a forward and a backward warping field to go uh, be, from the DWI space to the template space and from the template space to the DWI space. And this is how I'm going to call my outputs. So template to DMRI and DMRI to template. I also specified some parameters. Uh, so the first step of the registration will be you know, the segmentation um, will be done with the segmentation. We're gonna align the center of mass the second step is also using the segmentation, but with a nonlinear algorithm that we want to run on a slice by size basis and with the three iterations. So let's have a look at the results. I'm going to open the quality control, do a refresh, and there's an additional line here that appeared. Uh, so this is my destination segmentation and the other one is the T1 weighted scan. So you see, I'm toggling back and forth, and it shows, you know, the uh, fairly good alignment between the, the T1 weighted and the um, and the diffusion weighted scan. Again, this is, you know, for the sake of the example of this course, we can tweak the parameters further. We can use another image than the uh, T1 weighted of the PAM50. But again, this is just for the sake of, um, of illustration. And once this is done, we can warp the template on the uh, DMRI uh, space using this command. So while this is running, are there any questions? I see there is some there are the there are a few questions in the chat. Maybe we can elaborate yeah. on them. 
So do you recommend denoising using MR tricks before any processing of spinal cord DMRI data? Um, right. Yeah. So as Jan said, it's true that uh, it depends on the um, data, the analysis pipeline. Um, there are additional considerations to that is, you know, at what point you do the uh, denoising. Uh, some denoising methods use the uh, temporal evolution of the signal. So if the uh, images are not properly uh, co-registered across time, if, the, if, the, if, there are, you know, if there is motion, then the, the temporal evolution will be biased. Um, and it makes it even more you know, difficult in the spinal cord because you're dealing with the small structures. You know, in, in brain uh, time series, if there is you know, a motion of a few millimeters, then you know, if you're in the white matter, then you're likely going to stay in the white matter um, in the next uh, time points for, for a given voxel. But in the spinal cord, you know, if you're at the interface, if, if you take a voxel at the interface of the spinal cord, a motion of two millimeters, you will likely be, you know, in the CSF. So that that violates the uh, assumptions about, you know, time evolution uh, smoothness. Another consideration is that if you do the motion correction before running your your denoising um, method, then it will it might also violate the assumptions of the noise distribution because by doing motion correction, you you're also going to reinterpolate uh, each volume of your time series. And so that, you know, then it comes down to, you know, what kind of interpolation you're using uh, after you do your motion correction. Uh, so what some people do is, you know, they, they use, for example, nearest neighbor that does not affect the uh, noise distribution of the images. And if you do that, you can then apply, you know, some uh, denoising techniques. Uh, again, this is a relatively complex uh, thing that, you know, we need to go into the details, but short answer is that, uh, is that there is no a clear and single answer to that. Um, from Julian, how do you determine how much motion is too much motion? Yeah, that's a very, very good question. Are there plots? Um, okay, so it's, um, I think it, so first of all, it comes down to what you want to do with the data. Uh, for example, you know, if you're interested in extracting the signal uh, of the, the entire spinal cord um, versus if you're interested in looking at the signal in the rubrospinal tract, which is, you know, submillimetric, uh, you know, wide, then, you know, uh, the the quality of uh, of motion correction will will be will be different. Uh, you you know your, your the bar that you set um, will be will be different. Um, so you know the problem of the plots is that it's it's a chicken and egg problem. You know if we if we can have a, a very clear way to quantitatively assess how much uh, motion there is, then we should be able to perfectly correct for that motion, right? Um, it's, it's, it's a chicken and a problem of registration in general. Um, so, you know, that's why it's important to always look at the data. Uh, you know, most of the QC uh, recommendations in neuroimaging is to look at the data. Um, I, you, you, we, we can make plots. Um, we can compute the TSNR, but personally, I, I, I don't like that approach because people rely too much on it. And then uh, there are different ways where we can get higher SNR, higher TSNR, but uh, sub-efficient motion correction because TSNR will affect noise distribution, for example. So you know, my main message is look at the data and uh, based on your experience and knowledge of how the data will be used for the kind of analysis uh, you want to do down the line, uh, you know, you're the best person to assess whether you know, there's too much motion or not. Um, can we use any T2-weighted image for DMRI registration to template? So by T2-weighted, you mean the uh, EPI T2 or the uh, structural T2-weighted? Samira, um, okay, well, I'm, I'm going, 
I'll go to the to the next question. Um, does this MC MC meaning motion correction? Motion, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Also provide uh, motion parameters to include. Right. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so the yeah. So you see on my finder here, there's some there's a TSV file called Moco params, and these are the motion uh motion correction parameters for uh so again these are these are translations um along the x and the y uh, direction so they are they are listed here for each uh, each volume and you also have those as nifty files uh, it's hard to represent because i think they are 4d file we can actually look at this if i do a CT image, uh, Moko Param. I think it's header. I want to know the header of this Moko Param. I'm going to do header. So it is, yeah, so it is a 4D file. So you see that it's, uh, it encodes the, um, it encodes the uh, the uh, vector the the motion parameter for each volume, each of the thirty five volume, uh, and the fifteen different slices, and that's for the x, and you have one as well for the for the y. Um, I have a question. Should yeah. You? Uh, so you specified that we're using the T1 weighted template since it has similar contrast, but here in the parameters, we only use the type seg. Would it make a difference here if we used a T2, for example? Uh, yeah, great question. It would make absolutely no difference at all. <laughs> no difference at all. Because as, as Sandrine, it was Sandrine, right, who, who spoke? Yes. Yes, um, it uh, it makes no difference because, uh, as Sandrine mentioned, we are only using the the type uh, the segmentation for the registration. So what I input it here has absolutely no impact on the quality of registration. The the reason it's a good idea to put a contrast that is you know similar to the destination image you're trying to register, I would say is twofold. First, uh, when you do the QC. Uh, evaluation you want to compare the uh, registered data that has a similar contrast because if the contrast is very different you appreciate the boundary of the spinal cord in a different way second argument is that uh, you might want to tweak your registration parameters and then add an, another step uh, with the type im and if you do that uh, you want to make sure that you know you, you you're starting with a with a similar contrast uh, in the first place Um, so a question from Lydia, is there any distortion correction method, especially at the thoracic level? Yes, I would say that actually, you know, all levels are relevant with distortion corrections. So that it's been a, an extremely, you know, um, that there have been a lot of discussions around that. Um, I can actually, yes, thank you, Jan. That's a... That's the post I was looking for. Uh, there is a, a post here that uh, that uh, I wrote uh, a few years ago after Saj Babdi from the Femrib um, con contacted me to ask that exact same question. Um, there, um, there are pros and cons to apply distortion correction methods. So we're, we're talking susceptibility related distortion correction methods that affect EPI data. Uh, and the the short answer, and I, you know, I invite you to read the the post. The short answer is that um, those could work in some cases, but in some cases, it could actually create more spurious motion uh, or like more spurious distortions, uh, because estimating a prop like a, a robust B zero field 
or a robust uh, warping field using the top up, you know, blip up, blip down methods uh, could sometimes be unreliable. Uh, just to give you an example, uh, if the if there is poor shimming, the the fat sat will be sub efficient. You will end up with a blip up and blip down that has a different information content in terms of the uh, fat content. That will you know uh, the 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 top up algorithm will try to to account to account for those differences in magnitude and you will end up with more distortions uh, in your in your spinal cord. So again, be extremely careful with with those. Uh, you need to have a lot of you know, insights and knowledge about the artifacts, the MR physics uh, underlying that, and so on. So, you know, again, we're happy to uh, to assist you with those uh, questions uh, through the forum. Other questions. Uh... For the SCT register multimodal step, can we use the T2 warp? Yes, absolutely. Yes, I use the T2 star just as an example, but you can use the T2 warp. And in fact, I, I recommend using the, the T2 warp more, as, uh, as Sandrine uh, and Anyan said. Yeah. Yeah. I, I find the T2 is actually more reliable because. Uh, yeah, the, the T2 star and the segmentation of the gray matter could be unreliable. So if you want, you know, a reliable pipeline across hundreds of participants, I recommend relying on the T2 uh, weighted image instead. Uh, Samira, I mean either the structural T2 weighted image we acquired or busy Ramin to register the template. Yes, yes, exactly. So as Sandrine said, um, you would have registered the anatomical image already. Uh, the B zero, you could use the B zero of the of the uh, of the DWI scans, but I find the B zero is a bit less reliable. And uh, in fact, you know, we can we can try it. We can try it together. Right? Let's try to run the segmentation on the B zero file. So DMRI B zero mean. Where is that? Uh, oh no, we want to do the moco. Ah oh, no, so SCT DMRI. SCT deep seg segment input will be DMRI moco uh, B0 mean. The contrast will be um, DWI and I, I want the QC. QC, uh, QC single subject. Let's look at the QC report. Ah. So that's a good demonstration how how bad it well actually I know why I know why it failed because I specified the contrast was DWI whereas it should uh, it should be more of a T two contrast so let's try again with the T two contrast yeah, it's better but you see we're missing a slice here just because EPI uh, like Spineco EPI uh, is is just very unreliable and if if we if you compare this image which is already not too bad to be honest i've seen you know much worse uh you know spinaco apis if you compare this one with um with this one you know the there's there's clearly more like reliability for estimating the contour of this image compared to you know this image so that's the reason why we use the DWI instead of the uh, of the T two for um, of the B zero uh, T two for the um, segmentation and the registration. Um, okay, so at this point we have a motion corrected image, so we can compute the different tensor, and the this relies on the uh, Python library called DiPy which uh, is developed by an amazing group um, and that has a bunch of different methods, including the, the restore algorithm to um, estimate tensors using a robust fit. Um, so you see that the output is like the uh, axon, um, the, the, uh, the, the, the axon diffusivity, so it's the longitudinal diffusivity, the radial diffusivity, mean diffusivity, and fractional anisotropy. 
And once you estimate those volumes, one thing you want to do is compute the FA uh, within the, the white matter or within specific tracts. So we're going to run this, this command, the same we ran yesterday. But before running it, I'm just going to do a, to write a dash H so I can get help with that command. And in fact, what I want to do is list labels. I want to list the, the labels that we are going to compute. So extract metric, list labels. So what I want to do is compute the FA, fractional anisotropy, in the white matter, right? So the white matter is the label 51. And so that's why I, I wrote dash L51 here in this command, right? I'm going to use the um, the white matter atlas, and I'm going to use the maximum a posteriori method that we discussed yesterday. I want to compute the FA between vertebral levels two to five. Uh, and another flag also is that I want, um, I don't want to average across all the vertebral levels, but I want the FA for each vertebral level. So that's why I have a pair level one. So let's run it and see what we get. So it created the FA in double in a white matter. So I can open it. I'm going to zoom in. And you see that I have, so this is the column that describes the vertebral level. So for, for example, vertebral level two corresponds to the slices 11 to 13. So th this was found automatically from the, uh, from the vertebral labeling. Uh, it tells me that this is the white matter. That's the size of the ROI. So, you know, about 200 voxels is very reliable to estimate uh, a metrics from. And that's the result of my FA in the spinal cord. So you see, this is relatively stable along the um, along the superior inferior direction of the spinal cord. So you know, it's about 0.8 uh, between the C2 and C5. Um, we have a question: Is there a reason for averaging the DTI matrix between two and five? Um, is there a reason? Well, that's, that's, that's more of a scientific question. You know, if, uh, if people are interested in, in, uh, looking at, you know, um, uh, the, the generative effects that, uh, that can, that can, you know, propagate across different levels, then you might want to, uh, maximize your statistical power and therefore average across different levels, right? But again, that that's just an example. It comes down to the you know underlying hypothesis uh, that uh, you're working with. Okay, so any remaining questions for the diffusion MRI part before we dive into the uh, functional MRI? I have a question, uh, Julian. Um, your name. Oops, let me just put the... Um... Oh, yes, brilliant, yes. Hello. Um, I have a question about the diffusion. So you, you mentioned now that you can extract the metrics like FA, for example. Um, is there also possibilities to apply more advanced models to the diffusion-weighted MRI? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so so the, the answer is yes, but currently with, uh, with SCT, we've only... Um, We've only warped the uh, the diffusion tensor um, uh, computation. Okay. Uh, if you want to use more advanced model like like Nodi or uh, you know uh, Steady or like many others, uh, then that would be uh, done through a third party software. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. SCT is more of a pre-processing toolbox. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. And that's what we're going to see also with functional MRI. There are many, many, many steps that are involved with fMRI. But SCT's uh, role and mission is essentially on the pre-processing side, not on the you know uh, T-score or statistics and things like yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, 
Okay, any other questions on the diffusion MRI side? Okay. Um, so, fMRI. Sorry, I have a question. Oh, yes. I am, I'm, sure you, I'm sure you said it, but just uh, just to get it into my head, um, do you recommend the first thing to do with your diffusion data is motion correction before anything? Like if you... Um... In general, yes, but uh, there could be cases where you don't want to do motion correction, um, for example, in ex vivo scans. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's, it's it's a kind of a, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm smiling, but it's it's actually, you know, important to be aware of where, you know, when, when you don't want to use motion correction. If you're actually doing ex vivo scans and, you know, the scans are extremely noisy, you know, running motion correction might actually create more uh, more more motion across your time series. So, um, so it's that's one example. There could be other examples where you know you might want to be aware of uh, you know applying your motion correction might actually be detrimental for your analysis. You know, we talked about noise distribution before, right? Uh, for example, if you've already used uh, cardiac gating when you uh, acquired your data. Uh, do you recommend using motion correction or or it's better not? To? Well, I can imagine a patient with a cardiac gated acquisition and the patient does that. What happens to the images, right? I, I've, I've seen it, so <laughs> that, that happens. Yeah, or swallowing as well. Good. Okay, so let's move on to the fMRI uh, section. Um, again, this is, you know, I assume everybody's familiar with uh, with bold fMRI. Um, we're going to go to the fMRI folder. So cd dot dot fMRI ls to see what's in there. It's only one file. Again, it's a 4D file. That is in here. MRI. Yeah. So that's a you know standard gradient echo EPI axial orientation. Right. Let's actually look at it with the facial eyes. Okay, I'm gonna change the contrast. Uh, I want to look at the, my different time series. Okay, so that's a typical, you know, one millimeter. I think it's one millimeter in plane. Yes, one millimeter by one millimeter by three millimeters. TR of two point five seconds. So. First thing we want to do is average all the fMRI time series to make it a 3D volume. So we're going to use SCT math for that. The input will be the fMRI uh, time series, and then you're going to, to do the mean across T. And the output will be fMRI underscore mean. Done. And next step, you want to bring the T2 segmentation to the fMRI space. Going to explain to you why we do that. So the for that we we do the we use the register multimodal command. The input will be the the segmentation of the T2 structural image. Okay. The destination will be the averaged fMRI time series. And here we use a very important flag. It's called the dash identity one. What it does is that it will simply do a uh, resampling of the segmentation on the on the T2 space into the fMRI space. So there is no there is no um, convergence, uh, there, there is no optimization of the of, of, of registration, right? It's simply we assume the, the patient is in the similar position. We take the segmentation and we bring it into the uh, space of the fMRI. So we can we can look at 
what it does. Okay, so let's open the image to see what's the what's the result of that. So I'm going to open this one, the average fMRI scan and the registered T2 segmentation. So in in yellow is the segmentation of my T2 image that I brought in the space of the fMRI scan. So you see the Registration is not perfect, which is normal because the patient moved in between. And in addition, there are also susceptibility artifacts, right? So I don't expect the registration to be perfect. But the reason, the, the reason I'm bringing the, the segmentation here is to be able to then create a mask automatically around the spinal cord. And then I'm going to use that mask to do motion correction and to and uh, and then to help with the registration. So these are the steps that come afterwards. We create a mask automatically using the uh, the segmentation of the T2. And then we run the motion correction. And you might be wondering why why didn't we simply segment the spinal cord on the on the fMRI scans uh, and then created the mask exactly as we did for the DWI scans, right? The reason we don't do it here is because we don't have a super reliable way to segment the spinal cord in on gradient echo EPI scans because those can be I mean the images that are here are relatively nice. But some scans can be very ugly, uh, especially if there is poor shimming and especially at 7 Tesla. So we prefer to rely on the segmentation of the T2 because uh, we are 100% you know, sure the segmentation is correct. Uh, and then we do the motion correction. And then uh, after the motion correction, we will register the, um, the template on the fMRI scan. Um, and then we we can we can try different things uh, together. Okay, so let's open the quality control, refresh. There is a new line here, SCT fMRI MOCO. It shows the motion correction before uh, and after applying the algorithm. So you see, this is relatively, relatively okay. There's still some motion. And, you know, that's something you can, you can tweak on your end, depending on your images. You know, if you look at the different parameters of the fMRI MOCO, there are a lot of parameters that can, you know, that you might want to control to get better results. For example, the um, the grouping of the uh, number of volumes in order to increase the, the robustness. Um, you might also want to add some regularization, some, some smoothing. Uh, you might want to try different metrics. By default, we use the mean square. Um, and so on. Um, and the final step is to register the template to the fMRI scan. And in this case, we're going to use the, uh, the T2. Uh, and then after that, it's not in the course, but we can try segmenting the fMRI 
and then using the segmentation for the registration. So first, let's run this. So a question from Anne Urban, in what cases we prefer to register the fMRI to template space versus the template to the fMRI space, right? Um, so the, right, so as Jan said, so in the, the bottom line, I, I would not ask the, the question in, in this way, actually. Um, because the in both cases you're you you're computing uh, bijective uh, transforms. In, in both cases you have warping fields uh, that are forward and backward. So in both cases you can bring your. It's not like we are register A to B, but we are registering A with B, right? And by registering A with B, uh, you're creating a warping field to go from A to B and to go from B to A. But the difference when we use the ref template versus ref subject is that there is a straightening that's that's happening. And that straightening, as we discussed yesterday, is not recommended um, with you know axial highly anisotropic scans because that would induce some interpolation errors. Um, so you know, depending on the acquisitions, if there is if you have thin slices, if there is strong curvature in your subjects if you're like if you if you have a large coverage then these these would be arguments for using a straightening and then using the ref template in the uh, in the register to template command right um let's look at the results yeah so this is the registration So you see what we did. What we did here is we used the um, we used the PAM fifty T two star as the reference image because it it has a contrast that is similar to the EPI. Um, the destination is the um, average motion correction uh, data. And uh, we use that segmentation uh, just for the purpose of, uh, of visualizing visualizing the um, the the quality control report. It's not used in the registration. And you see that there is only one step in the registration. That step is using the image. So we don't use the segmentation. Because we don't have a segmentation of the of the EPI, we use the SYN algorithm, cross correlation, five iterations, and we want this to be uh, to be a volumetric uh, registration and not a slice wise. And we start off with the um, template to T2 star registration, right? In some cases, you have you know good segmentations of the of the EPI and you might want to use those segmentations for the registration. So that's something we can try together. You know, it's not in the course, but let's try it. let's try it. SCT, DeepSeg, it's like a live test. I have, I have not tried it. Dash I, fMRI, Moco, Min. Okay. Um, and uh, the contrast will be T2 star. And uh, I don't have a segmentation. Okay, good. So it's I'm gonna and then QC. This would be QC. Yeah. Okay, let's have a look. Refresh. Yeah, so you see this is horrible, right? I'll try with the T2. Yeah, even worse. <laughs> so that's the reason we don't we don't use the uh, the segmentation of the T two star because it's unreliable. Um, as a quick shout out, as as we're gonna see uh, towards the end of the course, we have new features. We have a new deep learning segmentation model for EPIs. Uh, it's not 
available in the stable version yet, but it will soon be. Uh, so stay tuned, but uh, we're going to talk a bit more about that uh, later in the course. But for now, uh, unless you do the manual segmentation of the EPI yourself, um, you know, we prefer to rely on the T2 uh, and then do an image-based registration, which is, you know, it's it's not perfect, but it's already a good start. Um, any question about this? No, so, oh yes, a uh, question from Luca Turella. Do you suggest to use slice timing correction? Um, yeah, so that's something we discussed last week in Boston at the uh, Spinal Cord Workshop. Um, there is no consensus. Um, um, there is no consensus, and the reason there is no consensus is because um, so most of the most people use uh, regressors, uh, such as um, you know, like cardiac, respiratory, uh, motion regressors, and so on, as as an input in their general linear model. And historically, the PNM, the Physiological Noise uh, Correction Toolbox that was developed by John Brooks originally, used the slice-wise uh, sets of regressors. And if you use slice-wise sets of regressor uh, that are based on the, um, on you know the cardiac uh, cardiac signal, for example, then you, you want to keep the timing of each slice uh, so that they are aligned in time with those regressors. If you apply the slice timing correction, then you, you effectively shift the time, the timing of each slice so that they are, all slices are, you know, quote unquote, acquired at the same time. But that would screw up the, the uh, regressors uh, where the, the, the timing is specific to each slice, right? So depending on the, on the pipeline, um, that that you're using uh you know you could or could not apply the the timing correction but the important thing to be aware of is not to screw up the, the timing of the re regressors that are that are used uh, down the line uh, julian maybe i have another question uh is more technical so uh um the other point is that i i um I've seen just one paper using FIR to estimate the HRF in the spinal cord, and this seems to be different from the brain. So um, this is also, I think, why people use mainly block design, right? So to ignore, let's to say, the the fact that probably the HRF is not the one that you have in the brain. Uh, do you have any suggestion in, with this respect or any kind of consensus? <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's it's a it's a tough one. Um, okay, sorry. It's, 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 it's a tough one. So uh, I mean, there there is evidence from you know papers from uh, from the seventies looking at uh, mm -hmm. uh, pressure based um, uh, uh, no sorry um, oxygen concentration measurements uh, in the spinal cord and comparing the spinal cord and the brain in in rats notably and showing that uh, there is indeed a, a brisker neurovascular response in the in the spinal cord that would suggest uh, a faster um, hrf a hemodynamic response function uh, but these are you know a few articles based on animals um, and also under you know particular anesthesia uh, that might also affect the uh, the uh, neurovascular response um, it, the one thing to consider also is that uh, the, the 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 SNR uh, and, and the contrast noise ratio of the uh, bolt signal is much lower in the spinal cord, um, which is you know which might be one of the reasons people also prefer to do block design to have more statistical power. Um, but that being said, I mean I I haven't I'm not up to date with the fMRI spinal cord literature, but um, I think. I, there, I would think that there is more, uh, more like event-related designs nowadays. Okay. But but maybe I'm wrong. I, I I know a couple of groups are very active in this field, and I know they they've tried all sorts of paradigm. Um, 
I would not be surprised if there was some, you know, more events based. I, maybe Sandrine has some more, more thoughts on that since you're versed into fMRI now. And maybe yeah. I have another one, if I may. So um, I'm I'm new to to uh, to the spinal cord, as I said. But given that we use like Gradientico normally uh, at fMRI acquisition, and the I mean, looking at how the um, how this the vascular distribution in the spine. So uh, I was also a bit. I mean, I I think we should, in addition to finding something within the spinal cord, finding also some something possibly where the mind vascular uh, are. And so it would be that some of the activity we might find outside the spine is actually signaled. Is it something completely, uh, I mean, so we should find something more outside than inside probably mm -hmm. because actually there is there where is the uh, more vascular um, change probably, right? Or mm -hmm. am I wrong? Um, so it's it depends on the, the, the kind of uh, sequence we're using. As, okay. as, as, as you know, the uh, like gradient echo API yeah. are you know as are more um, you know sensitive to the to to the venous uh, part of the uh, of the vascular system, whereas spin echo APIs, your you know the the bold response is more concentrated towards the um, the the micro like the, the arterioles. Um, so you're a bit closer to the uh, to the um, to the neuronal pools. Um, that's one consideration. The other consideration, obviously, is the uh, is the uh, image resolution, uh, and also the orientation of the veins. Uh, there is Ravi Menon who showed in '95 that you know the the orientation of the veins with respect to the uh, to the B0 field uh, would create um, a point spread function of the bold response that would be you know displaced depending on the orientation of the veins. Uh, obviously, those those veins are oriented in a very different way than than in the brain. Um, and um, and that that would indeed you know displace the uh, the, the bold response uh, but, you know compared to, that could be displaced by a few millimeters um, and given that the, how small the spinal cord is I would not be surprised to to have some response outside or at the periphery and uh, so the I, I published the paper in I think two thousand eight uh, looking at that in the in the cat in the proportion of of cat. Uh, with uh, electrical stimulation, and we did some uh, um, like imaging of the of the vessels and showing that indeed some of the bold response would be present, you know, would co-localize with the vessels that would be slightly outside of the spinal cord. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, okay, so once you have um, once you have the your registered. Um, your warping fields, then you're ready to register the um, the the pump fifty objects to the uh, fMRI space. And one thing that you might be interested in if you do fMRI uh, are not the vertebral levels but the spinal levels, uh, which uh, are you know closer to the to the functional segments of the spinal cord. Um, and so one thing that is new. Uh, in SCT 6.1 is that after discussions with the uh, different groups, notably uh, group at EPFL, Nawal Kenani, uh, a group in Marseille and at King's College, uh, we realized that the, the previous spinal levels that was included in SCT was, uh, was slightly wrong. And we've updated it according to the Frostel uh, et al. article that provides um, um, you know, spinal segments best, um, based on the, on the discs, on the location of the, of the intervertebral discs. Uh, and another thing that we also changed is that uh, the, the spinal levels are not probabilistic anymore, but they are like integer. So uh, it's only one file. And the file is located under PAM50 uh, template. I'll show you uh, actually where it is. I should have put the name of that file. I'm putting a note. So if we go to the, um, oops. 
we go to this Paracord Toolbox folder under Data, PAM50, Template. There is a file called Spinal Levels. And so this is the file that is shown here. And it corresponds to the spinal level. So you see the, the nerve rootlets on this coronal view that you know enter that uh, that C two spinal segment, and you know the, we don't we don't see those nerve rootlets as well uh, in the like in the other segments, but they are supposed to correspond to the to the functional segments. So that's something you can you can then uh, look at if you apply warp template uh on the fmri uh, epi space that's what i'm doing now it's going to warp so you see it's creating a, a folder called label templates and then there is uh there will be um, a spinal level that will be in the space of your fmri so it will look like this right and you'll have vertebral level spines and spinal level files. And as you can see, they are, you know, they're not the same, right? The, the spinal levels are slightly shifted. Okay, so any question before we move on to the next section? Okay. So, other features. Um, the the quality control report is uh, something that is extremely important. Uh, so we we've developed uh, additional features on this QC. Um, notably, there is a QC module for deep seg lesions. If you want to segment, you know, MS lesions, for example. Uh, there is a way to to visualize uh, those segmentations with this feature. Um, we've also developed a new um, function to stitch images. So if if you acquire you know like structural images across two different slabs and you want to stitch those images together, uh, you can then quality control the quality of the stitching uh, with with this new module. Um, also, the QC report allows you to quickly assess uh, the quality using an additional column. Um, that's it's the QC column. So I have not used it, but you might have noticed it. That's this column, right? Um, we can go through the different processes, and if you and if you find that the you're you know satisfied with the quality of the processing, then you can click on on F. And it will create a, a green check mark. You can do the same for the other one. So let's say you're not happy with this one. Click on F and you click on another time, it will do a, a red cross. And then you're happy with this. Let's say you're happy with this. You're happy with this, and so on, right? And if you notice some artifacts, so let's say we notice some artifacts on the fMRI, like this, right? Uh, then you would you could click a third time and it it creates this um, this like yellow warning sign, right? And so that way you can quickly assess the you know the the status of your um, of your QC, and then at the bottom you see there are two buttons. There is a download QC fails, and if you click on it. It will download a file. It's a YML file that is downloaded here. And I can open it. And it lists the the files that you that you labeled as fail on the segmentation. So that's the function dipsegsc. So it's under the categories file segmentation. And this is the this is the file that we you know that, that we crossed because it was not working properly and the same way you can also download all the your you know the list of the images with artifacts 
that's going to be called QC artifact, and then it lists you know all the images that you've uh, flagged here. So again, if you're running analysis on hundreds of subjects, uh, this can be extremely useful because then you can can create some like some sort of reports uh, that can then be manually corrected uh, down the line. Uh, this is something I'm going to show you in the when we when we'll move on to the um, pipeline analysis uh, that that is coming soon. Um, there is also um, for those who are familiar with the image viewer FSLIs that is part of FSL. Uh, there is also an, a plugin to be able to run SCT with within FSL. So I'm going to show you how it works. Um, there is so we can run FSLIs. Okay, so nothing fancy so far, but what you can do is file run script. And then under this panel called toolbox folder, there is a folder called contrib FSL integration. And then there is a script SCT FSLIs script that you can open and it will load the, um, you know, like some sort of like plugin of SCT with the different commands like SCT DeepSec, GM. And so, for example, you can, let's add a file. Let's add, for example, the empty file, uh, like this one. I'm going to adjust the contrast. OK. And then we want to run the segmentation. So the input file is the one that is selected here. So I just have to click. The contrast would be, let's say, T2 or T2 star. and the output folders is something you can select as well. So I want the output to be here. And then you can run. You can see what's happening in the terminal here. And then you have the output of the segmentation. So it makes it quite convenient for, you know, if you want to run like individual subjects and then explore your, uh, your results, because uh, everything is integrated. Um, we would love to we would love to get your feedback. Not all the commands are here, but if you feel that this is something that would be useful, we can spend time adding more commands. So that's something for your uh, you know that um, uh, you you can let us know. Um, there is a question from Scott and so. For the lumbar spinal levels, how do you suggest to register the fMRI to the template if the participant's conus doesn't match the L2? Uh, through only the new conus label or through the disc labels? I ask because sometimes the conus ends at T11 instead of L2, and I'm curious how you think this would affect the location of those small lumbar spinal levels when matching them in the end. Um, so the if if there is indeed a quite a large discrepancy between uh, the end of the conus uh, in the pan 50 template and in your subject, then it's true that if you're using two labels, like one being the conus and the other one being the let's say the uh, you know T11 T12 uh, disc, you might end up with a very large. Um, uh, like scaling at step zero and that scaling would probably you know generate uh, wrong um, alignments because in your particular case it's very likely that if the conus does not end uh, at l1 l2 then you know a couple of levels above that the there would also be a discrepancy so in that case i think i would recommend to only use one label the, the, the conus medullaris. Right. And thank you, Sandrine, for the uh, yeah, for the uh, link to the uh, tutorial. Yeah. Hey, um, another feature um, 
would be the smoothing along the spinal cord. Um, as you know, the spinal cord is curved, and the you know it's very typical in brain uh, imaging uh, pipelines to do a smoothing, and that smoothing is typically done uh, using an isotropic uh, kernel. So let's say you know a three by three by three millimeter uh, smoothing kernel. Those who use free surfer uh, are familiar with the surface based smoothing, right? Um, with SCT, we offer something similar. So we once we have the center line, then we can also smooth the spinal cord along the center line. And that enables to, you know, prevent any partial volume that would be uh, dependent on the curvature of the spinal cord, which varies across subjects. Uh, and, you know, that makes it, you know, much more clean. And one thing that... Uh, yeah, we can actually try that. Let, let's try this. So we go to the T1 folder, and then we run the segmentation. And we run the segmentation so that we we have a, we have a center line, right? That center line will be based of the of the segmentation. So this takes a bit longer than the other images because the T1 is uh, is big. There is um, there is the brain. Okay, it generated the QC report. So while we look at the QC report, I'm going to run this command, which is the smooth spinal cord. Okay, so let's look at the QC report of the T1. So I do a refresh. That's my T1. Uh, you see, this is where the brain is. So there is absolutely no segmentation of the cord because there is no cord. Um, but the, the other part looks reasonable. So the smoothing spinal cord is currently running and it's using the, the center line of the, of the spinal cord to, to smooth um, along it and will Together, then we'll compare the uh, the result of the uh, smooth spinal cord versus the unsmooth. If people have questions during the processing, feel free to to ask. Just a quick question: You mentioned yeah. that the uh, the image had a had uh, brain sections in it, and there's a an argument for SCT deep seg SC for a brain, uh, whether zero or one, just wondering if you have the wrong option for that. So you forget to specify it. Does it affect the results at all? Or is it just the speed of processing? It's just the speed of processing. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. But, uh, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if in, you know, 1% of the case that would actually produce different results. <laughs> So, you know, because what it does is that it does a, a cropping, right? Um, and that cropping would not affect the, the rest of the image because the kernel, the segmentation kernel is 2D. So whether there is more slices or not, each slice is, in, is analyzed independently. That being said, there is also a 3D kernel. So, you, you know, it might be possible that if, you, if the cropping is different or if there is a brain, the result of this 3D segmentation would be slightly different. But that's something you could try and uh, and report back. Uh, so it's an interesting question. So the smoothing is finished. So we can uh, copy and paste that command to see on Fessalize the, the results with and without smoothing.
So that's the original image. I'm just gonna adjust the contrast. Okay, that's the original the standard T1 weighted MP range. And that's the one that is smooth along the spinal cord. I'm going to use the same contrast. Yeah. So that's it. So smoothing along the spinal cord might be helpful for uh, you know identifying very like you know diffuse pathologies, for example, where you would expect um, where you would expect uh, you know like um, very subtle changes in the in the contrast that would be hard to see with if there is more noise. Uh, and smoothing along the spinal cord could also help. Uh, if you want to do the seg its uh, segmentation, right? Uh, so that's why here we have another pass of deep seg SC, and then you can compare the quality of the segmentation with and without the smoothing, right? Um, another very cool feature that I like very much when I make figures for uh, papers is the so-called align the chord in the RL plane. So it's called the flattened sagittal. So it's not exactly the same as straighten spinal cord. I'm gonna run it. What it does is that it uh, it simply shifts the spinal cord in the right left direction so that it aligns the chord in the in the medial plane. And that's helpful if you want to visualize quickly all your images. You know, let's say you have hundreds of participants, and you want to make sure that the spinal cord, you know, is is um, is well acquired, or the the field of view is correct, or there is not so much artifact. Then you can use the um, you know the seg the input segmentation to flatten the um, to flatten the spinal cord. So that's the flattened chord, you see, and that's the original one. Use the same contrast. Yeah, that's the original one, and you see that there's a, you know, the chord is like moving away from the me medial plane, so we lose it when we look at the medial plane. Whereas with T1 flattened, it's all aligned, right? Um, hey, uh, and I showed you very briefly the SCT math command when we did the, the mean across time. SCT math could be used uh, for many other uh, mathematical operations, uh, you know, like doing some Otsu. Uh, thresholding, um, thresholding using the percent image of the signal. You can do some root mean squared uh, across the different dimensions. You can do add images, subtract images, and so on. So the SCT math is a, is a kind of a little sister of FSL math for those who are familiar with FSL. There's also SCT image that can be used to manipulate images. For example, if you want to pad uh, a 3D image, add some like zeros, you know, uh, above or below uh, some some slices. If you want to split your images across time or across specific dimensions, uh, if you want to remove some volumes, uh, if you want to change the image type of your image, um, if you want to stitch multiple images together, so that's new in the uh, in the uh, SCT uh, six point one. Uh, there are also some header operations. If you want to look at your header, uh, that would be similar to FSL HD. You know, uh, if you want to set the S form uh, to the Q form and so on. So there is a bunch of different you know, operations that uh, can be used to play with the header uh, of your Nifty image. So that's the image stitching. Uh, function that I told you about that works relatively well. Um, 
and uh, it was uh, thanks to a contribution by uh, Julian McGuinness from uh, Technische Universität in uh, Munich. And other functions could be seen when you tap SCT underscore and then tab. You can see the all the different SCT functions that exist. Uh, you know it's a bit overwhelming. Um, we we saw most of them today, but there are others that could be useful uh, for you. Um, again, if you if you're unsure what they what this what they are for, uh, I mean each of them has um, some like you know an explanation. For example, if I take you know this one, and then you can type dash h for the help. Then it tells you what this is about, and the usually the um, reference, the, the the journal article associated with it. Um, for some reasons, you might want to activate the Python of SCT. For you know, if you contribute to SCT, if you're doing some debugging work, uh, that would be the way to activate uh, the Conda environment. Of, uh, of SCT. And we arrive at the imaging analysis pipeline. Uh, any question so far before we go to the analysis pipeline? Mm. Uh, hi, Julian. Uh, I'm Alessandro oh. from Martino Center. Um, I, would be, I would be very curious to see uh, the function um, uh, SCT deep sec lesion. Do you have any MS spinal cord to show us? Um, let's see. So this is working. So this has been uh, developed for the T2 uh, scan. Let me check if I have one scan that I can show that is not too uh, uh, restrictive in terms of ethics. Have a look. Two. Uh, okay, let's try this. So let's try. Oh, yeah, we would need the segmentation as well. I don't know if Naga is. Oh, yeah, Naga is connected. I don't know, Naga, if you know a good example of a. Of an MS patient, uh, T2 weighted with a lesion. I'm just picking one. Uh, just picking one randomly. Okay. okay, we see lesions here. So let's try that. See, there is a there is a lesion on this scan, so I'm going to so SCT deep seg lesion. Let's see what it takes. It takes the image, and it also takes the type of contrast. So in this case, it would be a, a T2. Seg lesions uh, dash i uh, sub. An I uh, contrast would be T2, and then I want the QC. Unrecognized arguments, interesting. QC, oh, that's strange. I thought the QC was added on the, on the SAT analysis. Oh, no, sorry, it's the wrong one. Oh yeah, deep seg lesion. Oh, it's analyzed lesion that has the QC, not deep seg lesion. My bad. 
Yeah, the lesion QC was added to SCT QC function, not directly to SCT deep seg lesion. Okay, function. so we might want to do that. Yeah, good point. Okay, that was fast. So we can then look at this. Okay, so going to adjust the contrast. So this was a live test, no preparation. But it seems to work pretty well. So that's an example of a, of a scan, you know, with a few lesions, like here. And actually uh, make it bigger. Um, not others here as well. Yeah. So yeah, that's that's an example of uh, SCT um, deep seg lesions. And once you have those lesions, you can you can run. Well, we we can actually test the QC. So let's try it live as well. SCT QC. Uh, we need spinal cord segmentation for the QC. Okay. So deep seg. But we do have the segmentation there, no? Oh no, we don't. Okay, no, so let's do it. Deep seg SC. Sub run. Contrast T2, QC. Okay, you see a report is being generated. So let's have a look, refresh. Right. So that's the segmentation of the cord on the T2. And what we want now is generating the QC report of the lesion uh, segmentation. So we're going to do an SCT QC. And then look at the arguments. So we need the image. Image would be sub, oops, sub ran, okay. Then P would be the process we want the QC on. In this case, it is a deep seg lesion. Then we want the segmentation, which is the segmentation of the of the spinal cord. Of the spinal for, cord used yes. for cropping. And then that, uh, and then we have another D, yeah, D, yeah. That's not very intuitive, I have to say. <laughs> yeah, we need to. We might want to change that. Sub so, uh, lesion, yeah. Oh yeah, we also want to output this on my QC folder. And that's we it? can and we can specify plane, sagittal mm -hmm. or axial. Oh yeah, plane, sagittal. All right, now we can refresh. Oops, I lost my window. And that's the QC output, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's a that's quite a nice addition, actually. Um yeah. Oh yeah, a question from Hussein. Can you please copy and paste the syntax here? Uh, sure. So that's the syntax for deep segregation. Uh, 
fetch the syntax for uh, segmenting the chords. We already know this one, so there is no point in me putting it. And then the QC report. All right. SCT and oh yes, Mathieu, good point. Let's run SCT analyze lesion. SCT analyze lesion. What is it? It it computes statistics on the segmented lesions, right? So for for example, the volume, the length, and so on. So the input arguments are the M, which is the binary mask of lesions. So sub lesion and then s spankard center line uh, which is used to correct the morphometric measures with the uh, chord angle with respect to the slice um, we have it so we can input it and image to which from which to extract the average value within lesion for example if you have you know an a quantitative, quantitative MRI scan and you want to compute, you know, MTR or diffusion FA inside the lesion, then you can input that here. Now, for the sake of demonstration, I'm just going to input the, the T2 image. Uh, oh, yeah, you can also, if you have uh, registered it to the PAM50, you can also provide the folder to the uh, Atlas. Um, so that it uh, computes the distribution of the lesion depending on the vertebral level and each region of the of the template, different white matter tracts, and uh, and so on. Okay, so it created an, an Excel file. Interesting. Maybe I don't know why I cannot open it. Yes. Okay, so that's the output Excel file. I'm going to make a note so we, we need to change it to the new XLX, XLS X. And it's a bit old. But uh, in any case, you have the volume of. So you see, we have four lesions one, two, three, four. And for each lesion, you have the um, you have their volume, their length, equivalent diameter. Uh, you also have additional information such as oh yeah the mean, the mean signal inside the lesion, the mean T two signal inside the lesion. Uh, I assume it's the standard deviation. So yeah, that's that's about it. That's about it. Good. So it's eleven forty. So it's right on time for um, starting. The... Another... Yes. There was oh. another question. I think you missed in the chat about um, influence of artifacts from implants. Oh yeah, from uh, GLU, yes. Infant artifacts and spinal cord imaging for people with spinal cord injuries with decompression surgery, what are effective processing steps to eliminate the imaging artifact from the implants? Um, <clears throat> um, so there are different approaches um, for that. Um, you know, correcting using the, the B0 field or correcting with a top up if we're talking about the EPI readout. Uh, so that would be for DWI, which is here. Um, 
unfortunately there is no you know there is no there is no way to recover the signal that is lost uh, via intravoxel defacing on on GRE scans granoteco scans um, and uh, you know so it's 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 really a matter of making sure the images are acquired uh, you know as 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 good as possible there are some sequences uh, like the warp sequence in the uh, for Siemens that are equivalent for GE and Philips um, to be less sensitive to susceptibility artifacts. Um, and as we discussed also earlier, um, it might be, you know, might be a good idea to avoid the region where there is excessive artifact instead of uh, processing the images there. Um, I don't know if that answers the, the questions, but um, yeah, that would be my my two cents on that. Um, okay, so everyone is ready for the analysis pipeline with SCT. That's to me, this is the most exciting part of the of the course because I love pipelines. So, what is a pipeline? It's a um, chain of commands that are arranged so that the output of each element is the input of the next. And pipelines can be designed to automatically process MRI data over hundreds or thousands of subjects. And for that, we use uh, batch scripts, which are written in shell language. It's the same as your terminal. You know, what I'm, when I have my terminal here and I use some commands, uh, this is shell. And so we use a script that is a you know a sequence of shell commands uh, to orchestrate those pipelines. Um, a very important aspect when you run analysis pipelines over hundreds of, uh, of participants is that um, is that the data needs to be organized in a consistent way. And one way to organize the data uh, so that they are consistent is following the standard called BITS, Brain Imaging Data Structure. Uh, you can learn more on this link, but very briefly, uh, this is a way to you know, name your files uh, so that they, you know, they are consistent across contrasts uh, and also across uh, ANAT or fMRI or DWI. Um, there is a descriptor for the data set. So I strongly encourage you to organize your data uh, according to bits so that when you when you process your hundreds of patients, even if it's ten patients, you know it's, it makes it uh, it makes the analysis reproducible. You know, let's say six months uh, after you submitted your your manuscript to uh, to a journal, one of the reviewer asks you to uh, change a parameter. Right, and then you have to rerun your analysis. Um, what you, in an ideal world, what you would do is that you would go back to your uh, analysis script, you would change the line that the reviewer asked you to change, and then you would, you know, run the command, a single command on the terminal, and then it would rerun your entire processing. Right, you just get a coffee, you come back, your processing is done. And uh, that's how it should be. Right, you need to be able to rerun your ent entire processing without manual intervention, and that's what we're going to do now together. So, uh, for the for the for running the uh, the processing pipelines, we use a command called sct run batch that loops across a bunch of subjects. So we are going to change the folder now. We were on a single subject. We will go on another subject here called multi-subject. I see that someone is playing with the, uh, <laughs> with the, uh, with like the, uh, I don't know, the, um, anyway. I don't know who that is, but if 
that person could maybe remove those drawings on my screen. I shared my screen and I think uh, you all have the permission to, to draw on my screen. Um, oh yeah, thank you. Good. So let's go to the multi subjects. Okay. And if I do an LS, I see that there is config and there is data. So let's see what's in data. LS data. There are three subjects, subject one, three, and five. I can I can look at what's in the um, in the folders using tree data. And if I tap tree data, you see that in, under sub zero one there is an anat folder, and in the anat folder there is a t two, there is an empty off and an empty on, and it's the same for the other subjects, right? So you you can imagine if you have thousands of subjects that are organized the same way. Then we can easily have a script that will fetch the you know subject name, run some uh, processing, and then output a concatenated uh, file. Before running the processing, we need to make sure the process data.sh is executable. So let's make it executable. And then we're going to see what's inside this file, the process data file. So I'm on a Mac, so I will use open process data.sh and it opens um, an editor, a text editor. And then I can see what's in this uh, file. So we're going to look at it together. Uh, and then I'm going to run it. And while this is running, we can do a break. Uh, we can do a 30 minutes break and then reconvene and then analyze the, the results together. So uh, the script uh, has a couple of commands that you don't need to understand all. Um, one command is a, is a shell function that is called label if does not exist. Another one called segment if does not exist. And I'm going to explain to you what it, what it does. But the important aspect is that the script starts here, okay? So what the script does is that it will first retrieve the input parameter that we enter into SCT run batch. It displays when the script starts. Uh, it, it runs this to make sure that uh, SCT is properly installed and it finds also the version of SCT. It goes to um, the processing folder, the, the folder where you're going to output all your process data. It copies the source files. And then this is the section that runs the, the commands for the T2 weighted image. So you remember the way my data are organized. There is the subject name and then there is anat. So that's what we do here. We come to the directory subject number and then anat. And then the file name is going to be the subject name underscore T2 weighted. And you can verify that this is the case here. Subject name underscore T2 weighted. And this is why bids is very powerful because it ensures that, you know, let's say you have you have another collaborator that sends you, you know, a bunch of data that are also organized according to bids. Then you can take your script and run it on this other data set and it's gonna work. Right. So it's very, very powerful to, you know, comply to an existing uh, data organization standard. So coming back to the script, uh, the next line is says segment spinal cord only if it does not exist. So it will run this syntax here. And you remember this is a, a script that was, that we saw earlier, segment if it does not exist. So the script, the script will go inside it, inside this, inside this function, and then it will, if it will look for a manual segmentation, you know, if it finds a manual segmentation, then it will copy it in the processing, uh, in the output folder, and it will run the, the quality control, SCT quality control, right? Just to make sure that the manual segmentation that it found is correct. If it did not find any manual segmentation, it will do, it will run SCT deep seg SC. 
the same way we did it together before, right? So what is the logic here? The logic is that you have hundreds of subjects. You run your pipeline, you have no manual segmentation. So it will, it will only do the automatic segmentation of the spinal cord, right? After you run your pipeline, you come back to your computer two hours later, you run the QC. And while looking at the QC, you realize that segmentation has failed in, let's say, five subjects, right? So you will identify those five, sub five subjects, you will manually correct the spinal cord segmentation, and then you can take that manual correction and then put it where the data are. And there is a very specific bids uh, organization of where you need to place this manual correction. It's under a folder called derivatives. Uh, that is actually here, derivatives slash labels, right? And, and then you can rerun your entire processing. And if the script finds that for a particular subject, there is a manual correction, it will use it, right? And then the subsequent steps can run properly. So that is really the way to make sure that your processing pipeline is reproducible. And then if you come back to it six months later, uh, you will get the exact same results. And you don't need to redo the manual segmentation, right? So after the segmentation, there is a, it, it will create labels in the spinal cord. So that is what this command does. And then it will register to the PAM50 template, okay? Then it will warp the template. And then it will compute CSA between C2 and C3 levels, okay? And you see, so that's a command we saw together, SCP process segmentation, but there is one additional flag that we did not discuss, which is the append flag. The append flag will mean that um, Instead of you know over instead of overwriting the csa.csv file, it will append a new line to it. So you know in this case I have three subjects, so it will add the uh, csa result uh, on, on a new line of my csv file. So in the end, after I come back to my computer, after the processing is run, I'll have a single csv uh, file that has all my subjects with the CSA uh, results. And then you can take that file, make it an Excel file. You can compute some statistics and you, you can do a bunch of stuff. Any questions so far for the T2 weighted processing? If not, we can look at the MT processing looks a bit longer, but it's really the, the same idea, right? We go um, to the, uh, oh yes, uh, we have- a... I have a question. Yes. So um, can you go back a little bit up where you have the First, SCT process segmentation? Yeah. Yeah, so what if at this step you want to uh, calculate the, you want to add the SCT compute compression? Mm -hmm. But that step requires uh, a manual identification of um, a file that has manual identification of the region of compression. How do you do that? No, that's a great question. Um, I think the way we would do it uh, is by... Maybe if I can try to answer yes, this question. Yes, yes. Yeah, the way how I would do it would be first manually label the compression side across all subjects. So first I would iterate across subjects using, using for example, a manual correction workflow we have. This is gonna be presented in another slides. So first step, manual labeling of the compression sides. Then I would save these manual labels under derivatives. And then inside this process data script, I would copy the compression uh, labels from the derivatives into the currently processed folder and I could use them for SCT compute compression. 
does this make sense, Fauzia? Um, yes, so I understand that aspect of doing the manual label and saving them in the derivative label file mm -hmm. folder. But how you add the syntax on the code is where I'm having trouble. Yeah. So that those manual, yeah. those files that are manually identified can actually be pulled and then the SCT yeah. comp compression can be done. I will, I'll do it. I'll do it here. Okay. Um, Thank you. Compute uh, compression on existing labels. And then the input would be, you know, file T2, for example. Uh, something like that, right? But then we need to create that function. So we can start from there and just do a copy paste. Need to name it the same way. Compute compression on existing labels. Uh, this function checks if a manual uh, compression site exists and will uh, compute compression. Um, obviously, we also need the uh, spine card segmentation. So that's going to be the seg, for example. Well, actually, we only need the segmentation. That's the only thing we need. So we can get rid of this. Uh, file, that will be something like that. File seg manual, uh, and that file seg, and then you can call it, for example, underscore, you know, compression label or whatever, right? Looking for manual compression site, right? If it finds it, uh, then it copies it, and then it can run, um, it can run, you know, SCT uh, compute compression. And then, you know, just putting XXX here because I don't want you know, to write everything, but that's the, that's, that's the idea. Then else not found, uh, you need to manually uh, create the compression label, right? Then we do nothing here, right? Um, and that's it. Thank you. Can you share this script? Yeah, I, it's 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 a wrong script, right? So I I don't want to share something that is wrong. You know, the, okay. it's, it's just to give you an idea. Uh, again, we are happy to help. Uh, you know, we, we're part of a collaboration, so that, that's something we can do in 10 minutes, right? Because I, I'm, I'm not going to run it. I don't have any, you know, compression labels here. Um, that That's, it's just to show you how easy it is to, to actually, you know, make that sub function and calling it here. Um, so it's 12. So what I'm going to do is um, run the script run run the uh you know the batch processing and while it runs uh, we can do a, a, a break and then reconvene afterwards so bear with me um yeah bear with me i'm here and then i will do sct run batch yeah actually i can I'm going to write it so that I can explain all the different syntax. So a script is the process data script that we that we want to run. Okay. Uh, config is a file called config.yml. What is it? Well, let's look at it. Let's look at it. Uh, where am I? I'm here. Uh, SCT cross data, multi subject, config.yml. What is this file? It's, it's a file that you can use to, you know, instead of writing those 
arguments, you can actually uh, have them in a in a config file. So it tells that my data are located under a folder called data, and this is indeed the case. This is where my data is. You know, the output will be under a folder called output, and my manual segmentations, which I'm going to correct afterwards after after the lunch break are going to be put under this folder. Um, so that's it. And then the last flag is it's called job, jobs three. That refers to the number of CPU cores that you want to use for your processing. In this case, I have three subjects, right? So I'm going to set jobs three because I have 12 cores on my computer but I only have three subjects. So I can dedicate one core per subject and then, and then it will parallelize the processing across those uh, three cores. At this point, I press enter. And then it's currently, the processing is currently running and it's running on three subjects in parallel, subject one, subject three and subject five. Tells where, when it started, um and yeah a bunch of information at this point i think we can do a, a break we can come back in about half an hour let's say 12 30 uh eastern standard time so it's about 27 minutes exactly and then i'll explain to you um, everything that i have not already explained sounds good so I'm going to turn off my camera and mic and then see you see you in a bit.
Okay, so um, I think we can resume the course. I hope you had a nice break. I did. Uh, finished with the coffee. It's perfect. Um, okay, so um, we can look back at the terminal. I don't know if you if you've tried also on your end. Uh, but the processing should be should be finished on your end as well. Uh, and then it should look something like this. Hooray, batch converted successfully. Uh, times where it started and its duration is below 10 minutes. Um, and then it points to a QC report and you notice that it's a different QC report, you know, so that we don't get confused with the uh, QC report we've been looking at so far. Um, and so let's look at the QC report first, or maybe no, let, first let's let let's look at the output. So um, if, I, if I look at my folder, so this is the multi-subject, this is the input data, and you see that there's a new folder that was created called output. And under output, you have uh, four things, four folders. The data processed, which is all the processed data, um, where you know you can investigate the quality of the seg of the segmentation and so on. You have another folder called log with log files for each subject and also this uh, uh, general log file that you know uh, keeps track of a lot of things you know the uh, the input arguments if your script is under a, a github repository uh, it would it would you know put the, the link here if your data are also version tracked with git uh, it would put the uh, git repository here so this is a great way to make reproducible analysis you know where you can you can go back to a specific version of the script and of the data to reproduce results and this is what uh, you know what we are seeing also on the terminal the other log files uh, for example if we take subject 1 it uh, it shows the output of the script for that particular subject you see so first it runs the uh, sct dipseg and before that, it looked for a manual segmentation, right? It did not find one. So it, it goes with the automatic segmentation. It runs dipsegasc, and that's the output of dipsegasc. And then it runs, um, it runs the uh, labeling and so on. And then there's the empty processing, and that's the end of the script. Another folder is uh, QC. So that's the QC report we are about to look at. And there is also a results section where we output the quantitative analysis that we are interested in. So there is a csa.csv that we saw together. So if I open it, as anticipated, it shows the, um, it shows the, you know, the processing for each line corresponds to a subject. So subjects three, one, and five. We asked for uh, to compute the cross-sectional area between C2 and C3 levels, right? So because the field of view is not exactly the same across subjects, the slices that cover C2, C3 also differ across subjects, right? But this, these are found automatically. The only thing you specify is C2, C3, and this is the result of the mean cross-sectional area for each subject. And there's standard deviation and the other metrics that we that we saw yesterday. There is also, um, yeah, so that's the CSA. And then the next result that we are interested in is the mag magnetization transfer ratio in the white matter. That would be this this file here, MTR in DC, because it's uh, computed in the dorsal column. So if I make it bigger, uh, we computed the MTR for each subject. 
we ask to compute MTR between C2 and C5 vertebral levels. These are the corresponding slices. We ask to extract MTR inside the dorsal column, so the fasciculus gracilis and cuneatus. That's the size of the ROIs, and this is the MTR value. So you see that the MTR is remarkably similar across the th three subjects, which is expected because it's the it's the white matter. The microstructure is supposedly you know uh, similar across those healthy uh, individual adults. And uh, whereas you saw that the CSA was very different across subjects, and that's also something that is known. People have different uh, spinal cord sizes, but the microstructure is very similar. Uh, last thing we want to do is check the quality control report, right? Um, to make sure that everything was correct in terms of segmentations and so on. So let's open the uh, QC report. So this is the this is the line. This is the URL that I'm going to. Uh, I mean, you can you can copy and paste, and I'm just it's opening on my other browser. So I just want to put it on this browser. Okay, so uh, let's try to understand what this is all about. Um, so first of all, we don't need this. So I'm going to remove. You can you can remove some columns if you don't want them. I'm going to remove the date so I have more space. Okay, so you see that uh, we have a is some like a bunch of uh, lines for different subjects, subjects five, three, one, and different functions, right? So the first thing we want to check, for example, is the quality of the segmentation. So I'm going to type here uh, deep seg, and I have only the QC results for the segmentation, and then I can go through all of them. So I start with this. And let's say that I'm happy with it. So I'm going to flag QC check. OK. Next one. Let's say that I'm not so happy with, with this part, you see, because it picked a little bit of the nerve rootlet. It's very hard to see. But let's say for the sake of demonstration that I'm going to flag it as a fail, right? Next one. Let's say that I'm happy with it. So it's a green flag. And then the empty magnetization uh, on, empty, empty. I'm flagging, it, uh, I'm flagging it as OK. And then this one, let's say this is OK. And this one, let's say that for the sake of demonstration, I'm going to flag it as fail. OK. OK. So let's go back to my slides. We did this. Uh, and what we're going to do now is we're going to download the QC fails uh, so that we have a file of all the segmentations that failed. So you remember, if I scale this, there is a um, something here that's called download QC fail. And I'm going to put it where I run my analysis. So it's going to be under SCT course data, multi-subject. And I'm going to put it here. OK. So what do we do next? What we do next is we want to run the manual correction on the images that we flagged on the QC. And for that, we are going to use another script that you can download locally using SCT download data. The script is called manual correction. 
So you can triple click, copy, paste, and it created now a new folder called manual correction. And one thing that you need with this manual correction is a, a viewer. Uh, in my case, I want to use SLIs. Just want to make sure that it's accessible. So I specialized version just to make sure that it can um, it can access it. Yes, it's installed. That's that's good. And then we can check the option of the manual correction script. So you can triple click and paste it. So it's using the Python of SCT, which is why there is a long a long command here, a long syntax. So there is a bunch of, of different arguments for this function. I'm not going to explain it all, but the, the main idea is that uh, what it takes as input is a config file, which is the YML file that you know had the um, that you downloaded from the QC report, and that has you know a list of files that you want to correct. So in our case, this is what we're going to input: the QC fail, you know. That has the uh, the T two weighted uh, segmentation and the uh, MT on segmentation that were problematic. Okay, so I'm going to the next slide, and this is where we are going to run the uh, manual correction command. So I'm going to explain a little bit what is the what are the inputs. First input is the QC fail that we downloaded from the QC report. Second one is the is the output folder where the process data are located. We need that because it's going to it's going to take the segmentation, the automatic segmentation that has failed, so that you can manually correct it. Right. So we need to specify that that uh, that argument. That path label is the location where um, Label. Yeah, this is the location of the automatic segmentation and path image is location of the background images. Okay, right. We might want to maybe we we might want to reconsider some you know this uh, possibly. Mm -hmm. uh, and the path out is the location where you want to put your manually corrected labels, right? So this is different from the uh, process data. And ideally, you know, thinking, thinking of data organization, you know, let, let's say if you, if you run imaging studies and you want to make sure your data, are, you know, centralized in a, at a, in a single location, what you would like to do is have your manually corrected labels where your source image files are located. You know, for example, if you know in two years you uh, you know your student leaves to to do a postdoc somewhere else and then you have a new student coming in to work on on the same project you want to make sure that that new student will benefit from the manually corrected files um, that the previous student has done right so in that case it's it's important to make sure that the you know all the manually corrected data are under the uh, you know the, the same bits data set under a derivatives folder, right? Um, so let's let's run this command. Okay, so first it asks for my name. Why does it ask for my name? because I'm going to be the one doing the manual correction. And you want to be able to, to track you know, who is doing the manual correction. If in, in five years, you, you go back to a study and you, you want to know who, uh, what, who was the expert who did the manual correction on a particular you know, segmentation, whether this is MS lesion segmentation or you know, other types of segmentation. Always important to... Um, to be able to, uh, to to track this down uh, for you know provenance uh, reasons. Okay, so it tells me that it copies a file and then in Fesalize, click on edit mode, correct the segmentation and then save it with the same name. Okay, so I'm 
pressing enter. A note, Jan, maybe that we need to press enter after this message appears. Or maybe we don't need to press enter. Anyway. We don't. We don't. We don't. We don't? Okay. It, it right, was sorry. just opening the file a little bit longer. Okay, it was just a bit slow. Okay, got it. All right, so that's my T2 weighted image with the manual, uh, with the automatic segmentation. And I'm going to correct it. Uh, so I, I'll just do it quickly so that you know you have an idea. Like for example, here, right? That's that would be like I'm going to show the axial slice, make it bigger. You want to go to settings, uh, so tools edit mode. Then you want to select the pencil. You want to go selection size, you want to go a bit lower, right? And then if you toggle the segmentation on off, see that it's missing a bit of the cord here. And by pressing shift and the, and the middle button, you can go through the different slices. So when I do manual correction, I like to look at the different slices because it gives me an idea of, you know, the discontinuities that might appear uh, across slices. So for example, here, you know, I'm going to add a bit of segmentation. You can also remove if it's too much and so on, right? So I won't do it for all the slices. It was just to, to give you an idea how, how I do the manual correction. When you're done, you can save it. File, I know, sorry, it will be here. There's a little disk where you can say save. You, you do want to overwrite the file. So you click on overwrite. And then you can quit. And then it will run the, uh, it will open the specialized for the other file because you remember that we had two files that we flagged as um, incorrect correction. And the other one was on the empty data. So same thing, going to zoom in. And then I'm going to, you know, correct uh, a segmentation. For example, uh, I don't know, here. So tools, edit mode. Let's say that I'm adding this here. Okay. And let's say that I'm uh, going to remove some pixels here. Then you can save, overwrite, and quit creates a quality control and I'm done. Okay, what do I do next? So the output segmentations are located under the derivatives labels. So let's look at that. Let's verify that this is indeed the case. If I go to my input data, you see that there is now a new folder called derivatives that has been created by the this manual correction process. Labels, I have labels for subject three and five. And this is indeed the you know, segmentation on the T2 that I manually corrected. It's located here. And I have the manual correction for the MT scan, which is here. And this is all in my input data uh, that I can then reuse to do the, the processing a second time. So this is what the next slide is about. Next slide is about rerun the analysis using the corrections. So I'm going to run the exact same command. except that the output path, instead of being output, I'm going to call it output correction, right? Or personally, what I like to do, because I sometimes I run pipelines many, many times, I like to put the, the date and the time of my folders. So I'm going to call it, for example, output underscore 
and then uh, the date and the time of today. So it's it's basically 2023 November 21 underscore and then uh, and then the time. I press enter. It does the exact same thing as it did previously, except that now it should be using some of the manual um, segmentation that are already installed in the uh, in the data uh, repository in the data folder and then we can verify it so i'm not going to wait until the end of the processing but i'm going to go into this folder that has been created right I'm going to the log and then i can see what's happening while the script is running so i can look at this one system information blah 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 uh the first the first thing that it's supposed to do is do the segmentation of the cord in, uh, except if it found the segmentation so looking for manual segmentation found one using the manual segmentation so you see instead of running sct deep segacy it actually used the existing segmentation that it, that is already present in the in the image uh, in the image folder. Is that clear for everyone? Okay. So. Um, something that I mentioned is that uh, when you you know when you run it here, it says git commit git commit uh, you know question marks and data question marks because these data are not uh, tracked with git. But in some cases, you can track them down. And for example, we published uh, a data set called Spine Generic, which is um, tracked uh, with uh, with git annex. And then uh, you can also run some code that you uh, version track on, on GitHub. And uh, that way you can maximize the you know, reproducibility of your, uh, of your pipelines. That's an example of me running the span generic analysis on 267 subjects in parallel. And then uh, at the end, what's also nice is that uh, you know if you if you run three subjects, it's very easy to go through each of them and make sure that things went uh, went okay. But in, if you're running you know thousands of subjects, uh, you might want to have a quick way to make sure that all the files are are properly output. And one way to do that, if we reopen the process data shell script, we look. At the end of that script, there is something called verify presence of output files and write log file if error. You can check whatever you like to check. Here, uh, we check the presence of the segmentation on the T2. And we check that the MTR file has been generated. If it does not exist, it will um, It will create um, it will create a file called error.log uh, with the um, with the with the with the subject name. So you can you can list you can have a list of all the subjects that failed, and then you can go back to them uh, and and you know verify what went wrong in the uh, processing. Any question regarding that section? Just on the Git references, um, how does that actually work? Does it, it looks at where the script, if the script is within a cloned Git repo, it takes it from that, is it? Or where you have to enter it in manually or? Yeah, the way it works is uh, it checks, um, I can show you, for example, I have some Git. Um, 
Yeah, so I, I have some Git uh, data. For example, Basel MP2 Rage. It's a, it's a Git. It's a Git folder because uh, there is a there is a folder called dot Git, right? And what the what SCT run batch does is that it will look for a dot Git and then get the the branch um, the branch and the and the Git uh, hashtag. Uh, from from that particular branch that is active and then add it into the uh, processing okay perfect thanks I can actually try to see I can just try it it's not gonna work because these they are not the same subject but i'm curious <laughs> let's just check um path data no data neuro basel to rage Output, well, output different things. Okay, so let's see. You see, data now has has this. So it's not on GitHub. It's it's because it's um it's it's uh, on our internal uh, Git server. But if it was on GitHub, it would point to a Git origin on on GitHub, right? Thanks. Right, I'm going to stop this. Good. Any other questions? Okay. So we're we're going to go to the um We're gonna go to the uh, the next uh, section, almost the end. What's next? So these are the new features uh, that have been developed um, in SCT over the past couple of months, and we are happy to uh, to give you an overview of uh, what's what's coming soon in the next uh, stable version of um, of SCT. So the first one uh, is more deep seg models. Um, so there is a contrast agnostic uh, segmentation. So it's it's a, it will soon replace the SCT deep seg SC with a more reliable um, um, spinal cord segmentation model. Uh, Sandrine will tell you more about this in the next slide. There's also segmentations of um, segmentation of spinal cord injury lesions um also segmentation of the nerve rootlets jan is gonna tell you more about this and also ms lesion segmentations uh so sandrine would you like to uh tell yes. us about this so some part um some information about this new model so the current models in sct deep seg sc uh you have one model per contrast However, when you use, for example, on the same subject, the segmentation, so you can segment the T1, the T2, then you will get actually different segmentation. So you would have, for example, a cross-sectional area that is typically higher in T2 weighted images. So this is a problem if you want to use uh, some data sets with different protocols and everything. So what we thought here is we wanted to train a model that used different contrasts, but had the same input segmentation. So for one subject, for six different contrasts, you will have the same segmentation for, to train our model. So for this, we used the spine generic multi-subject data set. So we had six different contrasts. And then we used an average of binary segmentation to create one unique soft segmentation. So values between zero and one. And then we input that uh, to tr for training a new model. And with this, we get some soft predictions for all the six subjects. And if you can change slides. 
And with this, now we've compared, we've measured the cross-sectional area with the new segmentations with our new model. And on the graph, you can see that in uh, in pink, it's the SCT deep seg SC between T2 and T1 CSA. And now we achieve the, the green line. So we have a better agreement between cross-sectional area now, and we're able to reduce the variability within subject with this new method. And also a cool part of this is that you won't have to specify any contrasts when you input the segmentation. So this is going to be soon in SCT. And we've also tested on some unseen data set because pangeneric is only healthy subjects and the six contrast and it performed generally better than the previous models. For example, we see MP2 rage and we have some MS lesions there, but it was still able to segment the whole spinal cord, something from for T2 weighted with spinal cord injury, or we also have some EPI data. And uh, some next steps, we want to include also more contrast and pathologies, but this will be soon in SCT. Thank you, Sandrine. Uh, just a quick uh, comment that we please feel free to ask all your questions on the chat. And then uh, at the end, uh, after the conclusion, we're, we're going to go back to all your questions and we can have uh, we can address all of them. Next feature is about the uh, identific better identification of the vertebral discs. So this is uh, presented by Nathan Molinier. Uh, yes, so um, maybe some of you already used SCT label vertebra, and one main issue with this function is that uh, it's not working well on some contrast, and it's not really contrast agnostic, and it's not performing well when you have a different field of view. So one initiative in that we are currently doing in the lab is to try to compare different methods that are from the literature and just um, try to extract the best one and and maybe so i think we'll in the next few months we will update this function with a, a brand new function that should uh, meet all these issues so let's uh, have to be tuned <laughs> thank you Nathan. um next one is the segmentation of spinal cord injury agents so naga kartik would you like to uh, present this yeah sure so hello everyone uh, so yeah, so this is another uh, soon to be available feature in SCT. So this is the segmentation of uh, spinal cord and lesions in spinal cord injury data. So very briefly, uh, spinal cord injury is like a consequence of an acute damage to the spinal cord due to some external uh, physical impacts, such as some motor vehicle accidents or sports related injuries. So we decided to include this model because the current models uh, are not able to segment the lesions quite well, which is mainly because uh, SCI data are known to be very noisy and uh, are subject to heavy interference from image artifacts uh, for from patients which have uh, metal implants. So how we did this is that we trained a deep learning model on two SCI data sets. So it has uh, different orientations, axial and sagittal, and also includes different uh, images with uh, different resolutions. So the model tries to uh, segment the spinal cord initially, uh, locus localizes itself, and then uh, subsequently segments the lesion, as you can see on the on the GIF on the right. Uh, so another interesting feature of this model that we found out was that it also generalizes well to uh, degenerative cervical myelopathy, DCM, which is a type of non-traumatic SCI uh, with, with spinal cord compression. So that was uh, something interesting uh, for us. Yeah, so that's about the spinal cord injury. Uh, if you go to the next slide, uh, this is uh, more uh, an exciting update uh, for SCT. Uh, so this is a, a, a gradual overhaul of all the deep learning models uh, powering most of SCT's automatic segmentation methods. So uh, as might have mentioned uh, before, so SCT is using a Vardamed framework as it's like core uh, deep learning framework for all the models. And we're planning to move to Monai. So Monai is another uh, medical image analysis with deep learning framework that is supported by NVIDIA. Uh, it is very active, uh, very well-maintained, 
and it has been adopted by the medical image uh, medical imaging community a lot faster than other uh, packages so we decided it's it's a good move uh, uh for the future and so ultimately what this means for like sct users is that within the deep seg functionality you'll have uh these methods which are more powerful and like just to give a teaser so as uh, santhin mentioned just a few slides before the contrast agnostic model is already uh, written in monai and will be a part of uh uh the next uh, stable release of sct uh for the sct deep seg so yeah that's uh an update yeah thank you naga uh another feature is the is a new Template and atlas of the spinal cord more resolved uh, from 70 uh, contrast. So, Neil Sir, would you like to say a few words on this? Sure. AMU 70 is a quantitative template uh, multimodal in, okay. based on seven Tesla images. So, uh, there are a Q quantitative T1 template and T2 weighted, T2 star weighted in template also in cervical spinal cord from C1 to C7 is aligned with PAM50 space. There is, there are, uh, there is um, high resolution images and present a refined uh, parcellation with new levels. For example, the anterior fissure, central canal and septum in order to exclude these areas at the moment to quantify or analyze our images in high resolution. For the gray mother, uh, new levels is, was based in Hausmann Atlas and, and the way mother labels was they said in Levy Atlas. Thank you, Nilsa. And this is a collaboration with the Virginie Callos group uh, in, in Marseille. Thank you. Uh, another feature coming up also is the uh, segmentation of the nerve rootlets, especially interesting for people doing fMRI. Uh, Jan, would you like to uh, say a few words on this? Sure, sure. So moving back to deep learning models, uh, this slide presents a new model for automatic segmentation of spinal cord nerve rootlets. Spinal cord nerve rootlets are these tiny structure which are originating from the spinal cord and then they are grouping into spinal nerves. And spinal nerves basically connect the, the spinal cord with the peripheral nervous system and they transmit motor and sensory information. On T2-weighted MRI images, the nerve glutelets appear like this, so these dark structures. And you might be wondering why we are interested in the segmentation of spinal cord nerve glutelets. The reason is that we can use the spinal cord nerve glutelets to estimate spinal levels. And spinal levels represents an alternative coordinate system to vertebral levels. So here we have vertebral levels defined based on vertebra. So we can see C2, C3, and so on. And here we have spinal levels defined based on nerve rootlets. And you can see that there is a kind of slight shift, especially at lower parts of the spinal cord. So for example, the C7 vertebral level corresponds to C8 spinal level. And yes, yeah, spinal levels are particularly interested, for example, for fMRI studies. Uh, so moving on to the next slide, uh, here we have an example how the segmentation model works. So given an input T2-weighted image, the model is able to automatically segment all cervical uh, nerve rootlets, how is illustrated in the image. What is important here is that the segmentation is so-called multi-class. It means that each level has different number, two, three, four, and so on. And what we are currently working on, we are currently working on estimation of spinal levels based on the nerve rootlets. We have a discussion open about this, about the best possible approach. So if you would like to comp contribute, please feel free to chip in. Great. Yeah, that's it. Thank you, Jan. And then the uh, final feature that we wanted to present is about the uh, creation of the adding the temporal SNR uh, on the QC report. Uh, Sandrine, would you like to say a few words? Yes. Um, so for many steps, I think, in mainly in fMRI processing, so before motion correction, after motion correction, or other denoising step, it can be uh, interesting to compare the TSNR. Um, so this is just a preliminary QC 
that if you also have some suggestions. And uh, so we see B4 motion correction is uh, the color bar goes from blue to red. So higher values are in red. And we see a big improvement in the spinal cord of TSNR. But we also plan to add uh, maybe a color bar with some values also, or maybe some mean TSNR inside the cord or some things like that. But it could be used for different steps uh, in fMRI pre-processing. Thank you, Sandrine. And uh, finally, we would love to hear from you. So we created a very short uh, poll with um, only a few questions um, that we can, I'm going to, to go through the poll uh, with you. So I encourage you to, to fill the poll now. Uh, we can take you know, a few minutes to do it together so I can explain to you what we uh, what we uh, would like to get from you in terms of feedback so that we can further improve uh, SCT in the next release and, and you know, create features that uh, that you would be needing. So you can put your name. Uh, it's optional. you don't you don't have to. Um, so first, uh, we would like to know which OS you're working with because uh, that helps us, you know, debug some of the features that are not necessarily compatible with all the OSs. Um, so you can click what OS you're running SCT with. Uh, what is your preferred image viewer? Uh, you can only select one here, but I understand you might be using more than one. And also, uh, if you use the uh, SCT via the Facilize plugin that I showed you earlier. Next. Uh, what do you use to automate your processing across multiple subjects? Uh, either you process usually one subject at a time, or you use SCT run batch, uh, which I showed you earlier or you use another type of pipeline. So we would love to, to hear from you there. Um, we also would like to hear if you organize your data according to the bids structure, that will help us um, tailor some features uh, on top of SCT. So please answer this as well. Next section is about the uh, general SCT usage and suggestions. So that's the last page. Uh, very general question. What do you use SCT for? Is it for structural morphometry, for example, cross-sectional area on you know T2 or T1 weighted uh, data? Or do you use it or like, and or do you use it for microstructural MRI like diffusion, MT, um, myelin water fraction, and so on? Use it for fMRI or like other applications. Feel free to you know fill up what you use SCT for. Also, the kind of pathologies you are working with. We would be interested to know also uh, also this for developing you know for prioritizing the development of uh, future features and the species also that you are working with. And. Uh, there is also a question about, uh, we have a Slack, spinal cord MRI Slack, that is highly unused. We would like to know if, uh, you know, if you agree that we can get, uh, get that we get rid of it, or if you'd like to, to keep it, uh, if you feel strongly that we should keep our Slack channel for communication, then uh, you, you can click yes. If you think it's unused, you're not using it, we don't need it, press no. Um, single sentence, you can tell us what is the best thing you like about SCT that will help us also, you know, uh, curate some features better than others. And the very last, it's, uh, you know, you can take one or two minutes to just tell us uh, your thoughts uh, about SCT, what um, features you would really like to see, what features already exist and that we can improve um other changes you know in the in the format of the course you know different uh, over a few days or like less uh, less days uh, different format different times uh suggestions for the future spinal cord workshops as well 
Uh, anything that you you know deem relevant for us to know, please uh, put it here. Um, any feedback is is really appreciated. So I'm going to pause here for uh, let's say thirty seconds a minute to give you some time to fill it and then submit it. And in the meantime, I can I can actually address uh, some questions. Um, so there is one question. Um, how would you recommend? So one question from uh, Mads, just Madsen. How would you recommend setting up your ST processing pipeline for 100 subjects? Um, Oh, no, so, yeah. Um, would you optimize it in five to 10 subjects and running that in all subjects or run a generic processing pipeline in all subjects and identifying failed cases? Um, right. uh, that's a great question. Um, I would actually do it the way you're suggesting it. Um, in general, I, I pick I start with one subject. I pick, you know, I usually pick the first subject of the data set. I look at it. Um, and then I would I would write a, a script. I would try it on that subject. And then if I'm happy, I, I look at the other subjects. Sometimes the, the data don't match, you know, there, there is a T1 on you know one subject and there is a, a no T1 on the other subject. So I also look at a few subjects to have a sense of, you know, while the data are available. Um, and then, you know, after it's optimized on one subject, I would basically run it on the entire database. Uh, and then I, I would have a, a, a good overview of the quality of the, um, of the processing. And then I would start tweaking the parameters uh, there, you know. And then once this is, I consider it optimized, then I would rerun it and then do the manual correction uh, module. Uh, there were also questions above. Um, can the vertebral disk detection module also detect intervertebral foramina and measure the diameter of the foramina? Can it assess the lumbar spine level as well? Okay, so uh, internal foramina uh, is not uh, is not segmented, um, so it, it's it's not something that we can uh, detect. Uh, maybe a future feature. So here is an opportunity for you to actually request that. Um, and the second question: Can it assess the lumbar spine level as well? So the answer is yes. Um, but you know, it if it depends on the field of view, obviously. So I don't know if Nathan is still connected. But uh, Nathan is working on a way to be able to assess the lumbar spine without knowing the, the cervical level. Because currently, SCT detect uh, or SCT label vertebra um, knows about the spinal, about the lumbar spine levels based on the C2, C3 level, which is easy to identify. But when we don't have C two C three on the image, then it's we, we cannot assess uh, the lumbar spine levels. But we could assess it by starting from the from the bottom, looking at the sacral levels, which are also relatively easy to identify. And this is something that Tom is is working on to make sure that we can we can assess the lumbar levels without having to rely on the cervical levels. We have another question uh, from. Ricky Walsh, are the nerve rootlets only visible on the axial acquisitions? And yes, I, as Sandrine said, uh, the I was showing axial acquisition, but they are actually isotropic uh, scans, like 3D scans. Um, we we I usually recommend uh, working with 3D uh, 3D scans uh, with isotropic resolution because those nerve rootlets are you know, along different orientations. Yeah, then the nerve rootlets are 3D structures going through the slices. So 3D isotropic sequence is the best, I guess. 
question from Naoki. Can SCT lesion detection accommodate conditions like vertebral fracture? Um, well, uh, it, it can, uh, but the, the lesion detection that uh, Naga and Yan uh, are working on is to detect the lesions inside the spinal cord, whether, and so these are traumatic lesions, but as Yan said, it could also work for non-traumatic uh, SCI, but the only thing that they are segmenting is, uh, is inside the, the lesion, right? So they, we don't segment a spine fracture, but we, we do segment the uh, pathologies, the lesions, the hemorrhage that is caused by vertebral fractures. Um, question from Alessandro, uh, can stir sequence be used for MS lesion segmentation? So that is a very, um, oh yeah, I see there are some answers. Uh, uh, yes, so Naga answered, yes, indeed. Uh, we are actually working on it. Uh, Pierre-Louis, I don't know if he's on the call, but he's, he's also working on that. Um, so we do have STIR PSIR data that we are working with for improving the MS lesion segmentation uh, module. Question from uh, Angel. When will the spinal cord rootlet segmentation be available? Um, we're working on it. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean it's it's quite ready, I would say. Um, just need to to package it. Um, so maybe a few months. Uh, but by the way, uh, it's already available for beta testers. So if you're interested to to test it, you can you can do it now. Uh, just contact us, uh, and then we'll share. Uh, the the current model with you, so you can try it and give us some feedback. Um, question from Scott: For the smooth spinal cord function, will there be an implementation of in-mask smoothing param ad added in the future? Um, in-mask smoothing, I see, right. So you're referring to the fact that the smoothing would only occur inside the mask, if I understand you correctly. Uh, uh, yeah, correct, yeah. Uh, it's, not, um, it's not a feature we've, we, that is planned, but we can definitely plan it if there is a need for it. Yeah, so feel free to you know, request it, for example, in the forum or uh, in, this, uh, in this poll, and we'll definitely look at it. It, it should not be too difficult to implement. Question from Naoki, is there a possibility to evaluate conditions like nerve root compressions utilizing nerve root detection? Uh, that is a very tricky one. Uh, again, we it's not a plan for now, but uh, um, you know, we would be happy to collaborate on this very, um, very specific uh, project, yeah. And then a question from Ricky uh, Walsh, is there a way to hook in to the QC report interfaces with results from other processing outside of SCT functions? Uh-huh. That is a very cool question. Yeah, as Sandrine said. Um, right, so we can call a function with SCT. So, we, so there are different ways, I would say. We can... We can change SCTQC to add other functions, but um, or we can call SCTQC, but that would be a, a hack uh, that would rely on the on the existing um, uh, like existing processing of of SCT. But if you have processing that don't match what's offered in SCTQC um then uh yeah that might be a bit more tricky i think that's that's something we need to to discuss uh you know if you if you give us some examples of uh, the you know third party software you would be interested in um uh, you know uh, integrating into the qc report um we can we can discuss how feasible that is yeah 
as Joshua said, uh, feel free to, you know, um, give us more details about those features you have in mind. A uh, question from Naoki. I thought that the presence of various lesions might make it more difficult for the detection models to detect spinal cord lesions themselves on SCI. Um, indeed, that is the case. Um, so I don't know if you're referring to the to the spinal cord segmentation module or um, yeah, I'm not exactly sure uh, what 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 the question is. So I invite you to uh, maybe elaborate on this, and I'm going to go to the next question. Um, for longitudinal data, yeah. So longitudinal data, um, Jan answered correctly, uh, but then there was a follow up uh, in terms of analysis. Would you register all sessions from one subject to their base band or all uh, to the pan fifty? Um, yeah, that's that's also something we are currently um, brainstorming on. Uh, it's unclear what's the best approach, but uh, it really depends how we want to do the analysis. Um, um, if like we are looking, we, we've we've done some projects where we want to you know create maps uh, um, of you know evolution of you know lesion mapping across time, for example, and this is an example where registration to the pan fifty would make sense. Um, in some cases, you know, if you want to follow, for example, the evolution of uh, MS lesion, like lesion count, lesion loads uh, across time, that's something that could be done on the uh, native space without uh, needing to register uh, subjects together, right? You could extract the metrics and then compare the metrics across time. So there are different scenarios that you could think of depending on how, um, how the, you know, like what are the metrics extracted, how they are extracted, and what are the you know uh, the scientific questions uh, be, behind the analysis? Happy to you know to brainstorm more. Question from Fauzia. General question: How to maintain consistency in ongoing analysis amidst SCT version updates? How to document and adapt our workflow and shrink compatibility and so on? Yeah, great question that we often have. Um, so one thing to consider is that, uh, so SCT, you know, every time there is a new SCT version, uh, we try as much as possible to maintain a cross compatibility. So the functions and arguments should stay the same. Sometimes they don't, but that's, you know, does not happen very often. Uh, sometimes the results could change. Uh, and this is something that is documented on each SCT release. Um, uh, if we go to the spinal cord GitHub repository, actually, is that? Yeah. If you go to the GitHub repository, hmm, funny. That's something maybe Joshua, we, we, we want to fix the, the little link to edit. Um, so if you go to the release, uh, you see that for each release, there is the result of batch processing on different platforms on Linux, Mac OS, and Windows. And it shows the results of the processing for typical functions like cross-sectional area on the T2, MTR, analysis, FA in the CST. So these are the you know typical measures that are run on the same data set across versions. So for example, you can compare the results uh, of 6.1 and 6.0 for the for an Ubuntu station, right? So you can compare, for example, the uh, you know cross-sectional area, which is 73.87, blah blah blah, and then version 6.1. 73.87, blah, blah, blah. So that, for example, that shows that this has not changed between 6.0 and 6.1, right? And you can do the same for the other metrics. Um, so that's Maybe. one way to, yeah, Sandrine? 
Yeah, maybe an additional consideration because sometimes you want to keep the same version for entire project that you should always uh, use the help in your terminal, in your SCT uh, current version that you have. Because if then you use the website, the website will be the latest version. So you can have also some, some different um, flags and parameters from there. So it's maybe always, if you know you're not up to date with your version, remember that there could be some differences. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point, Sandrine. And uh, a an, uh, third point I wanted to make also is that, uh, you know, one of the part of the question is, um, is, uh, right, how to, how to adapt the workflow, uh, ensuring compatibility and so on. So that has to do with the, with the batch processing that I was um, telling you about. And the reason I love uh, processing pipelines is that, let's say, you work on a pipeline and you have, you know, your, you processed 200 subjects and then you're about to uh, submit your paper and then bang, there's a new 6.2 SCT version that comes in with uh, amazing features that you want to use. Then you're like, ah, I processed 200 subjects. I don't want to reprocess them all. I mean, it's going to take days or months. But if you have uh, done your processing using a batch script, the only thing you need to do is rerun your processing with, you know, one line of code, this one. You rerun that, and uh, if the uh, commands have not changed, you will be able to get your entire new results. And then you can org organize it that way, you know, output, you can call it, for example, Output SCT 6.2. Oops. And then you have your outputs, and then you can compare uh, your quantitative results between you know previous versions and new versions. There are different ways you can do it, but it really shows how powerful analysis pipelines are. You know, seamlessly you can you can rerun an entire processing pipelines that you know 15 years ago would take. Uh, would take months to uh, to to run. Um, question from uh, Naoki: Can the MS lesion detection model detect lesions that are not dependent on the um, T two weighted uh, contrast? Uh, right. So we did uh, briefly mention that uh, there is um, there is a model for MS lesion segmentation that works on the uh, MP2 rage scan. So if you do deep seg list tasks, um, there is, there is a, uh, yes, there is a model, it's called seg MS lesion MP2 rage to segment lesions on MP2 rage data. And um, we are also working on the MS lesion segmentation for um, MP uh, for the STIR and the PSIR contrasts. Um, coming back to the questions. Uh, right, I think I think I covered all the questions. Um, so I hope that everybody submitting their polls, and then we can finally go to the conclusion of the uh, meeting. So a few slides to uh, tell you that uh, what Sandrine already explained is that uh, we invite you to always look at the help of every function to know what the function is, you know, does. And also in case your pipeline doesn't work anymore, maybe because there was an update. Again, that does not happen very often that there would be cross compatibility issues, but sometimes it does. And if it does, then look at the help and then you will have more insights about the um, what has changed and how to accommodate your pipeline. Uh, if you, you know, if you need help, uh, post, uh, go to the forum and then post your questions. It's a very, very active forum. Uh, we get messages. Uh, you know, several messages a week, and we we try to answer it as quickly as possible. 
so that it's really a great way to uh, to you know explain your situation, uh, give feedback. Uh, for you know everything is centralized there. We invite also we invite you also if you have a problem to search for your problem. Um, I'm going to do a quick demo here for um, a city. Let's say that you have issues with, uh, I don't know, you are working with lumbar spinal cord, right? And you don't know how to how to process your lumbar spinal cord. Then you can go to the search view and then just type lumbar, enter. And it will, you know, it will give you a list of all the uh, questions that users have asked regarding lumbar spinal cord data. And there is a lot of information that could be useful for you. Um, and uh, so those SCT course are given, um, we try to give them every year. Uh, we had some, some like drop with the pandemic, but uh, we're, we're back, back to life. Uh, and, you know, hopefully the next one will be in a year as well. You can notice that there is a very nice picture here. Uh, we used to do those meetings in presence and we are now moving uh, online. Um, maybe we'll have other presence meetings in the future, but in order to be able to generate those very nice panels, uh, we need to take a zoom peek. So this is where I'm going to ask you <laughs> to turn on your camera so we can take a nice uh, screenshot um, for, uh, you know, which is used for uh, filling up that, the, you know, that uh, PowerPoint slide for the next course. And it's also useful for, uh, you know, getting funding from funding agencies um, to show that if people are interested in SCT um, and, uh, you know, helps getting the money and then maintain this uh, open source software. I appreciate it. Thank you. So I'm going to do a, a count. Three, two, one. Let's take another one. Three, two, one. Great. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, lastly, if you would like to contribute to SCT, uh, we welcome uh, that very much. And we would be very pleased uh, you know, to get additional contributors um, and, and then discuss with you, you know, what kind of features you're thinking of implementing and, uh, you know, guide you uh, all the way. And uh, last but not least, I would like to give a very big, big thank to uh, to the team, to the SCT uh, team, uh, Joshua, Mathieu, Jan, Naga, Nilser, Pierre-Louis, Nathan, Sandrine, Rohan, and all the, uh, you know, people uh, in the past who contributed to SCT as well, the collaborators, uh, and also uh, all of you users of SCT for your feedback, uh, making sure that we improve things, uh, uh, you know, every year uh, with useful features. Thank you. I'm gonna stop the sharing, and then you know we can uh, we can take we can take a few questions. Um, there is a question from uh, from Samira. If you are using SCT installed centrally or by a colleague, how can you find out the version? Right. Yeah. So Joshua answered that. Indeed, SCT version gives it. That's right. Yeah. Last call for uh, questions, comments, suggestions. Is the timing of the course okay? Uh, it's the first time uh, we do it between like, you know, these, uh, these times and I find it works actually quite well. In the past, uh, we would do it on a, on a single day. It was a bit overwhelming for everyone.
right as Joshua said any question you can you you think about you know after the meeting ends feel free to ask it on the forum uh question to incorporate Neptune with a CT um there is no concrete plan to that we we did work uh we, we, we do work a lot with with Rob Barry um we discussed about the intercompatibility of SCT and Neptune last week at the workshop. Um, those two ecosystems are relatively, um, you know, um, inter, uh, inter intercompatible. Uh, they, they don't do the, they don't exactly do the, the same thing. Neptune calls SCT. Um, so I think it's, it's fine to keep it that way. Um, November, yes, November seems to be a good month after the grant deadline. Uh, two half days, yes, great. Italian time, yeah, a bit, a bit borderline. Uh, unfortunately, yeah, we are we are missing the uh, Asian. Uh, time zones so that makes it more difficult for people in uh, in asia um one well, of the team is working on ms agent segmentation uh yeah so you can reach out to naga you can reach out to um to nilser um pierre louis yeah okay all right, so I think uh, we can uh, we can say goodbye and uh, thank you all for participating. Um, and yeah, see you see you next year, and see you on the forum. Bye bye.